So I want to start today, inshallah ta'ala, first of all, for thanking you for coming in so early. I know this is almost Fajr time for a lot of you on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I understand that it's, it's difficult to make the kind of sacrifice, and I appreciate the amount of time, inshallah, that you'll be putting in. Hopefully the day that we spend together is going to go by rather quickly, and we're not going to get bored, inshallah. I'm actually pretty excited to have the opportunity to be here and to be able to teach uh, some lessons from this incredible, incredible surah. I was actually done preparing completely and then I decided I need to prepare again. So I just finished preparing at 10.30 this morning. I almost didn't sleep last night. So, but that's just how excited I am about Surah Yasin. I wanted to do it as much justice as I possibly could, even though the best of my efforts don't even come close to the infinite wisdom in every ayah of the Qur'an. Now I want to start today inshallah by giving you guys a little bit of a, an introduction to the approach for today's program. Uh, not just the schedule and the breaks and all of that, but actually the, what we're going to be doing and how I'm going to be approaching the study of the surah. So uh, when I study a surah nowadays uh, in depth, when I try to study it in depth myself and some of my assistants and research partners, we take on as many tafasir as we can, we look, look at different mufassirun and what they've said, we look at different linguistic sources, dictionaries, etc, etc, and put all these massive notes together under each ayah. So there's lots and lots and lots of information under every ayah. What did Imam Ibn Kathir say? What did Al-Qurtubi say? Rahimahumullah. What did Ibn Ashur say? What did Razi say? What does the Sanan Arab say? Etc, etc, etc. So when you're studying one ayah, there's like 20 pages of notes. Okay, and then you have to kind of study all of that and make sense of it. But that's not what we're doing here. That's actually my job. My job as a student is to do that. But my job as a teacher is completely different. I'm not here to tell you this book says this, and that book says that, and that book says that. That's actually not why I'm here at all. Okay? My job is to study that stuff, process that information, and think about how I would take the best of that information that I've understood, and then talk to my, if I had, now she's in her 20s, but my younger sister. Okay? To talk to her who has no Arabic background, who has no you know, Islamic studies background, and I want to take all this stuff that these great scholars talked about, and these incredible insights, but I have to talk about it in a way, even if there was a non-Muslim sitting in the audience, they'd get it. They'd understand. So it's a pretty tough job, taking you know, heavy academic stuff, and then putting it in language that is easy to understand. You know, and I don't want it to come across as, even though I'm not quoting a lot of Mufassirun, because some of you, mashallah, have background in, in Islamic studies. So if you hear me talk, and I'm not gonna quote any tafsir, or tell you which Sahabi said what, or which, which, you know, is, what's the isnad of that hadith, etc. You might think that uh, this is coming from nowhere. It is actually coming from somewhere. And hopefully the intention now, because all of that research is being compiled, is that these lectures can be supplemented with all of those notes for those people who want to do the studies. Because the research is already done for those people that want to do the, you know, the heavy lifting and the geeky studies and go through the Arabic sources. Welcome to you, inshallah ta'ala. But that's not for the rest of us. So that's the first thing about the approach of today's program. I'm going to try to simplify things and try to make them as accessible as possible. The second thing is, just to give you an outline, the surah that we're studying today, Surah Yasin, is made up of six sections. It's made up of six parts, which means that we're going to try to do at least six sessions. Each section, we'll try to cover in one session. That's what we're going to try to do. Even though there are more sessions after that. When we finish the six sections, then we have to look back again and figure some things out that we're missing. So we probably have one or two sections to cover after we're done with all six of the sections of this beautiful surah. So let's just uh, get started right away because we do have a lot of work to cover. It's 83 ayahs. It's a lot, a lot of work. So let's begin inshallah ta'ala. Surah Yaseen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Yaseen A surah that was revealed in the, the Meccan period Before the Prophet sallallahu migrated to Medina And in this surah Allah begins with the letters Ya and Seen Which is the only time these letters occur You've heard of Alif, Lam, Mim before Or you know Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ain, Saad etc So there are many surahs of the Quran that begin with these letters What they all have in common Or at least what most of them have in common Is that they all begin with these letters And then they say something about the Quran like the, you get these letters, alif, lam, mim, and then Allah says something about the Qur'an, like ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْوَ فِيهِ Or تِلْكَ آيَاتُ الْكِتَابِ الْمُبِينَ Something. In some way, all of these are introductions to the Qur'an. Like one of the things these letters have in common, for the most part, they are introductions to the Qur'an. One obvious exception, of course, is, you know, غُلِبَتِ uh, الرُّومِ Alif, lam, mim, غُلِبَتِ الرُّومِ Rome was dominated. Rome was overcome. 
And in my mind, even though that's an exception, it's actually along the same lines, and you know why? Because even that is the description of a miracle of Allah. When Rome was dominated, and then eventually the Persians, you know, and, and, and Persians had, had taken over them, and Allah said, within 10 years, they're gonna win again. Within 10 years, they're going to make a comeback, even though they were completely annihilated. And that was a prediction the Qur'an made well in advance. It was talking, it made a challenge to humanity, see if this doesn't happen. It put its entire validity on the line. Like you know, if Allah says in the Qur'an that the Roman Empire that was defeated by the Persian Empire is going to make a comeback within 10 years, and the only place that's talking about this is a man in the desert in Arabia, and if, he, if this doesn't turn out to be the case, then everything about the Qur'an can be questioned. Everything can be questioned. So you've put the entire credibility of the message of Islam on the line with one statement. You know, with just one, one, one claim. And actually that's exactly the same with the Qur'an itself. Why don't you produce something like this Qur'an? Why don't you show that it's not from Allah? It actually challenges you to question its credibility every time. So in that sense, it does have it in common with all of the other huruf. One more thing about these huruf muqatta'at, even though I don't want to spend too much time on the words Yasin. I know some people, you, you guys have heard that Surah Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an, you must have heard that before. Uh, actually, may, maybe some of you are, mostly that's the reason you're here, because you're Pakistani and you've <laughs> heard that your whole life. So, <laughs> um, that's actually not an authentic narration, even though it's beautiful, and we're not rejecting it, because it's part of our tradition. But it's not actually something authentically proven that it's considered the heart of the Qur'an. It did become famous though. And it's good, at least we know one, we care about one surah at least, so that's good. You know, <laughs> it turned out great for the subcontinent. Um, so <laughs> but in any case, what it, you know, the thing about the letters is that, something to keep in mind is that these letters were unfamiliar to the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa This is really important. Our Prophet, proudly the Qur'an declares, is incapable of reading, ummi. He is as, as unlettered as someone who just came out of their mother. That's why the word ummi is used, you know. And so the one who cannot read, وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ You didn't write this with your own hands, and you didn't, you didn't read anything but before this ever. And you didn't write it with your own hands. And now someone who doesn't read and write, doesn't know anything about the alphabet. If you only know how to speak a language and somebody says to you, W, what does that mean to you? It doesn't mean anything to you. So the fact that he's saying, Ya Asin, which in Arabic doesn't mean anything except to someone who knows what? Reading and writing. So they know that's a letter, Ya, and that's a letter, Seen. For someone who doesn't know that, this is completely beyond his capability. So the very use of the letters Ya Seen is telling the audience that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam seems to be getting an education, because the only time you learn letters is when you are receiving an education, which makes the question, who's educating him? Because if you say he's, he knows these letters, that means he's getting taught, and then arrives the question, well, who's teaching him? And so every time these letters occur, the question pops up, who taught him that one? Who taught him this? And then every time, what does Allah do? Or at least with one exception, what does He do? He answers who taught him. It's the book, it's the revelation, it's coming from Allah. So that's some, some things about the words Yaseen. Now let's get to the heart of the matter. This is really going to be from the beginning to the end. This is the ayah that we're going to keep coming back to. Wal-Qur'an al-Hakim. Allah swears, He says, I swear by, that's how I'm going to translate the word wa. I swear by the Hakim Qur'an. I'm not going to translate it as wise yet. I'm going to say, I swear by the Hakim Qur'an. So even though you guys don't know Arabic, many of you, it's okay. I'm going to try to explain the word Hakim to you because that's gonna play a big role. But before I do, what does Allah do with the, the wise Qur'an, or the Hakim Qur'an rather? He says He swears by it. So we have to understand what does it mean to swear by something? Why would He do that? The Qur'an is special in why it swears by something. And I'm gonna highlight the only, th the only thing about taking an oath or swearing that is unique to the Qur'an. Because you and I take oaths too. Oh my God, I swear to God, I'm gonna, mm -mm, you know. We do that too. But when the Qur'an does it, it does it for a unique reason. And I want you to understand that first. The Qur'an does it, first of all, to get your attention. To get your attention. And it, it gets your attention using something unique. Something that you want to think about. But there's more. It gets your attention using something. And whatever that is, becomes evidence for what he's about to say. 
Now that sounds complicated, but let me make it simple. He says, I swear by time. Wal asr, yes? I swear by time. So he swore by what? Time. You can call it out. It's halal. It's not a khutbah. Your good deeds will not be burnt away. Okay? So he swears by what? Time. Which means time, he is, he, it's almost as though he's saying, I am making time itself evidence. I'm turning time into evidence. Evidence for what? Inna al insana lafi khusr. That no doubt the human being is in loss. The biggest proof that human beings are in loss is what? Time. You see? So the statement that will come later is being proven by the oath. So when Allah says, Wal Quran al Hakim, the Quran is being used as a proof. It's being used as evidence. Just like time was being used as evidence, now the Quran is being used by evidence for something. We'll get to what that is, but right now let's talk about Wal Quran al Hakim. Al Hakim actually has three meanings in Arabic. It can have three meanings, and all three of them apply to the Quran. The first of them, it slipped out as I was talking to you, is wisdom. The Quran is full of wisdom. You know, wisdom comes with old age. Wisdom comes in very complicated language. Wisdom is always appreciated by those who it's relevant to. Like if I talk to you about some wisdom and it flies over your head, you don't really think that's wisdom. But if I give you some advice that really benefits you, then you appreciate its wisdom. So to, in order to appreciate wisdom, it has to be relevant. And the fact that every time the Qur'an is recited by the Prophet ﷺ, somebody listening can immediately get hit with it and say, Whoa, that's talking about me. It's giving me advice. It's relevant to me. It's giving me counsel that I totally needed. So, so the Qur'an calls its wisdom one of its proofs. It's, it's evidence to something, something bigger. It's way too wise to be a human being's effort. That's the second, now the second meaning. Hakim also has the meaning of uh, al hukum meaning the thing that has the power to give verdicts or judgment. You know the word hukum or hakim? Hakim also means ruler or governor. So the Quran that is full of judgment. Now the thing is, me as a human being, I can tell you personally, even in my life of Quran studies, there are opinions I used to have that I no longer have. There are things that I used to hold to be absolutely true, I don't see them anymore that way. As you study, you learn more and your opinions change. Even lawyers that eventually become judges, if they remember back when they were lawyers, they studied the same constitution, but the way they thought about it changed or no? It changed, they mature over time. People mature and think differently over time. The Qur'an however, gives judgments, and over the course of these 23 years, did anything change? Is there any maturity? Well, you know, we used to say that, but we don't say that anymore. No, 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 no. It's constant in its judgment. It doesn't, you know, waver from its verdict. And sometimes when you have an opinion, not even a verdict, when you have an opinion, it can get you in trouble. If the media is coming to your masjid asking you for an interview, you have to think really carefully about what you're going to say. Because, you know, they, they might out, outfox you or something. So you, you have to be really careful. But when the Qur'an speaks, does it actually consider the consequences? Maybe I should not say this, it might get me in trouble. Maybe we should kind of circumvent it, maybe avoid that question. The Qur'an just takes it on and gives an open verdict. Like it's in a position of authority. Now the thing is, you need to understand here, there are two opposite things. The Prophet ﷺ is just one man, very few followers, not really in any political position. Not really a military behind nothing. And Allah is the Almighty, all powerful, who's in the unseen. But when, when the Prophet speaks, والسلام, he speaks on behalf of Allah. So he speaks like a judge with hukum. But he's not in a position to talk like that. Because he's not a governor. He's not, he's not ruling the people. He's not in a position of power, but when he speaks, he speaks like he's in a position of power because he's speaking on behalf of Allah. But when someone who is not in a position of power speaks like they're in a position of power, they get in a lot of trouble. You cannot talk like that unless you have power. But the Quran says it speaks like this from the mouth of this messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it does so constantly. You know, maybe sometimes a student acts out and speaks up against the teacher. Or an employee raises his voice against the employer. Or a you know, plaintiff sitting in a courtroom raises his voice against the judge. 
or a police officer raises his voice against the police chief, or one of the staffers at the White House raises his voice against the president. But that happens one time and then he just says, like, okay, sorry, 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 I didn't realize. It got out of hand. Happens or no? But with the Quran, it raises its voice. And there are those in leadership that get offended. But does it apologize? No, it does it again. And then it says it again, and does it again. This is the second meaning of the word Hakim. It's authoritative. It gives verdicts and it doesn't care. And it does it every time. What was the first meaning? Wisdom. wisdom. It's full of wisdom. Constant wisdom. And then the second, it gives verdicts without consideration. And then there's a the third meaning, my favorite one. It has to do with the word ihkam or muhkam in Arabic. Ihkam actually means to tighten something and to make a weave. You know like knitting and things like that? There's a pattern. So when you have a long pattern, it's actually called ihkam. When things are tight together, they're also called ihkam. When something is you know, completely finished, like for example, they have some work done on these walls, right? So if, this wall, if it's unfinished, it's not muhkam. But it's completely finished and all the corners are perfectly done and it's completely symmetrical, then it's called hakim also. That's one of the meanings of it. In other words, the Qur'an is way too well knit. Everything connects to everything else way too perfectly. You know, and sometimes in politicians give speeches, they have speech writers. <laughs> Right? Like the president doesn't write his own speeches, he has a speech writer. But his opposition can take a speech from five years ago, take out a clip and say, Hey, in 2010 you said this, and now you're saying this. Even though that one had a speech writer too. But he messed up. And now they're, they're holding it against him. Does that happen? But you know what? This Qur'an is too tightly knit. So you can't say, hey, what about this? You said that over here, but you're saying this over here. It all just connects perfectly. And all of what, he, what the Qur'an says connects perfectly with what the Prophet himself says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's completely well knit. That is the third meaning. So let's review this again. What are the three meanings of wal Qur'an al-Hakim? Wisdom. It's, it gives verdicts. And it's too well knit. It's perfectly knit together. It's tight together. There's no looseness in it. There's no one word that kind of slipped out. Everything is perfect and tight and exactly where it's supposed to be. It is way too perfect. Now, but all of this is proof of something. What is it a proof of? It is a proof of the fact that you, no doubt, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are no doubt from those that have been sent. This Qur'an is the ultimate proof that you have to have, this could not be yourself. There's no way this is your, on your own. So now we have to understand why is this proof? This is way too much wisdom for one human being. It's impossible. There are way too many authoritative verdicts. No human being ever does that and does it year after year, day after day, getting himself in more and more trouble. Any human being that speaks and gets in trouble, the next day they speak more or speak less? They speak less, they back off, or they change the subject, or they move to another town. He keeps going after the same people, offending them more and more and more. There's no way you're doing this because you want to, you are being told to do this. You are from those that have been sent, not even on your own. You have been pushed to go. You've been given a mission, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the third was, it's too tight. In other words, people know how you speak. But this speech, this Qur'an, is not like any speech. I want you to appreciate that from a communication psychology point of view. It's really cool. Right now I'm speaking to you, I'm not reading to you. But if I actually opened up a tafsir book, right? Or if I had Google glasses or something, and they were just scrolling in front of me, and I was reading the tafsir book, or I memorized some Shakespeare, and I was reading it to you, would you know that that's not my speech? Would you know that I'm actually not talking, but rather reading? You would know, because the way I speak, and the way Shakespeare speaks, or the way the Constitution speaks, or the way my own essay speaks is different. Actually, the way I speak is not even the way I write. When I write, it's much more formal. And when I speak, it's much more informal. The Prophet ﷺ has papers in front of him or no? No. There's no he can't, and even if he did, it wouldn't matter. Why not? Because he can't read. But when he starts reciting Qur'an, Everybody can tell this is way too tightly knit. There are no, there are no uh, mm, let me repeat that. There's nothing. It's too perfect for this to be a human being's speech. This is, this is not him. This is some other author. So now in this ayah, another thing to understand 
is that Allah says, you, ha- you're the, you are among those that has been sent. But that creates a question. The question that it creates is sent by who? Allah does not say, إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ مِنَ Allah. He doesn't add مِنَ Allah. He doesn't say, you are, the, you are among the sent from Allah. Allah has not yet been mentioned at all. All that's been mentioned is there's this Qur'an, it's an incredible recital, it's so full of wisdom, it's so bold in the way it gives verdicts, it's so tightly knit, this can't be his, he has to have been sent by somebody. We don't know who that is yet. You understand? So the, the mystery has been created but it hasn't been answered. And before we go on, one more thing about this, this or three more things actually. Three more things about إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَيْهِ here's, here's the second thing. Who is Allah talking to? He says, no doubt you are from those that have been sent. So who's he talking to? He's talking to the Prophet Instead of talking to the Quraysh and telling them, no doubt he is from the messengers. He's from the ones that are sent. He's not even talking to them. He's not even talking to the disbeliever. He's talking to the Prophet himself wasallam. You know why? Because the disbelievers call him a liar. The disbelievers call him insane. They call him all these things. And you know when somebody calls you crazy? Like, how could you do that? But another person calls you crazy? Then another person calls you crazy? Then a hundred people call you crazy? What might you start thinking? Maybe I am crazy. One person calls you a liar, another calls you a liar, your uncle calls you a liar, your cousin calls you a liar, your business partner calls you a liar, your neighbor calls you a liar. People who don't even know you on the street call you a liar. You, it might start affecting you, isn't it? You need someone to say, you know what, don't listen to what they're saying. I'm telling you you're not a liar. I'm telling you you're not insane. I'm telling you you're not evil. You need to listen to me and forget everything else they're saying. You know, this is the idea of propaganda. They say on the news, Muslims are this, 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 this. I mean, there's a long list of things Muslims are. You know? We, we make people really nervous at airports and in elevators. People get, even the flight on an elevator is uncomfortable for people. And just, just yesterday I got, I got in the elevator and there was a, uh, a family and I pressed the floor for my elevator and they didn't press anything. So I assumed that they're on the same floor. <laughs> and when I, when the, the, the time came as a courtesy because they're just women and kids. So I said, you know, go ahead. They said, no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then they pressed the button and pressed the close multiple times. Like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Propaganda works, dude. Propaganda works. It's pretty awesome. You know? So now, what I'm saying is, it can even affect you. By the way, are even Muslims affected by propaganda? Against themselves? Do we start seeing ourselves in a negative image? Sure. We start apologizing for being who we are. We start asking our own Imams questions that usually non-Muslims ask us. Why are we like this? Why do we say that? What does the Quran say? You know, they say, why does the Quran say that? <laughs> and then you go, why is Quran Pak saying this? And you know, like, it's the same question. <laughs> why are you asking the same question? As the, you know. But you know what the Prophet's being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's being told, you don't need validation from anywhere else. I am telling you, you are from those who have been sent. You don't need anybody else's validation. You have mine. That's enough for you. None of the peer pressure counts anymore. But he didn't just say, you are, this is my third point now. He didn't just say, you are a messenger. He said, you are from among the ones who are sent. What does that mean? That means that he's not alone. Because if I tell you, you are from among the Muslims, then there's a large group of Muslims. When you tell him, you're from among the ones that are sent, then there must be others that are sent. So now the Prophet is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as alone as you feel, there are people that I will introduce you to, or that I am introducing you to, that are part of the same team, you are part of a larger brotherhood, and, you, and when you have people that belong to the same group as you, then you find support in them. Like if you live, some people live in the United States, there's like they don't see any Muslim in the university, or they don't see any Muslim at the at workplace. Then they're going grocery shopping and you know, they see one guy. One guy who clearly visibly looks Muslim. He's like reviewing Fatiha or something. <laughs> and they get so happy because I have some support. Somebody else like me. When the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger, he's the only messenger. But Allah is saying, yes, 
previous messengers went back, they, they're gone a long time ago, but He will bring them back to life with His words. Allah will bring previous prophets back, back to life when He will talk about them. And you will find your support and your comfort in them. So the first val validation or comfort is from Allah. I'm telling you, you're from among those who are sent. And second of all, He's been given a hint. Listen, you're part of a team. You're part of a brotherhood. And you will find support in them. Obviously you need support when people doubt you. And that's why the word inna is used in the beginning. No doubt about it. You are from those who have been sent. Because there are people who doubt. But you should never doubt. Now, the last point about the word, this ayah. Inna ka al mursali. Not all the ayat will be this long. Just don't get overwhelmed. We do have 83 ayat to get to. But I do want to establish the, the thought process of the surah in the beginning. And I also like to highlight how things are flowing from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. That's part of the job I have, inshallah. So the last thing I want to tell you about this ayah is that the word mursal is different from rasul. The word rasul means messenger. That's an easy translation, messenger. And some poor translations of the Quran also say you are from among the messengers. That's actually not correct. Mursal in Arabic and ism maf'ul means the one who has been sent. Someone who's been sent. Now there's a difference between a messenger and someone who's been sent. If I'm a messenger, then I could be delivering a message on my own behalf. I could be. I could be the messenger of my own message. But if I'm someone who has been sent, then necessarily it means that the message I have is from somebody else. It's not from me. It's been, I've been charged with something. So now the, the Prophet is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's no doubt about it, you are, the, you are among the group of people that have been given a job. You have been sent with a mission. This is not something you're reciting because you like to, or because you want to, or because you have another agenda. Your primary objective is to be the slave of Allah, and you are fulfilling His commandment. He started the book with Iqra' Bismi Rabbik, read in the name of your master, from the position of authority, you are under Allah's authority when you speak. Now, this is going to be really important later on, but when it gets, actually in the next ayah, so I'll hold off to then. So this, the idea of the Prophet ﷺ having a duty, not just that he's being comforted, he's also being reminded that he's on a mission. So no matter how much pressure he feels, he still has a job to do. And then you know, when you have a tough job, you need two things. You need someone to back you up and support you and say, we're going to get through this, I got you, I got you. And that's done in this ayah. But at the same time, you need someone to remind you, listen, you only have four hours left. Get the job done. That's done in this ayah too. Both dimensions of your, what you need to get your job done are, are covered. On the one hand, the comforting and the support and the validation. And on the other hand, the reminder that, listen, this needs to get done. I know it's tough, but we're going to do it. That's it. There's no choice in the matter. It's Let's move on. Allah says, Ala siratim mustaqim, on a straight path. You know, uh, upon a straight path. I mean, siratim mustaqim is something you've heard about so many times before. But what is this doing here? First of all, I want you to understand that upon a straight path, ala siratim mustaqim, I don't like the word upon really. I like committed to. The ala here, the luzum suggests you're committed to a straight path. You're committed to a straight path. But the first question I want to answer is, who is committed to a straight path? What do you think? What's, it's obvious. I swear by the Qur'an full of wisdom, and how well knit it is, and how, much, how strong verdicts it has. No doubt you must be, you are from those that truly have been sent upon a straight path. Who's on a straight path? The Prophet himself, but not only the Prophet. Not only the Prophet Even the ones that have been sent. They were on a straight path, and so are you, it applies to both of them. Now the ala salat mustaqim applies to both of them. Now why is that important? Imagine a road. And if you're on this road, and you're the only one on this road, and everybody else is trying to push you off the road, and you're moving forward, and they're just trying to, they're yelling at you, they're, get off this road, why are you here, etc, etc. You're going the wrong way, you're the only one going that way. And Allah is encouraging you to keep going. And then He says, by the way, you're not the first one to go down this road. I had other people go down this road too. You understand? So now you're, you're gonna look for them even more because if somebody has navigated this road and faced all of its challenges before you, then you will look to them as an example and they will help you navigate it better. They will make this journey easy. The, by the way, you do this in real life. You're traveling on a road, 
you get the report that there's some traffic or there's some, you know, are there a lot of cops on this road? Some of you have those like radar things in your car or whatever, but it ran out of batteries or something. You call your friend, yo, I'm on the, I'm on the George Bush or I'm on, I don't know what tollways you have here. There's too many of them, you know, Sam Houston or something. And you, so you have, I'm on this road. Are there a lot of cops on here or should I, you know, do it? No, 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 bro, I was there out last week, they got me a ticket. Okay, okay, I'll stay within the halal lim limits. You know, so <laughs> you look for someone else who's gone down the road and they help you navigate it better. Again, a, a source of support. Then the other thing. The Prophet ﷺ gives these really uncompromising, unapologetic verdicts through the word of Allah. Allah speaks like a master. He doesn't speak like a slave. He speaks like a master. And so he speaks with authority. And it's, people find it offensive because they don't hear Allah speaking. Who do they hear speaking? The Prophet ﷺ. Who are you to talk like this? So they get offended. But does the Prophet stop? No. And every day does he have to keep making more progress on the, the same path? Now if you make progress on the same path, tell me, isn't it logical that you're going to get more trouble? You're going to get more and more and more trouble. There's going to be more and more pressure for you to take a turn. The more, you make the more you make progress, the more resistance, the more opposition, and the more there's a chance that you will, you know, you can handle a little bit pressure. Tomorrow you have to handle more pressure. The day more, then the day more, then the day more. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get tougher. A normal human being can only handle so much pressure before what happens? They push. They, they take a turn. But the Prophet ﷺ, his toughness, his commitment is being highlighted. And the commitment of those Prophets are being highlighted because they're on a straight path and they never flinch. They never flinch. People come to them with attack, people come to them with ridicule, people come to them with threats. People come to them with threats of exile and of killing, of torture. They don't budge. Their family comes to them. Their elders come to them. Their political leaders come. Everybody comes to them. They don't flinch. They're committed. This is the idea of the toughness required. And by the way, that itself is proof that he has to be a messenger. Why would he put himself in this much pain? That it, we're still continuing the idea that this Qur'an, carrying this Qur'an, you can only do so if you were sent. Because it just brings way too much trouble. Like, like one of the Mufassirun said, إِلْتِزَامُهُ دَلِيلٌ عَلَى نُبُوَّتِهِ وَسِيرَتِهِ دَلِيلٌ كَمَا أَنَّ الْقُرْآنَ دَلِيلٌ This is important now. The Qur'an, because of its perfection that I talked about, the three kinds of perfection of the Qur'an, itself is proof. And now the Prophet's commitment to this cause itself is proof. They're, all, they're again a proof. But then there's that last thing I want to tell you about this ayah. عَلَى صِرَاتٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ It doesn't say upon the, or committed to the straight path. It says committed to a straight path. Siratin mustaqim. Fanakkara al He made it nakira, made it common. There's a difference between saying the straight path and a straight path. Because in Fatiha, we don't say guide us to a straight path. We say guide us to the straight path. Idina sirat al mustaqim. There's al on it. Here it's not. What does that do? Actually, this, when you take al off, it means it's something unknown. It's something unknown. And even though Allah is talking to the Prophet wasallam, who else is listening? Quraysh. Quraysh are listening. And Quraysh may not know a lot about the Qur'an, and we'll see that they may, they, they may or may not. But they know one thing. They know the Prophet wasallam, And even if he doesn't say a word, they can tell the way he lives is some kind of straight road. He's a really straight arrow. He always does things the right way. In other words, even if you don't know all the details, just observing his character will give you the conclusion that this is some kind of a straight path. Just observing the Muslim is enough. Especially this messenger wasallam. That itself will give off the vibe that there's a straight path here. Ala sirat mustaqim Has Allah mentioned himself yet? No. He didn't say anything about himself. Not yet. He did say he's been sent, you have been sent, you're committed to a straight path. But sent by who? And where is this wisdom of the Qur'an coming from? How is it speaking with such authority? Finally that question is answered, and it's answered with such emphatic language, Tanzeel al-Aziz al-Rahim. Three words. And the first word, Tanzeela, 
for those of you that know a little bit of Arabic, النصب على الإغراء, there's a fatha on it. You know what that means? That you don't say that nicely. You don't recite Tazeel al Aziz al Rahim. Allahu Akbar. Nope. When it's tanzila like that, that means that Allah Azza wa Jal is speaking with great authority. Revelation! Like it's, it's not normally said. It's like exclamations embedded in the Arabic grammar. It's an exclamation. Listen up! What this is, is something that has been sent down. Revelation. Revelation of who? Belonging to who? Al-Aziz, Al-Rahim. Two names of Allah here. Al-Aziz means the one who has the authority and commands respect. Al-Aziz means two things. The one who has authority and commands what? Respect. I want you to understand that because there are two kinds of people sometimes. There's the kind of people that have authority, but they have no respect. It could be a police officer has authority, but he doesn't have respect, like what we saw in Baltimore. Right? They have authority but no respect. But there also could be people that have respect, but no what? Authority. No authority. Neither of them have izzah. Izzah in Arabic is not like izzah in Urdu. It's not like that. Izzah in Arabic is when you have respect, at the same time you have authority. That's when you have izzah. When he says, this is the revelation of the one who commands respect. The ultimate authority. Allah Azza wa is telling us something very powerful. You remember one of the three qualities of the Qur'an is that it gives verdicts? Well, who has the right to give verdicts? The one who has the authority. And even if somebody has the authority and they give a verdict, sometimes like Judge Judy, I used to watch a lot of Judge Judy with my mom. <laughs> Judge Judy gives verdicts. You young man, you be quiet. Like, you know, she does that. It's awesome. And then, you know, you get $500, get out of my face. And then, you know, and, and they, I love the interviews outside. I love those, especially of the guy that loses. Because the guy that wins are so inarticulate, yeah, I got my $500, I'm really happy, you know, that's all they say. But the guy that loses, she's so unfair, I can't believe that she, how is she even a judge, or something, you know? In other words, they had a, she, her verdict had authority, but it didn't command what? It didn't command respect. Allah Azza wa Jal says, this Qur'an is full of verdicts, and those verdicts deserve to be taken seriously because they come from the authority and they need to be respected. And that's captured inside the word Al-Aziz. It's actually going back to the word Al-Qur'an Al-Hakim in that sense. Now, it answers the question, who's this revelation from? It talks about, you know, these verdicts. Man yaliqul hukum. But it also says something else, tanzil. What does the word tanzil mean? Something that comes from above. In other words, let me answer this question, who is his teacher, who sent him, where did the wisdom of the Qur'an came from? It came from above, and that means that you have no access to it, which means this is something no human being could have come up. It didn't come from the left or the right, the east or the west, it didn't come from a different village, it didn't come from a scholar, it didn't come from other universities, it came from above, somewhere that education, you know, we go, when we go for education, we go east or west, north or south, that's where we go for education. We can't go up for education. But this, this man's education is coming from above, which means you will have no access to it. This is way beyond your reach. This again reinforces what is the Qur'an, it's too perfect in its wisdom because it's from above. It's too well knit. You can only tighten it like that if it's from above. And it gives these verdicts that can only come from above. That's why the word Tanzil. But then the last name of Allah here, Tanzil al-Azizi al-Rahim. What does Ar-Rahim mean? You guys know what it means? The merciful. The one who loves, the one who cares. The one who always loves and cares, by the way. Ar-Rahim. What is the word Ar-Rahim doing? I understand what Aziz is doing here now. But what is the word Ar-Rahim doing there? Who did this message come to? The Prophet ﷺ. Why him? Why not anybody else? The Qur'an itself will tell us, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you except as a rahmah. The Prophet ﷺ is the most merciful human being that ever lived. So the Qur'an, which is the authority, had to be delivered on the tongue of the most merciful human being that ever lived. And that is an act of Allah's mercy. Allah's mercy to humanity is Rasulullah wasallam. So on the one hand, the Qur'an is Aziz and the Rasul is from Ar-Rahim. Rasul Sallallahu is not authoritative. What is he? He's merciful. The Qur'an is authoritative. Both of them had to come together, the messenger and the message.
They both have to come together. One thing I didn't mention about these ayat that I should mention now before we move on, because this is the finishing of this subject. We're still in, you know, part one of the surah. How many parts did I say? I don't know if you remember. Good job, six parts. We're still in part one. One thing I should say is that there are two things. When Allah guides, there are two parts. There's the message and there's the messenger. There's the message and there's the messenger. Now when Allah says, Quran al Hakim, Mursaleen, He validates the message. The message is way too perfect for it to be human. That's done. That takes care of the message, but that's only half the story. You can't just have a message. What do you, what do you also need? A messenger. So the message is perfect, what about the messenger? Well, let me tell you about the messenger and his character, ala siratim mustaqim. He's committed to a straight path. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ has to demonstrate the highest character for guidance to happen. Guidance does not just happen from a message, it happens when the message and the messenger both are ideal. The message is already ideal, and now the messenger is ideal. Let me give you a worldly example to help you understand that. Politicians can give really good speeches, but if they have a bad track record, if people know that they've been corrupt before, does the good speech mean anything? It doesn't. It doesn't mean anything. Because their actions, especially those caught on film, are louder than words. So no matter what they say, it doesn't count anymore. You know, the Prophets ﷺ have lived an entire life of credibility. Right? So that, that has to be part of the guidance. If, if the Messenger doesn't have credibility, then the message itself doesn't have credibility. Even if it's from Allah. Now, let's move forward. The Prophet is still being spoken to. Allah says, لِتُنذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاءُهُمْ Why did I send this incredible revelation to the ultimate authority, the all-merciful, from the all-merciful? Why did He send it? To you, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says, so you can warn a nation whose ancestors were not warned, and therefore they are completely clueless. I'll translate it again. <laughs> so you could warn a nation whose ancestors were not warned at all, therefore they are completely clueless, completely heedless, just totally unaware. That's why you were given this revelation. Okay, inside this ayah, the first thing to note is that if you've been sent to warn, think about the word warning outside of religion. When do you get a warning? There's a storm coming. You guys know about those, Houston. The storm coming. You, the radio tells you a warning. Television tells you a warning. Your phone alerts go off, etc., etc. Yes? Warnings have to come from authoritative, reliable sources, yes or no? It has to come from a source that has authority and a source you'll respect. Is there a word like that that we already covered? Aziz. If you have been sent to warn, you better be sent to warn by someone who can actually in a valid way warn or send the warning and that is Al-Aziz. You understand? So it's actually tied to the word. This is a flow. Now the second thing to note here. We are in this hall, imagine there's no internet connection, there is no cell connection, etc. So you can't use Facebook like that person's using over there. This, you, can't, you can't do any of it, okay? If there was something happening outside, if there was something happening outside, if there was some big news event outside, would you know? No. You wouldn't know. You cannot be warned unless the warning comes from the outside. Is that clear? If you're sitting in your basement, we don't have basements in Texas, if you're sitting in your media room, <laughs> you know, playing a video game and you don't know what's going on outside, then you cannot be warned unless someone comes into the room. The Prophet ﷺ lives among them, yes or no? He lives among them. And now he's about to give them a warning. But by definition, a warning has to come from outside. So they're going to question, where did the warning come from? Ah, the warning came from above. That's already been established. Where? Where? Tanzeel al-Aziz al-Rahim. That's why the warning. Otherwise you can't warn. If you're living in the same living room, you're sitting in the same living room, hey by the way, you can't warn. Where did you get this news from? You don't even have a phone. Now the second thing, or the third thing rather. Why do you warn someone? Hey, don't go on that road. Hey, stay home. Hey, don't do this. 
When, why do you warn someone? Yeah, one of the most primary considerations for warning someone is you're concerned about them. You care about them. You love them. You don't want harm to come to them. And actually, that's the name of Allah Ar-Rahim. The one who cares for you and wants to show you mercy, wants to avoid harm for you. The reason that you have been sent, the reason the Prophet ﷺ has been sent, to warn, because warning itself is an act of Allah's mercy. You know, some people complain, why does the Qur'an talk about hellfire? And I say, maybe we're not thinking about this clear enough. If somebody warned you about a, a storm or a flood, why are you talking about a flood? Floods are so bad. I'm in such a bad mood because you told me about a flood. Never talk to me again. I don't like talking to you. Like, you're gonna die. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, it's coming. Wouldn't be, why, why not appreciate the act of love that somebody is actually what? Warning you. Why does he have to spell it out? Why can't he just say, something bad's gonna happen? <laughs> if there's a tsunami coming and you tell someone, something bad's gonna happen, are you gonna take it seriously? It has to be spelled out. And that's an act of Allah's love. لِتُنْذِرَ <laughs> قَوْمًا Now, oh, that, this I absolutely love. Oh my God. You know when you, we started the surah, we said, Wal Quran al Hakim and the, the Quran full of wisdom. The Quran that is well knit. The Quran that has verdicts. It's a the, not a. It's a the. As though the Quran is well known in Arab society now. The Qurayshis know about it. They've heard it enough. So when you say the, they know exactly what. They're not just thinking any recital, they're thinking that recital. It's known. And which nation was the Prophet sent to, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He was sent to the Quraysh. But the Quraysh, and we all know that they're known people. They're very famous people. But look at how Allah talks about them in this ayah. He insults them from his position of authority. He said, you came to warn some nation. He doesn't say the nation. He says, some nation. Qawman, some nation. The Quraysh are a proud people or no? That's the first insult already. When you say like this, you know, it's such, it's such a muhajama against them, such an attack against them that you just say qawman. And then, okay, let me describe. And by the way, they were so proud of their ancestry. They used to be, you know, Banu Amir, Banu Hisham. They used to just take pride in their ancestry. And Allah says, some nation, let me tell you about their ancestry. They didn't know anything either. Their ancestors weren't warned, warned either. You people think you're all that? You are nothing. You are insignificant, Allah is telling them. مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ You came to warn just some insignificant nation, even whose ancestors didn't get the blessing of revelation. مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ No wonder, فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ They are completely heedless. They are completely clueless. Now let's talk about their cluelessness. I want you to appreciate it. You guys know where Hijaz is, the Arabian desert where the Prophet ﷺ came. Are there other superpowers in the neighborhood? Regions, other neighboring regions? Are there kingdoms and large civilizations in proximity? Yeah, sure, the, you know, there's the Abyssinians, there's the Persians, which is a massive civilization, and an ancient one at that. There's the Roman Empire, right? There are many, many large, very old, very established civilizations. How established are the Arabs at the time? I mean, how many universities do they have? What kind of great history of you know, libraries and philosophy books do they have like the Romans or mythologies like the Greeks or something or statues or monuments or infrastructure or you know, massive roadways or coliseums or castles? N nothing. They got nothing. Allah is saying to Quraysh, you are so proud of yourselves. You are so completely clueless. There are nations that are so much bigger than you. Who do you think you are? Who do you Why are you so full of yourself? You're nothing. Compared to the scene in the world, you are insignificant. People don't even want to invade you. Because there's no oil yet. <laughs> They've left you alone. Can you remember? The, the, the Romans don't want them. The Persians don't want them. What are we going to send our soldiers to get barbecued for? Camel doesn't taste that good. They leave it alone. They've left it alone for thousands of years. Every civilization wants to expand its territory, yes or no? So the question arises, why aren't they expanding their territory? Because it just ain't worth it, man. It just ain't worth it. So they left them alone. And you think you're all that? You know this kind of mentality happens to people when they live in a village? 
or they live in a closed bubble, they become really full of themselves. And they think they're all that, not realizing nobody cares about them in the outside world. It can happen inside the boardroom of a masjid. <laughs> nobody cares in the outside. I'm the president of the... <laughs> nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, really, no, nobody cares at all, ever. <laughs> Does it happen or no? There, you know, I was, um, well, a friend of mine showed me a video of a, of a, a man from the, you know, the untouchable class in India, Hindu, he used to be Hindu, left his religion, he just bashes Hinduism on YouTube, and I'm not here to bash Hinduism, but his whole point was the entire religion was designed to create a class society. And he's at the lowest of the untouchables, and he lives in Northern California now, he's the head of a tech company, he makes millions of dollars, and he's highly, highly accomplished in his career, right? And he says, when I go back to my village, and if I sit on the bus right now, they won't sit next to me. I make more money than the village combined, and they won't sit next to me. I have more of an education than the entire village put together, and they won't sit next to me. Because in their little world, they are the top. In their little insignificant world. That is Quraysh, delusional about their power. This can happen to a mother-in-law. This can happen to a husband. <laughs> it can. This can happen to parents. This can happen to an older sibling. This can happen to anyone who even has a little bit of power, and that power turns into a drug, and then they think they're on top and nobody can touch them. This is what the reality check Allah is giving Quraysh. You take pride in your ancestry? Yeah, they didn't have a clue either. They weren't warned either. فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ Then, not only is that not enough, that you're unaware of the fact that the world moves on and you've stayed in the same place for centuries. The world has advanced and you've stayed exactly where you were. On top of that, you're even so unaware of your own ignorance. You guys don't know anything. You don't know anything. You're an uneducated people. You're being given the gift of a high education from Allah. You have no idea. By the way, when, when a, a, a community has not had education for a long time, it stops valuing education. Right? It, it doesn't see it as important anymore. Actually, it starts looking down on people that do give an education. And then they get scared of education because they know when you get educated, you change. So now they're, they're, they'd like to keep things ignorant. You know, I, I highlight these things because this is not just a problem of Quraysh. The Muslims. I'm not, I don't care about talking about anybody else. We should talk about ourselves. Parts of the Muslim world. Huge parts of the Muslim world. And even ourselves. Completely uneducated on a number of things. And we'd like to keep it that way. Because it's uncomfortable to learn new things and want to change. It's not comfortable. Then what else are they heedless of? The fact that Allah has given them the most merciful human being that ever lived. And the greatest word that ever came, came catered to them. Custom revealed for Quraysh. We have to learn about Quraysh to learn about the Qur'an. The book that was for all humanity can only be understood properly when you understand the people it came to, yes? Allah made them the most significant historical group of people to study for the Muslims across continents, across languages, and across civilizations until Judgment Day, and they're in complete denial that they're sitting in the company of Rahmatul Lil Alameen. They have no clue who they're denying. They have no appreciation for what they've just received. If they had any idea, if they could just look into the future, just a hundred years into the future, if they could look two hundred years into the future, if they knew what this Qur'an did for the world, what did the Qur'an do for the world? What did Islam do for the world? What did it do in Andalus? What did it do in Dimashq? What did it do in Iraq? What did it do in India? What it did for the world? These people have no clue and they're just sitting there going, ah, we don't care. Completely clueless. And the final thing I want to highlight about how clueless they are happens to be about, you know, uh, uh, Really, it's an example of cluelessness. Sometimes you don't know who you're talking to. It happens, yeah? You don't know who you're talking to. And you act kind of stupid, not realizing that you're talking to somebody important. This actually happened one time um, in one of the gatherings, one of the shuyukh was telling me. His, his wife is also a teacher. She teaches uh, Islamic studies. Very famous, not going to name any names. So he's at Hajj. And one of the people in the group is talking to him. He has no idea who he is. And he says, yeah, this woman, she teaches. She's an Israeli spy. 
And he's 20 minutes talking about how the Jews are funding her to corrupt the Muslims. And he's talking to her husband. <laughs> Sometimes you're talking to someone and you have no idea who you're messing with. Does that happen? Sure. When they deny and make fun of or reject the message of the Qur'an, are they just denying the Prophet This is a high crime against the ultimate authority, Al-Aziz. Like, you know, and the more someone has authority, the more you want to watch it. You guys develop taqwa when you see a cop on the road. <laughs> you know, you sit a more, you, you sit like a human. You don't sit like, you know, like a pendu in a courtroom. You sit like a human, because the judge is, the judy is going to see you, you're going to, you know, you're going to sit properly. Because you're in this, you know, in this position where you have to show some respect. You see? There's protocol. When you are in the presence of authority and respect, there's protocol. They are in the presence of the word of Al-Aziz. And they have no protocol. Completely clueless who they're messing with. Completely clueless of the power he has to punish. The consequences that this may bring. So this is, you know, فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ The truth has become absolutely manifest. What that means is the truth has become absolutely clear. The word has become proven itself to be true to the vast majority of them. They still won't believe. فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Then they, they're not going to believe. Allah is saying something just mind-boggling here. He's saying most of them are actually already aware that the word you're saying is absolutely what? True. And they're still not going to believe. In the previous ayah, they have a long history of having no clue. In this ayah, they have every clue. They know. They know. And they still won't believe. But the question arises, if they're not going to believe, what's the point? Why even tell him, you go warn these people and they're not going to believe? Let's start at the top though. How did the truth become absolutely clear to them? There is an undeniable combination. The perfect word of Allah and the perfect character of the Prophet ﷺ. That's how guidance happens, right? Messenger and message. The both of them are at their peak. The greatest messenger and the greatest message ever. Those came together. So even the kafir, the denier, deep down inside knows there's no way we can respond to him. That is in fact the word of Allah. And Allah, I could not have known that, you could not have known that, even the Prophet could not have known that Wasallam. Allah takes a good look inside their hearts, and then does a diagnostic analysis, and then reveals the ayah, the truth has absolutely become clear, the word has become absolutely true to them, deep inside themselves. And, and for most of them that's the case, they already know. They're just not going to believe. Now, isn't it interesting that the Qur'an is enough for the Prophet Wasallam as a validation? Didn't he validate the Prophet in the beginning? He says, it's not just enough validation for you, it's also validation for them. Don't worry. You don't have to think it's not convincing enough, or it's not getting across. It got across. I'm telling you it got across. They're just not letting you see it. Now, the question then, the, the other beautiful thing about this ayah, scary thing too, Allah says, they will not believe. Fahum la yu'minun. The word yu'minun is a verb. And when the verb is used, it means it's temporary. Meaning for now they're not going to believe. But eventually, something might happen that they will believe. Now what is that? That's actually an indication in the Qur'an, a, a principle that is mentioned several places in the Qur'an. Please pay attention to it. The stubborn disbeliever who rejects the truth even after knowing the truth, there does come a time when he or she does believe. You know when? When they see the punishment. When they see the punishment, they decide, Inna mu'minun. Like Allah says in Surah Al-Dukhan, Rabba nakshif anna al-adhaab, inna mu'minun. Rabb, remove the punishment from us. We're ready to believe. We're ready to believe. Absarna wa sami'na. Farji'na na'mal salihan. We see now. So we're ready to listen. We see, now we're ready to listen. Allah here says, they don't believe for now, almost alluding to the fact that eventually, when they see the punishment, what's gonna happen? They will believe. But he tells us other places, Anna lahum dhikra What's the point now? What's the, I asked you to believe in the unseen. Not in, believing in something you can see, even an animal can do. A cat can see a fire and wow. That's, that's not an accomplishment. It's not called belief for that reason. So now here, he says, they're not going to believe. But then, the most important part of this ayah, I held off till the end. I asked you a really hard question. If they're not going to believe, then what's the, what's the point? Why are you telling me to do an impossible job? 
There's one word in this ayah, one word that answers that question. He says, لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ The truth has become absolutely clear to most of them. And even then they won't believe. If most of them won't believe, then who will? The least of them will, yes? There's a small minority among them who will believe. And I, the Prophet is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you need to warn all of them because you don't know which ones might believe. And I'll let you know though, most of them won't. It's not called a tough straight path for no reason. Just work with the fact that you're only gonna get a few. And I'm not even gonna tell you who they are. If you could just tell me who they are, my job might become easier. I just go after them, don't waste my time with everybody else. Nope, not gonna tell you. Just most of them won't believe. And by the way, seriously, they're not gonna believe like, how stubborn are they? The next ayah will tell you, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ أَغْلَالًا No doubt about it, we have put collars, metal collars in their necks. Like a thick collar made of metal, bracelet thingy, like this. And it's got chains on it. When does someone have that? Now, more, think more than punishment. Prison. This is prison. They've got these guys chained next to each other. One to the next, to the next, to the next. Each one of them has a collar. It goes up to the chin. So this collar is like this, it's up to the chin. And they're walking like this. Then their necks are being held up. That's how, this is an imagery of prison. I want you to remember, this is an image of prison. What does that have to do with this? Allah is not telling you that if you go to the Quraysh, if you go to Abu Jahal right now, you're gonna see a collar on his neck and he's gonna say, could you please take this off? It's really uncomfortable. No, no, no. Is this a visible or an invisible collar? It's an invisible collar. But you know what? I need you to understand the imagery of prison first. These people are chained, which means they're in prison. And if they're in prison, they're cut off from the outside world, yes? Because when you're in prison, you don't know what's happening where? In the outside world, which means you are unaware, clueless, and heedless. Is there that, is that word already come? Ghafilun. Why are you ghafil? Because you're in prison. And if you have a collar like this, you can't really look around, which means you can't even know what's going on in your immediate surroundings. You're even more heedless, more clueless. And then you have to say that in prison, if somebody gets thrown in prison, you should be able to say, why did they deserve it? Why did you go to prison? In order to go to prison, you have to be charged with a crime, yes? But the ayat before already charged him with a crime. The truth already became clear to him. The word was absolutely manifest to him, to them, and they still didn't believe. That's the crime. And when that's the crime, they should go to prison. But then you don't just go to prison, your punishment should fit the crime. You ever heard this phrase before? The punishment should fit the crime? Now, what, so far what we know about the punishment is he's got a collar right here. On his what? Neck. On his neck. Did Allah say he knows the truth in his heart? Did he allude to the fact that he already knows what's the truth? Yes. He did. So the truth is in his heart, but he's too arrogant to let it out of his mouth, it gets stuck in his neck. It never makes his way to his mouth, he holds it in. That's why they're called a kafir. Kafir means someone who buries the truth. Kafir is also used for a farmer who plants the seed, because he buries the seed. So the fact that they keep it under their neck, their neck itself gets locked up. The crime is right here. They could say it, but their pride keeps them. But then you know, I want you to think also about the fact that when you hold your head up like this, and you don't have a collar, what is that? That's pride. The image of a prisoner having his neck up like this is a humiliating image. But Allah compares that head up high with the proud disbeliever who out of his arrogance and his stubbornness and his pride refuses to listen to this message. He thinks that he's being proud. Allah calls his pride a prison. He calls it a prison. He call, he's in prison. He doesn't even know that he's enslaved by his own pride. It's incredible imagery in the ayah. And last thing about this ayah, when you do have this collar on your neck, can you see yourself? Yeah. Forget being unaware of what's happening outside of prison or around you. You can't even take a good look at who? Your own self. فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ 
أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ He made them forget themselves. They can't even see their own selves. إِذَا أَخْرَجَ يَدَهُ لَمْ يَكَدْ يَرَاهَا Quran says, if he would take his hand out, he almost can't even see his own hand. This is how bad their situation is. That's how stubborn they are. But their stubbornness, Allah is not... I was, when I read this, I was like, okay, probably Allah is going to move on to the next subject now, because that's enough of a beating. There's another ayah. وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا And right in front of them we put a wall. وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا And behind them we put a wall. فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ We covered them. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ Then they can't see. You're in prison, you're chained to other people, there's a wall in front of you and there's a wall behind you. Why didn't he mention walls on the sides? Because when you're chained you can only move what? And you can't even look around because you have a collar. So all you can see is front and back, that's it. You can get pulled back or pushed forward. That's it. The image is being completed. They are only headed in this direction. Now what did Allah say? There's a wall in front of them and there's a wall behind them. What is the purpose of a wall? You can't escape. The pr another purpose of a wall is you can't see beyond it. Yes? That's what makes you unaware. But there are three blocks. Wall in front, wall behind, and cover on top. This is really, really important. When I say really important two times with saying really, really, that means it's really really important. If I just say really important, I'm just trying to keep you awake. But if I say really really important, then it's really really important. Three blocks. The first block was where? Right in front of them. I need you to understand what that means. There's a block right in front of them. You know what's right in front of us? Everything. When I wake up, my house is right in front of me. When I go downstairs, my kids are right in front of me. When I go outside, the sky is right in front of me. When I get in the car, my car is right in front of me. My friends are right in front of me. Quran is right in front of me. All of life, all of Allah's creation is always where? Right in front of me. And that creation, that life, that sky, that earth, that tree, that child, that spouse, they are all reminders of Allah. All of them. But they are blocked from this. So they see all of that stuff, but none of it reminds them of Allah. None of it is enough for them to think. They are blocked from that path to truth. In other words, the first wall is the wall of creation. I want you to understand what that is. Everything Allah created is right in front of us. It's always there. You're not always reading Quran. You're not always doing ibadah. You're not always doing... But you know what? Whenever you're awake, what is always in front of you? Creation is always in front of you. Something to reflect upon with your eyes is always there. That's the first block. The second block is where? Behind them. What is behind us? Our history. My own history my people's history, my, the history of other nations, that's all where? They don't look at the world around them because of the wall in front of them. They don't even care to reflect upon what happened to people before them. And so they have a block even behind them. Now there's two so far. There's the world around you, number one, and there's history, number two. But then that's not enough. They're blocked somewhere else too. Where? We covered them from the top. Now if you block him from the top, there must be something you can learn from the top that may give you the truth. If you pay attention to the world around you, it might lead you to the truth. If you pay attention to history, it might lead you to the truth. And maybe there's something from above that might lead you to the truth. What is that? A revelation of Allah. Now that's blocked from their hearts too. Quran will describe, no matter where you study in the Quran, there are three ways you can arrive at the truth. You can pay attention to the world around you, you can pay attention to history, and you can pay attention to revelation. That is the constant three in the Qur'an. When you pay attention to yourself, you're paying attention to your... You, you, you are part of the world around you. سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ The world around you is the first path to truth. Every human being has access to that. History. Those who care to think about history will arrive at the truth. And of course, the most powerful way to the truth is the one that comes from above. These people are completely blocked. So forget about the revelation, they're not listening to the revelation. Before the Prophet was told وسلم, that these people are not gonna listen to you, even if it's Qur'an, which is from above, that's not their first crime. They don't even pay attention to the world around them. They don't even care about the ruins. They passed by ruined nations, the Arabs used to pass by ruined nations and didn't think twice. What would have happened here? How did they end up like this? They never thought about it. Never occurred to them. Therefore, they're just not going to be able to see. What an image, guys. 
What an image. And at the end of it all, now the Prophet ﷺ was told, is he going to be able to get the majority or the minority? What was he told? Minority. And now he's being told the majority is so bad, they are so hopeless. It is the same, it won't even matter whether you warn them or not, they're just not going to believe. Ya Allah, you just told me to warn them, and now you say it doesn't even matter if you warn them or not. Yes, a huge population among them, it don't even matter. So if this was a crowd this big, the Prophet was talking to وسلم, the vast majority of them, collars in their necks. The vast majority of them won't pay attention to anything. And he still has to do it. Why though? Why if most of them are not just not going to believe? Not even the Qur'an. Not even the Qur'an from the voice of Rasulullah is enough for them. How stubborn can they be that the Qur'an from the Prophet himself is not enough for them? That's a pretty hopeless state to be. And when that happens, when they're in this hopeless state, the Prophet is then told وسلم, إِنَّمَا تُنذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرِ You're only going to be able to follow, to, to warn the one who followed the reminder. Before I tell you about this ayah, I need to tell you one more thing. How many ways to the truth did I say? Three. What were they? What were they? Easy, easy. So, super easy. That was really, really important. Oh. Creation, history, revelation. Yes? Okay. Creation, history, revelation is how you use your mind to arrive at the truth. Once you arrive at the truth, you will benefit from warnings. There's one, two, three, and what's number four? The warnings. If you give warnings before arriving at the truth, it don't mean anything. Sometimes our kids don't know anything about Islam. Why should I pray, mom? Allah will be very angry, but I will be even more angry. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you love giving warnings, but you don't actually explain the truth first. You know what happens when you do that? People run away. Warnings are for those who can actually benefit from the truth first. Now what are the ways to the truth? The world around you, history, and revelation. Yes? Then the warning. See where the warning came? The warning is now, and it, now Allah is saying, when those three roads are blocked, doesn't matter how much you warn. They're just not going to believe. It's not going to matter. Doesn't that affect the way you talk to people about Islam? Doesn't it, shouldn't it be that we should emphasize right now the proper ways of thinking? Instead of just warning? And if you do want to warn people, what should you start with? The right way of thinking. Make them reflect on history. Make people reflect on revelation. Make people think about the world around them. And then give them a warning. I would argue that most Muslims today didn't have a formal or even a decent, halfway decent education in Islam, myself included. We don't. It's just the tragic world we live in. It's not our fault. So if we don't have the right foundation, and you come along and give a one hour lecture about the heat of hellfire, there's going to be a problem. Because the right foundation isn't there. The Prophets did not begin, they did not begin with warnings. They didn't begin like that. This is much later on in the game. So now let's talk about this ayah. You're only going to be able to warn the one who followed the reminder. Man dhikra. You know, when he uses the word man, someone, he's suggesting that maybe one z, two z you'll get. He doesn't, and, he'll, and the word man means someone who's unknown. If it was alladhi, like innama tunziru man tunziru alladhi taba'ad dhikra, then it would have been a known person. But man means an unknown person. In other words, the Prophet is talking to a large crowd, sallallahu alayhi wa and there's somebody in there, somebody in there, he doesn't even know who it is. And they start following what he's saying, and they're thinking about it. Now there's a difference between following the reminder and following the command. When you follow a command like prayer, you can see me praying. You could say, this person's following a command of Allah, yes? But when someone's sitting there following along what you're saying, can you tell what's going on in their head or no? The Prophet, no, I can't tell. I mean, some of you just do this because you're staying awake. Or you get really nervous, you think I'm looking at you because you have paranoia. You know? That's happened a lot. Like I was talking to that guy and this guy gets really scared because he thinks I'm looking at him. And, you know? <laughs> it happens. But I don't know what's going on in your head. Maybe you're thinking, oh my God, did I leave the stove open? Or you think, did I lock the car? You know? 
So, or some people think, what time does the game come on? Or, there's different things going on in your head. I don't know. The Prophet ﷺ has no idea what's going on in people's heads. He's not supposed to know. Allah says your only job is to, to warn the one who might have something going on in his head. Look at the perfection of Allah's words. Rahman, And he was afraid of Ar-Rahman. Bil ghaib In the unseen. He was afraid of Ar-Rahman in the unseen. Why is the... Of course Ar-Rahman is in the unseen. So what does that mean in the unseen? Actually it means that he, is, he doesn't show his fear of Allah, of Ar-Rahman publicly. He shows it where? Privately, which means you still won't know who he is because even when he does fear Allah, it's in the private. The Prophet ﷺ will have no idea that someone in the audience is becoming Muslim. No clue. He'll just hear, he just has to trust Allah. And now think about the psychological impact of this. He's talking to a vast majority crowd that is aggressive against him. And somewhere in there, by his conviction, Allah has told him, someone in there is listening to you. And they've accepted, even though the whole crowd is against you. So you take that one person, فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Congratulate that one person of, of, of forgiveness. And congratulate them of noble compensation. You know, it's so, so incredible that Allah Azza wa Jal in this ayah, what He said, the, f- the first thing He offered is forgiveness. You know why? Because if you're one of those people, and you listen to the Prophet ﷺ, have you lived a good life or a life of sin before? sin before? You've lived a life of sin before. So as soon as you hear the truth, you start feeling guilty. And you feel like, man, I've made so many mistakes in my life. I wasted my whole life. What have I done? This even happens to Muslims. Muslims nowadays, sometimes somebody sends somebody a YouTube video, they watch it and go, Oh my God, I'm so messed up, I need to make changes in my life. What have I done? And this guilt overtakes you, doesn't it? And as soon as that happens, the Prophet is told to that crowd, to the one who does listen, I'm congratulating you, forgiveness is yours. You get forgiveness, that's the first thing this person needs. It's done, it's in the past, now you need to think ahead. But then the next problem comes. If I do move ahead, look at what's happening to this Prophet. Everybody makes fun of him. Everybody calls him a liar. Everybody calls him insane. The whole crowd is mad at him. If I follow him, what's gonna happen to me? The same thing. They're gonna think I'm part of the same cult. They're gonna go after me. So I'll lose all my respect, isn't it? Like that Prophet used to be a respectable man until he became a Prophet and claimed to be a messenger. Now nobody respects him. So if I follow him, if they didn't spare him, who was the nicest man in the entire city, how are they going to spare me? The genius of the Qur'an. Congratulate him of forgiveness, which I already explained. And congratulate him of noble compensation. Respectful compensation. Ajrin kareem. Why? Because now you shouldn't be looking for respect with people. Now you only have to be looking for respect with Allah. Your definition of where you find dignity and respect changes. You don't care what people think anymore. You're your own man now. You're your own woman now. The only dignity you want is from Allah. It freed you up from peer pressure. This one statement, you know what it did? You should have hope and you should not be afraid of people anymore. That's maghfiratin wa ajrin kareem. It's so beautiful. That's what this person needs more than anything else. فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ wa ajrin kareem. We're almost done. One last ayah. No doubt about it. We, we're the ones who give life to the dead. Oh my God, what is that doing here? This entire conversation was not about life after death. This conversation was, was about warning most of the people who will never listen. How the Quran is so perfect, but that doesn't even matter. Very, very few, maybe one guy might listen. Isn't that the conversation? And all of a sudden, in the concluding commentary, we give life to the dead. Why? The first obvious answer that some commentators have given is that, of course, the warning is about life after death. So let's just culminate this passage with the warning itself. We're going to give life to the dead no matter what. Here's the warning itself. But I go a step further. I was telling you that the Quraysh, they've been, uh, they've been warned. They haven't been warned for many generations. They've been heedless. That's established. You could even argue some of them have their hearts are dead. Isn't it? And no matter how much the Prophet preaches to them, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Every day he talks to them, doesn't make any difference. But Allah tells him, I give life to the dead. 
Don't give up on people. It's not your job to bring them back to life, to bring them back to faith. That's mine. Your job is just to warn. You don't know whose heart may have been dead for years and one day Allah brings it back to life. You don't know when Umar might turn. You don't know when Hamza might turn. You don't know when Abu Sufyan might turn. It's not going to happen quickly. You don't know when Khalid ibn Walid might turn. It took years. It took battles. He killed Muslims before he became Muslim. I mean, seriously. That's not up to you. We, we're the ones who give life to the dead. What is the preacher, the messenger, and everyone after him, the da'i? What are they being reminded? I, and even the messenger, they don't change people. People don't change people. People don't revive people. Who does? Allah does. No video changed your life. Allah did. No speech changed your life. Allah did. My teacher used to describe this concept with kun fayakun. He used to say, a, a, a khatib, a speaker, a alim is giving a talk. Words are coming out of his mouth. They're going into people's ears. Everybody's hearing the same exact words. But for one of those people, Allah says, kun. And his life changes completely from one sentence within the eight hours of yap, yap, yap. And that's not because of this person. It's because of Allah. We're the ones who give life to the dead. And those that are not listening, don't worry. It's not like they're getting away with what they're doing. We are writing down, we continue to write down the investments they've made. Everything you do is an investment into the future. Every time you do something bad, it is going into your future. And the, tr the, the, the ruins they leave behind, the traces they leave behind. You know what this ayah is about? This ayah is about every day we are making history. The Quraysh are making history, they don't even know. They are leaving a legacy for the future, and Allah is documenting it. And every day they are leaving a ruin wake behind them. A trail of ruin behind them. That other people will learn from. And so as he concludes this passage, he says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ And everything, everything they do. The Prophet ﷺ is being told, they don't get away with any of it. You know how Muslims get all frustrated? You know what they're doing nowadays? You know the video they just made? You know the campaign they just did? You know the attack they just did? You know this, you know that? Yeah, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ We're documenting all of it. And everything we have compiled it in perfect record. Ihsa actually means counting, like ancient counting used to be. You used to have a bottle and you put pebbles inside it. So that you never lose the count. Because if you count like this, you can mess up. But you put a pebble for every person, this is the perfect count. This is called Ihsa. He says, we've got perfect record of everything in a book that is wide open, that's going to be put right in front of them. Imam and Mubin. Imam comes from Amam, which means in front. A book that will be put right in front of you on Judgment Day will have every last thing perfectly documented. So don't you worry, they got away with nothing. From the beginning of the surah, the Prophet was being validated. You remember? The Prophet was being validated. By the end of this first passage, in this first section, of how many sections? Six sections. Alhamdulillah, the first and the longest one is done. Alhamdulillah. By the end of it, the Prophet is being given consolidation, consolation rather, consolation that their crimes are not going to go forgotten. They are, rec they are recorded. They are being recorded. Barakallahu li walakum. Let's take a good, I'll make it 12 minutes. I'll be nice. Allah Azza wa Jal from here on is going to talk. It's a long passage. He's going to talk about the on ongoings of a nation that came before, a town, some town, to whom Allah sent a number of messengers. I will give some introductory comments that are important for you to understand the rest of the story so we don't get caught up in these details later on. But there's one outstanding thing from the last conversation, part one. Here's what it is. Remember I told you how Allah, you know, uh, uh, the truth became clear to them and after that their, their, their hearing was, or, or their, their, there's a wall in front of them, wall behind them, collar on them, etc, etc. They're blocked from the truth entirely. Just make sure you understand that Allah never does that until people make up their mind to reject the truth even after knowing it. Allah never blocks the path to truth for someone who had no idea. So you'll notice in, in, in passage 1, Allah did say that their ancestors were never warned and they are unaware. You remember that? فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ He did not block them. 
But after the truth, لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ The truth became absolutely clear. The word was absolutely manifest to them. They still refuse to believe. Now that's a crime that should be punished in this world and the next. And the punishment in this world is that they get no access to thinking properly anymore. They refused to think when they had the chance and they made up their mind. Actually, they did think and they did come to the right conclusion but still didn't live up to it. Fine, have it your way. Now you don't get to think about it. That's Allah's punishment in this world. So that's just a clarity about, clarification about the previous passage. The second thing about, about now is how the Qur'an talks about history. By the way, has history been alluded to already in section 1 that we should learn from history? Where? وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا Behind them there is a wall. If there was no wall behind them, they would have learned from what is behind them. They would have thought about what is behind them, which is history. So now we're going to learn one of those lessons, the lessons from history. But the way the Qur'an approaches history, Allah does not tell us names of places, except very few like Misr. Allah does not take, tell us names of many individuals. You're going to see no names mentioned now. You're just going to call them people who were sent. Allah does not mention dates, chronologies. He doesn't mention them. The Qur'an is the perfect word of Allah, perfectly tight. Yes or no? So if Allah wanted, could He have mentioned all of those things? Yes, He chose not to. And he also chose that the Prophet ﷺ, the best mufassir of all of the mufassirin, the best explainer of the Qur'an ever, could have been who? The Prophet ﷺ. Nobody will explain the Qur'an better than him. He decided not to tell us the names of these towns, the names of these people, the villages, the dates, the chronologies, nothing. You know what that means? But that's not the point. That's just not the point. Not in the Qur'an. But you know what happens to us? When we start studying this stuff, we like all the information, we like all the details. We especially like the details that Allah did not mention. And we love those details so much, we stop paying attention to what Allah did mention. It's a tragedy in the study of the Qur'an. So when I studied, for, the, for example, this passage, give them an example. وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا Strike an example for them. Ashab al qarya The people of the town, the town. The question arises what? Which town? Is this New Jersey? Where is this? Is this Sialkot? Where is this town? And so in our history you find many, many, many scholars and opinions about this was a town called Antakya, this was a town over here, this was a town over there, this is over here. If that was important, who would have mentioned it? Allah. If this was important, he would have at least said, go find out which one it was. He didn't. That is all a distraction. That isn't the point. We have to make the Qur'an supreme. What it makes important, we make important. What it dismisses, we dismiss. That's how we submit to the Qur'an. That's how we submit to the word of Allah. Our thought process needs to submit to the word of Allah. There are things that are insignificant and they should remain as such. They can be interesting academic exercises, but they don't change the priority. And the Qur'an came to give us the right kinds of priority. It's not just a book where you just want to collect information. Information isn't the point. It's thinking the right way. Getting guidance. Processing the things, things, things in the correct fashion. So now let's begin. So Allah says, give them an example. When an example is given, it is to, so you can benefit. So you can understand better. I'd like to remind you that in the previous passage, there are three audiences. There are three audiences. There is the Prophet himself. So the example is going to benefit him in some way. Keep this in mind. Another audience is the disbelievers. So this, uh, this example will comment on them in some way. But there's also a third audience in the first passage. Who's that? The one lone unknown who? Believer. Somewhere out there. We don't even know. He just fears Allah in the unseen. Ar Rahman in the unseen. That one. That believer will find inspiration in this passage somewhere. So those three audiences are going to learn lessons, each of them, for themselves, in this history. Now we begin. وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَرِيَةِ The town. Give them example of the town. How did Allah describe Quraysh? Did He describe them as the nation? He described them as a nation. 
And everybody knows who they are, and still Allah made them unknown, like you are insignificant, a nation. And nobody knows what this town is, but instead of saying a town, he called it the town, because this example is more significant than you people. See what Allah made important and what Allah made unimportant? Just by using al qarya If جَاءَهَا mursalun, When those who were sent came to it. Now I want you to think about my language. It's, it's going to be hard to explain, but I'll try to make it easy. Give the example of the people of the town when messengers came to it. People of the town when messengers came to it. What is it? The town. I was expecting Allah to say, give the example of the people of the town when messengers came to them. Yes? But instead of coming to them, Allah says they came to it. What's the difference? Does it make a difference? Absolutely it does. If you came to them, then all the only concern you have is them. If you came to it, that town will be around for generations. They will not be around for generations. But what should be around for generations? The town. Messengers come so they can give guidance to the people in front of them and through them their children and their children and their children and their children. They are concerned with the much larger audience, the longer ramifications of da'wah. So they don't just think about the short term. If they only thought about the short term, it would have said, they came to them. But Allah says, no, they came to it. They want this town to survive. Messengers don't come to destroy towns. Messengers come to sustain towns. These towns were already on the verge of destruction. They had already, people think, when messengers come, Allah destroys towns. That's how our formula works in our head. That is Im immature. Mes nations were already about to be destroyed because of their sins. Messengers came as a last hope. Fix yourself. They didn't come to destroy, they came to fix. And then people start blaming the messengers. Because of you we got destroyed. Actually, you were heading down terminal cancer road all on your own. You were heading down that road all on your own. The messengers were actually an act of mercy, which has already been established in Tanzil al-Azizi al-Rahim. The messenger is supposed to be a mercy. Now, these three audiences, I already told you about how this town is supposed to be uh, significant and there's concern for the next uh, generation. Now look at the word al-Mursalun. Al-Mursalun. إِذْ جَاءَهَا mursalun Just like إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ mursalin. The same word, isn't it? When, that, when I've discussed that second ayah, I told you the Prophet is being told Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he is part of a brotherhood. You remember that? And now the exact same word is being used again to remind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you are part of a brotherhood that have gone, gone down the straight path before. Now why don't you take inspiration from your brothers? So now I told you there are three audiences. And the first of them is who? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And now he's already paying extra attention, and it's more relevant to him now, because this is his people, this is his team, his brotherhood, Al-Mursaloon. إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِ مُثْنَيْنِ When we sent two to them. Wait, Allah sent two messengers? To one town? فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا Then they called both of them a liar. فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثٍ Then we reinforced with a third. Now Allah sent how many messengers to one town? Three. Three messengers, one town. You know, who should be giving the first khutbah? Who should be giving the main speech? You know, who should be the final speaker? There's three of them, you know. So you know, the one who goes first should be less popular than the more, and then you go to the most popular speaker at the end. You know, there should be some kind of hierarchy. No. No. They see each other as reinforcements of each other. They're not in competition with each other. When you call people to Allah, you're not in competition with anybody else. You're only in cooperation with everybody else. Isn't that an important lesson to learn? And messengers are not small personalities. Messengers are big personalities. In one little town, how many big personalities? Three. There's room for three. Which means you're not that big of a personality, I'm not that big of a personality, there's room for more. <laughs> we need to understand something about calling people to Allah. Even messengers need help. Who do, we, who do I think I am or who do you think you are? You have to be able to accept help. 
then understand that there, there was never any jealousy between them. All there was was cooperation. And then, the question arises, what would a third one do that two couldn't do? Two of them tried, didn't work. And a third one, Allah says, I reinforced with a third. Then they all said, we have been sent towards you. We are the ones to, that have been sent especially towards all of you. They joined in one voice. So two became three. The question is, what's the point? The point is support. People, even messengers need support. The two were lonely and Allah wanted to reinforce them and reinforce the mission, empower the mission. That's why he used the word azazna. So even messengers need what? Support. Now in history, messengers were supported by other messengers. The Prophet ﷺ does not have that luxury. Why not? Why can't he be supported by another messenger? Because he's the last one. But then when he hears this, he's thinking, what about my support? But that's already been answered. Because Allah's support, you know the word azazna? Even if you don't know Arabic, azazna. What name of Allah came from the same root? Tanzeel al-Aziz al-Rahim. Allah has already given the Prophet support with his own words. Where messengers had to come to give support, my message comes and gives you support. He has given him Qur'an that is more powerful than any messenger could have been. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So now that's, that's their support, but that was his support. فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Now the, other, the last point about this ayah that I want to make is that, you know, the, the fact that there were three of them, three of them, and nobody listened, is actually not depressing to the Prophet there's only one of me. There were three of them and they still didn't listen. <laughs> actually, it's the other way around. The fact of the matter is, now the Prophet is really able to understand that when people have a wall in front of them, and a wall behind them, and covers on top, doesn't matter how much you give them, they won't listen, even if one town gets three messengers, it don't make a difference. The Prophet is now becoming clear through this lesson that his job for some people is just impossible. They just won't listen. What we call in Urdu, Deet Hadi. Now, قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُنَا The people responded when they, when they told them, we are the ones that have been sent towards you. You are nothing but just flesh and bones like we are. بَشَرٌ Bashar in Arabic comes from Bishr. Bishr means skin. Your skin is just like mine. What makes you special? وَمَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَانُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Ar-Rahman, the incredibly merciful, did not send anything. Not at all. What are you talking about? He sent some message. In antum illa takthibun. You all are nothing but, you're, you're doing nothing but making lies. All you people, all the three of you do is make lies. Please, stop this lying business. In other words, now they're being ridiculed and called liars. You know, in the beginning of the surah, Allah validated the Prophet ﷺ and told him, no doubt you are a messenger, you are from among the messengers. Because people considered him a liar. And now it's spelled out. In the past, you're not alone. You were not the first one to be called a liar. Even three together with the same exact message were called liars altogether. Now let's dig into this ayah. This, you're nothing but a human being like us. What's the point of saying that? The message is supposed to be supernatural coming from the skies. So somebody complains, if the message is so super awesome coming from intergalactic space, then how come the person delivering the message doesn't have intergalactic powers? Why don't you give us a, an angel or somebody with superpowers or something? Because if it's a super message, there should be a superman type character to deliver that message. By the way, this is what they do with uh, Jesus. Make him more than human, right? So the message should be accepted because he's more than human. This is what they did in, with the, the mythology of Superman. He's come from another planet with a message of peace. He gets his power from the sun and he floats like this. All Jesus-y. Right? That's what he does. So, you know, the, the, the play on the word sun, by the way. Like sun, you know, sun. Anyway. So, the idea that the messenger, messenger himself has to be supernatural. You know what the Qur'an's response to that is? If a messenger, if Allah sent an angel, if Allah sent a jinn or something <laughs> to give you a message, you would have said, uh, how are we supposed to follow this? This is relevant for angels. Obviously an angel can do it. How am I supposed to do it? And then Muslims turn this around and make the Prophet 
almost like an angel and say, yeah, but that was the sunnah of the Prophet That was the Prophet. This is just me. I can't do that stuff. Who do you think I am comparing me to the Prophet? I'm not comparing you to the Prophet but he came so he could be followed. Allah chose a human being so he could be followed. Not so he cannot be followed. You see, the praising the Prophet has a place. But if you praise him to the point where you make him beyond human, then you won't be able to follow him anymore. Alayhi salatu wasalam. That's why it has to be said. Now, now the thing is, when they said, you are nothing but a person just like we are, just flesh and bones, skin, just like we are, that's not exactly true, is it? He's not exactly like them, is he? In the beginning of the surah, Allah did explain that he is from the ones that are sent upon a straight path. What makes him different from others? Number one, that he's on a straight path. Number two, that he's not speaking on his own behalf. These are two things that make him different from this entire society. Actually, the Prophet himself was told in Surah Al-Kahf, "Innama ana basharu mithlukum." Qul innama ana basharu basharu mithlukum. Tell them I'm just a person just like you. But there's a difference. You ha ilayya. That revelation has come to. There is a difference. They're not willing to acknowledge that difference. Now I need you to understand also that in the previous ayah, Allah said, "Fa'azzazna bi thalithin." What did, what did Aziz does not remind you of? What name of Allah? Okay, when you remember the word Aziz, which ayah do you remember? Tanzeel al Aziz al Rahim. But how many names of Allah were in that ayah? Two. Al Aziz al Rahim. Look at this next ayah. Wa ma anzal al Rahmanu min shay. Which name came up? Al Rahman, which is related to which name? So Allah is reviewing Tanzeel al Aziz al Rahim in the story. He's, re- he's reinforcing ideas, he's building it over again. So now he's, they, they say, Ar-Rahman did not send anything at all. Why would they say that? Why would they say, Ar-Rahman didn't send? Why did they say, Allah didn't send anything at all? Why did they say, the, the incredibly merciful didn't say, send anything at all? As, as a matter of fact, this is sarcasm. This one you keep calling Ar-Rahman, psh, what did he send? Yeah, this is supposed to be mercy? It's a joke to them. So they're speaking about Ar-Rahman in a joking fashion. You people, you're just, all you're doing is lying, please. Now I hear the last point I want to make in this 14th ayah, I think it's the 14th ayah, the 15th ayah, is something about bosses. I hate bosses. You hate bosses too. You don't have to tell me. I know. Human beings don't like being told what to do. I don't like it when my teacher gives me homework in third grade. I don't like it. I don't like it when the cop tells me to pull over. I don't like it when the government tells me to pay tax. When the county tells me to pay property tax. Too. I don't like it. I don't like it when the doctor tells me to take my medicine on time. I don't like it. I don't like it anywhere. I don't even like it when the lady tells me to put my seatbelt on in the, in the airplane or put my tray table up. You put it up. <laughs> we don't like being told what to do. We don't like it. As human beings say, who are you to tell me? You're just like me. Even in small things, siblings, siblings. Hey, could you give me that? Get it yourself. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> and it starts. What'd you say? And then, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so then, if that's human nature, we cannot accept, we don't like authority. This is not a Muslim, non-Muslim thing. This is just a human thing. We don't like it. You know, guys are playing basketball, some uncle comes, he says, really late. Mm. Oh, I hate that uncle. That's the Adhan uncle. <laughs> If that's our nature, then when a messenger comes, a messenger is not asking you to obey him in small things. A messenger, if you accept him, he's going to dictate everything you do in life, isn't he? He's going to tell you how to sleep, how to wake up, what to say, what not to say, when to pray, when not to pray, what to do, what not to do, how to get married, how to get divorced, what should you do when you, when you live, what should you do when, you, when you're dead, how should you be buried. How should you think about your ancestors? Not only what you say, he should t- he's going to tell you what to think. He's going to tell you what to love. He's going to tell you what to hate. Isn't he? That's a lot of authority. Human beings don't like what? They don't like authority. So they say, you're just a person. 
How can I accept your authority? How are you any better than me? Excuse me? I need my freedom. You're not the boss of me. And that's not a new thing. You know, some, some teenager didn't come up with that one. It's always been there. It's always been there. It's in the Quran, the Quran. People are lying. Please. This entire idea, this notion of a messenger having a higher truth puts a messenger in a different pedestal and human beings don't like other human beings on a pedestal. We can't accept it. This was the reason for his rejection. They respond. And the way they respond is so epic. They said, Rabbuna ya'lamu, our master, in fact, he knows. Inna ilaykum la mursalun That we truly are the ones sent towards you Whether you know it or not Or you accept it or not Who already knows it? Allah does We don't need validation from you We get validation from Allah Is that a review of something we already learned? That he doesn't, a messenger doesn't need validation from people He gets validation from Allah Did that come before? Wal Quran al hakim innaka now that's being reinforced. Even these messengers knew that their validation comes from Allah. This is review, re review for the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And by the way, now they've been rejected already. They've been told you're liars. So this, the next time they respond, this is the second time you find the words inna ilaykum mursalun. But this time you find, is that a child screaming? And now he stopped. Oh, it's a baby. Babies are cute. Okay. Inna ilaykum, <laughs> most babies are cute. <laughs> Hope that is a cute baby. I know it's mean, it's mean. But I have six kids. I can say it. Some kids come out looking 90 years old. They do. <laughs> the, you're supposed to say, mashallah, not to be rude. That kid just got offended. <laughs> <laughs> Other kids like really come out cute. I got a last one. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I told my wife, uh, what happened here? <laughs> then, then, then the kid got cute later. I was like, okay, you're okay now. You're okay. Because they, 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 you know, it's like a prune. That, it's like, you know how grapes turn into prunes? But it's actually the other way. The prune turns into a grape. It's the other way. I could talk like that. It's completely fine. Um, and you're free to be offended. That's okay, too, because I don't live here. Okay, so... So... <laughs> What I was saying was, they don't just say we are messengers to you, they say we truly are messengers to you. La mursalun. You notice a lam is there that wasn't there before. And that's because now they're refuting them. And they're engaged in debate. Things are getting heated. And the heat of the argument is being captured in the lam. Inna ilaykum la mursalun. Wa ma alayna illa al balahul mubeen. There's our only responsibility. There's no responsibility on us at all except clear communication. The messengers are saying, no responsibility falls on our shoulders except clear communication. Now what does that mean? That means they're on a, they have one task and one task alone is to communicate, to stay on the straight path and say what even some might find offensive, but say it anyway, even if it gets them in more trouble and more trouble and more trouble, they have to stick to it because that is their job. And they cannot waver from those words, they have to say them clearly and openly. They cannot fluctuate. Has that been something already taught in the surah? Ala siratim mustaqim. You see how the Quran is tight? How it reviews its concepts? How it reinforces? Allah said in the beginning, the Quran is well knit. It's one of the things I want to show you here, is how these ideas, they keep reinforcing themselves and building on top of each other. So now, the, the second is that, you know, la alaykum hisabana, wa hisabuna. You don't, you're not in charge of us. We can't stop. We have an obligation on us. We have a duty upon ourselves to deliver clearly, to communicate clearly. Where did that duty come from? It came from the fact that they are mursaleen. They have been sent with a mission, which was something taught previously as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching these videos. Now, finally, those two words, balagh and mubin, very powerful words. I need you to understand both of them in a little bit more depth. Balagha in Arabic means to reach, to reach. The, the, the science of effective communication in Arabic is called Balagha, effective communication, okay? And the idea behind Balagha is when somebody says words, words are like, like a, a recent book on rhetoric said, words like loaded pistols. Words are like a weapon. 
Words are like a weapon. And the target for this weapon is your heart. Your emotions, your feelings, your opinions that rest in your heart. That is the target of someone's words. So if they use the kinds of words that can penetrate the security of your chest, the rib cage that's there, get through your ears, penetrate through the chest, and make it all the way deep inside your heart, and affect that heart, then that is balagh. Balagh is not just, communi communication doesn't even begin to cover it. We're talking about heart penetrating, transformative communication. We're talking about we are going to speak in a way that is the most effective possibly. Now, even though we're going to speak the most effective words, where does change itself come from? Where does, then that is balagh. Change come, does it come from our words? The change comes from Allah. Was that something already taught? In nahnu nuhyi al-mawta. We give life to the dead. He's the one who resuscitates the hearts. Then why is he telling people to speak effective language? If Allah is going to do it, I don't have to do much. That's not how it works. The rule of Allah in this life for everything, including da'wah, including inviting people to Allah, is you have to be the very, very best and the most effective you possibly can be. And then Allah will say, kun fayakun. Allah doesn't give his kun fayakun away for free. You have to give your best and then he gives you results. You don't give your best, he refuses to give you results. In other words, the results don't come because I'm the best or because I'm trying to be the best. The results come from Allah because if he feels I deserve them as a result of my effort. So they have to make balagh happen. They have to make clear, effective communication happen. For the Prophet ﷺ, this is relief because he actually doesn't have to come up with any words. All the words that he needs to get that across is what? Quran. Balagh, fahal yuhlaku illa al qawm al fasiqoon. It itself is balagh. But it's not just balagh. They say, wa ma alayna illa al balagh al mubeen. The word mubeen or abana, the verb abana, means to separate. We're going to communicate to you in a way that doesn't just appeal to your emotions and affects you. We're going to communicate to you in a way that separates truth from falsehood. That the ideas you have that you need to understand are no good are now clearly understood as no good. In other words, somebody could give a speech that moves people's hearts. I listen to a lot of Christian talk radio. I've actually even been to a Joe Olstein program. I slept a little bit. I just wanted to see what these people do. What do they do? How are they packing an entire stadium every weekend? I need to know. You know? And you know what? Everybody on, mm hmm, mm hmm. Yes, yes. You know? What is he doing? He's moving people's what? Hearts. There's balagh there. But you know what isn't there? Mubin isn't there. Clear, clear, clarity is not there. They're not clarifying anything. They say the silliest things. And they get away with it. I've heard preachers talk about, one time, one morning, I was having chocolate milk. And I was stirring the milk and the chocolate. I was stirring it up. And I started thinking, you got to stir your life up. Everybody's got to just stir it up. <laughs> stir up your life. Bring Jesus back in your life. Stir it all up. And there's people sitting there saying, I'm going to stir. I'm stirring. I'm stirring. <laughs> Lord, I'm stirring. <laughs> well, I can miss a lot. Like, I mean, you can move people. You can stir it up. But, you know, there's no clarity. There's no, you could give an effective speech and not say anything. It could happen. It could happen. You could fire people up. And people go, hallelujah, yeah, amen, takbir. You could do that, but they didn't say anything clear. They didn't clarify any concepts. So there's a combination in Balagh al Balagh al appealing to emotions is in al Balagh. But appealing to your intellect is in al Mubin. And that, both of those have to be there, guys. That's communication. If communication is only academic, Surah Yaseen is a Meccan Surah, it was revealed. Uh, it's a 36 surah in the Quran. It has 83 ayahs. Ibn Kathir. I could give you information. That it might be Mubin. But it has to have Balagh in it too. That's how effective, effective communication works. And that is the legacy of Prophet. If you don't understand that, you know what people do with this, with this ayah? I love it. Hey, by the way, uh, 
Your nails are haram. What? وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ Our only responsibility is to communicate the message. <laughs> what? What Quran are you reading, you monkey? Like, that's not how it works. Anyway. So now they said, we're going to communicate clearly. And these people could not respond with intelligence. They couldn't. So they had to come up with some other unintelligent way to respond. And they said, قَالُوا إِنَّا تَطَيَّرْنَا بِكُمْ We consider you people a curse. We consider all of you a bad omen. You're a bad sign. Bad things have started happening since these false prophets came. You know, the weather's gotten worse or something. لَإِن لَمْ تَنْتَهُوا If you people don't stop, لَنَرْجُمَنَّكُمْ We will start stoning you. Rajam could mean stoning to death. It could also just mean stoning. Every time we see you, that's what we're going to start doing. We'll make a policy out of people since just pelting you wherever you go. Like, we, you know, shaitan, we call him أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ That doesn't mean we stone him to death. But we do cast him off. So, لَنَرْجُمَنَّكُمْ could mean stoning all the way to death, but it could also mean just, every time we see you, now we know what to do. Just grab a rock and hit him so he goes away. لَنَرْجُمَنَّكُمْ We can't even face listening to you anymore. That's how much of a curse you've become to our society. وَلَا يَمَسَّنَّكُمْ مِنَّا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And, if that's not enough, then you will see a, a really, truly torturous punishment is going to touch you. And it's going to come from us. You are a curse and we better alleviate this curse. Our society needs to be cleansed from this filthy message you call Islam. This poison, this cancer needs to be removed from our society. You know, by the way, in this ayah, it's not just a conversation anymore. It started with, we think you guys are cursed, or you guys are a curse. But then it went on, and it made it into, well, this curse is like a disease, and we don't want our society to get diseased. So we're going to keep you away, like a diseased person who's got an infectious disease is kept away. So we're going to stone you to keep you away. And if that doesn't work, we're going to have to torture you. That's what's happening here. Now they're starting to get threatened. So I want you to understand something. Who is listening to these ayat? This is not just a story. There were three audiences, remember? The Prophet himself, the believer, the lone believers, and the disbelievers. The Prophet is being told, this is what happens after لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ When the truth becomes absolutely clear, and they still don't believe, then there's no point in reasoning with them. And if you don't back off from your claims, they don't have any arguments against you anymore, because they already know it's true. So they're going to come up with fictitious things, like you're cursed. And if that doesn't work, they're going to start threatening you. And it might even come to the point where they try to what? Kill you. The Prophet is being mentally prepared. The companions are being mentally prepared that things are about to get a lot worse. And that's not the first time it's happened before. Everything goes back to the Prophet ﷺ's legacy. It keeps tying itself to him, because that's where the surah began. Now, another meaning of إِنَّا تَطَيَّرْنَا بِكُمْ لَمْ نَرَى عَلَىٰ وُجُوهِكُمْ خَيْرًا فِي عَيْشِنَا One of the companions commented that one of the meanings of this was we never see anything good come from you for our society. What good is your message for our society? Show me where the benefits are. There are people who argue, yeah, I'd like to think about Islam, but how is it going to help the economy? How is it going to help jobs? How is it going to help healthcare? Show me some benefits of this Islam so I can follow it. Islam can have benefits, but that's not why it came. Islam came to give you the message of truth. Messengers don't come to serve your economy or to serve your health care. Messengers came to give you purpose in your life. And when you follow that purpose, does that give you benefits? Yes. But when you start making Islam about the benefits, then you forgot what Islam itself is. You've forgotten what it is. You know, some people, all they talk about is, you know, Islam has a really good dietary plan. You know, if you fast on Mondays and Thursdays, that's actually really good for your brain. And it has several you know, significant benefits, and there's been scientific studies about weight loss, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. I'm ready to become Muslim, sign me up. Because I've been trying to lose weight for so long. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. That's not how messengers, that's not what they came with. And so, تَطَيَّرْ نَابِكُمْ means, what worldly benefit do we see? All you people talk about is we're doing something wrong. We can't cheat our customers anymore. We can't do all kinds of shameless things anymore. You're stopping us from everything. And so we're ready to kill you. And if they are, if they are ready to kill him, that's the most important part of this ayah. 
if they are ready to kill him, you know what that, what that admits? It actually admits that they have no arguments left. When you resort to violence, it actually means you have no intel intelligent answer left. This is even true of seven or six year olds. Two plus two is four. No, it's five, the big fat kid says. No, it's four. It's five. I said it's five. No, and the, the skinny dizzy kid says, no, it's pretty sure it's four. <laughs> it's five. Yes, it's five. It's five. <laughs> when you can't reason, then you use force. Actually, that means that you don't have reasons left. That means you were wrong. The use of violence is the use of defeat, is, is the acceptance of defeat. You know why that's important to understand, right? When Islam is insulted, which happens a lot nowadays, and some people decide to respond with violence in the name of Islam, you know what they're doing. They're actually making it sound like Islam doesn't have an intelligent response. The same criticism Allah made of disbelievers can now be made of believers. It's scary. How low we've gotten in our intelligence that we think that's an, that's an appropriate response. How far from the original teachings of this deen that is. It's incredible. The prophets are so intelligent, they said your curse is with you. The curse you just made up is with you. Now what does that mean? This is not, by the way, ta'irukum bikum. If it was ta'irukum bikum, it would have been completely different meaning. It would have been, you're the ones that are cursed. You think we're cursed? We think you're cursed. And some people translate it like that. Your curse is yours. May you be cursed. Wa alaykum al curse. No, that is not what this means. If it meant that, it would have been ta'irukum bikum, not ma'akum. Ma'akum changes the meaning entirely. The first meaning of ta'irukum ma'akum is be honest. You know the real reasons you have this curse story with you. You know the real reasons are you don't want to accept the truth. You know the real reasons are you don't like to make changes in your life. You'd like to get away, continue to get away with your injustices. You know what you really have with you. Come on. The second is get real. Your curse that is only with you, meaning only in your minds. This is only a figment of your imagination. This doesn't make any sense. We're giving you a message that appeals to your emotions and appeals to your reason. Balaghun mubin. You come back with something that is just trying to scare people, just appeal to their emotions, has no reasonable or rational basis. Tatayyarna bikum. We think you guys are cursed. You have an inferior response. And this is an overreactionary response. Respond to reason with reason. You're responding to reason with superstition, you people are cursed. Then on top of that, you're responding to it with threats, we're gonna stone you. And you're ready to even kill. This is you're so overreactionary, and that's why the word Balantum Qawmum Musrifoon, rather you are a nation that overreacts, goes overboard. That's Musrifoon. You're excessive. Now I need you to hear understand the meaning of excessiveness. Excessive responses. It's not just about violence, it's about three things. It started with superstition and then threats and then violence. So I want to talk to you specifically about superstitions and excessiveness. There's the, the Allah gifted every human being with a brain. Alhamdulillah, we have a, we have a beautiful thing called a mind that we're supposed to use. The Quran keeps telling us to use it. Afala ta'qilun. And Allah told us the proper way of thinking too. Use your intellect, think about the world around you, think about history and think about revelation. Use your mind, yes? But for some people, that's not enough. They want to see something extra. They love to believe in superstitious stuff. And these are the, this is the mindset of a Musrif. The things Allah told you to think about are not enough for you, you want something more. And this disease nowadays has even hit the Muslim. We have to believe in, we have to come up with like 80 jinn stories. We have to. We have to believe in uh, the, the blessings of, you know, these words. If you recite them this many times, then your motorcycle does not need an oil change or something. <laughs> we have to come up with this excessive stuff, because what Allah gave us, clearly, is not enough. You need something more. You need something more. Oh, somebody's done magic on my cousin, and that's why she's not getting through med school, and now we have to undo that magic, so I'm going to Hogwarts. <laughs> and so, we're going like, <laughs> This excessiveness in thought 
it keeps you, it doesn't let you restrain your mind. So even when you hear reasonable things, because your mind is so full of this garbage, this, this mythical, nonsensical garbage in the name of Islam, that you can't become, a, you can't even be capable of clear thought anymore. This is Bal Antum Qawmum Musrifoon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching these videos. If you'd like to continue to support Quran Weekly, please click the link in this video. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum everyone. So we're at ayah number 20. So far we are in the middle of section 2 where we're learning the lesson from history. Uh, three messengers have come to the same nation and there's a debate that's gone on and clearly this, these people are stubborn and they're not going to budge from their position. And they're going to come up with the silliest excuses that have no truth to them to be able to defend their position like calling them cursed. This is actually a practical case of the fetter or the, the collar on the neck and the wall in front and behind and the, you know, the, the covering on top. Allah is telling basically the Prophet you're not the first person to deal with a tough group. These kinds of groups have existed in history. But now Allah says, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى From the far end of a city, a man comes running. قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ He said, my, my people, follow the ones that have been sent. How many messengers are there? Three. And now there's another man who's coming from the far end of the city. I want you to observe a few things about this, this statement. The first thing I want you to observe is that he's one single man. Just one man. Three messengers are preaching, and how many sales did they make? One man. Is this an idea that was already taught? You're gonna try to preach to a large group, but maybe one you'll get? Did it? إِنَّمَا تُنذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ وَخَشِيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ فَبَشِّرْ Who? بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ You're only gonna be able to warn and he's just someone who followed the reminder and feared the Ar-Rahman, feared the incredibly merciful, the loving and the unseen. Congratulate that single person of forgiveness and noble reward. The Prophet ﷺ was told, most of them will not follow. Remember that? Now even in this study, what are we learning? Three messengers came, preaching to an entire nation. And how many followers did they get? One. One. That's the first thing to learn here, to note here. That this is reinforcing the idea that you should not be looking for numbers. Allah's help does not come through numbers. Allah's help is even in one person. That's the first observation. The second observation, min aqsal madina, from the farthest end of the city, he came. But wait a second, the Arabic word for town is al qarya. Wadrib lahum mathalan ashab al لم يقل وضرب لهم مثلا أصحاب المدينة. He didn't say Medina. He said قرية. This was the, these were the people of the town. But now there's another city. To another word. If it was the same word, then it would have been the same town. He uses the word al-Madina and the other end of al-Madina. In other words, these three messengers, these men are delivering the message, conveying to preaching to people night and day in the same town over and over and somebody overhears the message and somebody else overhears the message until the word reaches in even another city possibly and in that city on the far outskirts of that city somebody heard it and decided that this is the right thing and from there he came traveling all the way he was so moved by this message one of the great scholars I admire from the last century, actually he passed away in, in the 70s, uh, Ibn Ashur, rahimahullah. Commenting on this ayah, he said that actually it's been the case in human history that people that live in busy cities, they go away from religion. And people that live on the outskirts, they actually have more time to reflect and to think and to engage in nature. And so they are more thoughtful people and so they are more spiritual people. And people in the middles of cities, they're too busy, hustle and bustle all the time, business, rent, more expensive life, etc, etc. So they tend to have less spiritual lives. And so, you will find, even in this ayah, Allah highlights this guy who hasn't even seen the prophets. He's from the other end of the city. And he was ready to accept. And the people that they're preaching to, are not ready to accept. It's also important to note, that even though, the, so it seems to be that the toughest audience is going to be what? Which one? City. city. Let me tell you something from personal experience. You try to talk about Islam in Midtown, in New York City. Try talking about Islam on Silicon Valley. 
Try talking about it. And then try talking about Islam in like Waco, Texas, at a church. You'll find a captive audience. They might kill you afterwards, but they'll, they'll listen. <laughs> they will listen. There are actually several churches across the South that invite Muslim speakers regularly to speak just about Jesus, just about God from the Islamic perspective. They're not all haters. You don't find that sort of invitation in big cities. You just don't. That's, just, that's even a reality within the United States. Even within the United States. By the way, some of the worst social evils that are plaguing our society, some of the worst of them, that are, where do you find them? In the cities. In the cities. And it's incredible that Allah, instead of sending messengers to a place where they would find easy customers, People that are already spiritual, thoughtful, in touch with nature, etc., etc. Go send them there. No, Allah would always send messengers to city centers. Allah sends Musa السلام, to the greatest city center of his time. You know? Of all the region of Arabia, the city center was Mecca. The worst social evils were in Mecca. Medina is actually much nicer people. Even today. It's crazy. It's crazy. You want to see nice people? Don't go to Mecca. You know, even the cabbies are like mean. <laughs> even the cabbies. But then again, this man comes far, running from the far end of the city. I've, we've talked about how it's from the far end, meaning it's so unlikely. You know what we're learning? Don't underestimate when you share a good word. They didn't have Facebook back then. They didn't have cell phone. They didn't have a website. They didn't have news broadcasts or radio or television. They're just talking to their people. But word got out and got out and got out. And one man from the other end figured that this is the right message. And his coming to Islam is so significant that there are going to be more ayat about him in the Qur'an than the three messengers combined. Allah will talk more about him than he does about three messengers. <laughs> it's not insignificant. If it was, it wouldn't be such a big deal in the Qur'an, where every ayah is perfectly placed. That's pretty powerful. That's really powerful. Even one person transforming, you don't know who it's going to be. That's the message that was given to the Prophet ﷺ in the beginning of the surah and is now being reinforced. Then there's this statement I found, كَمْ مِنْ مَغْمُورٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَشْهُورٌ فِي السَّمَاءِ How many people must there be that are completely unknown in the world? And how famous they are in the sky. There are people, nobody knows them. Ain't nobody know them. And they are just known in the sky. SubhanAllah. You know? This person, who is a celebrity to us? Rajul. His name is Rajul. A man. Where is this man from? He's so awesome. He's in Surah Yasin. Uh, from the far end of the city. Which city? The city. Do we know his name? Nope. Do we know his address? Do we know what age he lived in? Yet, without knowing any of those things, his memory is immortalized in the Quran until the Day of Judgment. He is being, a man whose name we don't even know is being celebrated. You know, and by the way, what are his credentials? Where did he graduate from? How much money did he make? Where did he get his ijazah from? You know, which ulama did he study under? Nothing. Nothing. Some guy who just happened to hear that there's one God and he has messengers and it all made sense to him and now he's a hero in Islam. You know what, what I'm trying to tell you? What I'm trying to tell you is we're too obsessed with credentials and not nearly as obsessed with sincerity. And the Qur'an is preaching the opposite. The Qur'an is telling you no one's insignificant. What does Allah say about this man though? He says a man came from the far end of the city, yasa, running. He came running. When does a person run? When there's urgency. Now the question arises, what is his urgency? His urgency is, he comes running, and by the way, is he near or far? Far. So he comes running all this way, just to say one thing first, Ya qawmit tabi'ul mursaleen. My people, follow those who have been sent. Just follow those who have been sent. Him seeing the heedlessness and the rampant evil of his society was a state of emergency to him. So much so that he ran. But by the way, that evil, has that been around for a long time? Have people been doing the same bad things for a long time in his society? Yes. But once he came to Islam, he saw this as a state of emergency. So he ran. 
He didn't get used to evil. He didn't get used to de defiance and say, well, that's what people do, you know. Oh, by the way, they have three messengers, <laughs> they don't need me. I mean, what am I going to say that messengers haven't already said? Who am I compared to the messengers? He went anyway. I'd like to tell you something ahead of time. I'll come back to it. Comparing a believer to the messenger is like comparing the sun to the moon. What's significantly brighter? The sun. And the sun is actually something that gives the moon its light. A believer's faith is only, it only shines because of their inspiration by who? A messenger. And the moon, the sun doesn't have phases. The sun is a constant. But the moon has what? Phases. Like messengers are constant. But believers have phases. Yes? So there's really no comparison. But you know what? The sun has its place and the moon has its place. Even if messengers are doing their job, that doesn't mean you're off the hook for your job. He came running from the far end of the city because he saw it, his obligation. These are his people, he cares about them. So the first thing he said is, my people. He said my people. You don't, he didn't say, Ya ayyuhal kuffar, ittabi'ul mursaleen. You kuffar, follow the messengers. You kafir non-Muslims. He didn't say that, he said my people. The Quran is telling you that when people make fun of messengers, did they make fun of messengers? Yes. They did. They considered them a curse, they threatened messengers. At this point we should call them kuffar. Any believer should be, have so much love for the messengers that they should go to them and say, you kuffar? You make fun of messengers? You should be killed. But he goes and the first words that come out of his mouth are what? My people. Because he understands that is the sunnah of prophets. Alayhi salatu wasalam. People oppose them and they don't lose love for their people. How many people when they give da'wah, they think of the person they're talking to as my people? They don't. That's a sunnah of the Qur'an that is lost. This entire story is being told to three groups. The Prophet, the believer, and the kuffar. And the believers nowadays don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. We like to label, label everybody, sawa'un alayhim. Leave them alone. How far from Qur'an we've come even in the way we think about non-Muslims. Our attitudes towards them. You come running out of concern for them. Now, the other matter that I want to bring to your attention is he came running. Could have had a horse. Get at least, you know, a rental. Seems as though when he transferred all the way from that end of the city to come here to speak to his people, he had zero resources, yes? So this incredible da'i, who did so much work that Allah decided to immortalize his speech in the Qur'an, had how many resources? Zero. All he had was his legs. He ran over. Stop complaining about the lack of resources. That is not what gives victory. Resources are not the means to change the world. That's not what Allah cares about. Allah wants to see your effort. How much sa'i did you make? وَأَن لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى That was my khutbah yesterday. The human being has nothing for himself except whatever efforts he made. That's all you get. So رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى Now, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ I love this part. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Follow the messengers. All he has to say is follow the ones that have been sent. Man, that is a lesson we gotta relearn in this ummah. Just follow the messengers. It's simple. This religion is so beautiful. Allah gave us the legacy of the prophets alayhimu salatu wasalam in the Qur'an. That legacy is supposed to inspire Rasulullah sallallahu himself. The messenger gets inspired when he hears about Musa. He gets inspired when he hears about Yusuf. So we're supposed to get inspired by them. Getting inspired by these prophets is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam. I'll tell you a little story. I don't mean to insult anyone. I just want to be, I have to speak to my conscience. Okay, and something, some experiences in my life I feel like I should share because they can, they can help you. I gave a talk in Kuwait. I finished my talk, big security thing, you can't talk to people, they don't let you talk to people. So I snuck around the other side of the masjid and talked to people on the street. Right, and this lady came up to me and said, Ahi, you need to tell people, he, she had a book, you need to tell people that they have to learn the correct aqidah. And this is the book of the correct aqidah. And you need to teach this book so people have the right uluhiya and rububiya and asmaul sifat because people do a lot of shirk because they don't have the right what? Aqidah. 
I was like, thank you. What book is this? Is this Quran? This is Surah? No, no, no. This is a book of this, this, this chapters and these, these, these deviations that people have and you know what people consider you know, shirk and this and that and the other and it protects people from making these kinds of mistakes. I was like, well, this is really complicated. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to study Islam. I'm scared right now. I feel like I might be a mushrik. She's like, Akhi, this is really important. You don't know this stuff? I was like, no, I don't know it. Don't you want to know it? I said, no, I don't want to know it either. But don't you want to have the perfect, the right aqidah? I was like, yeah, I do. Uh, but, so maybe I should find out where Allah talks about aqidah in the Quran. Let me find the ayah of aqidah. Uh, there isn't one. Because the word aqidah doesn't exist in the Quran. That word was that important, it would be where? So I, I have this really deviant idea, I'll tell you. It's a really crazy idea. I think the things Allah talks about are more important. I know that sounds blasphemous. And then I also think something else. I think prophets were the best teachers. I don't know if that's, that sounds crazy. I know, it's really messed up. I think nobody taught Iman, not Aqidah, because Aqidah is not used in the Quran. What's used in the Quran? Nobody taught Iman better than Ibrahim alayhi salam, and Musa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam. Uh, I think they were pretty, I think they're better than any scholar at teaching Iman. And I think before people learn something from a scholar, they should learn something from who? Prophets. My nation follow the? Prophets, the ones who've been sent. And I, when I study Ibrahim alayhi salam, he just says the sun can't be God, the moon can't be God, the star can't be God, I turn my face towards the one who made everything. That doesn't seem so complicated. What you told me about these categories and these subheadings, and that was really hard. But when the prophets talk in their greatest, and I also think there is no better book than the Qur'an. Like if people should know a book, if there was one book they should know, it should be the Qur'an. I know that sounds crazy. But I think it has a supreme author. And in that book, when he decides to teach you about faith, he doesn't get philosophical, he doesn't get abstract, he doesn't discuss deviant concepts, he doesn't discuss... He's not interested in any of it. He just says, straightforward, something that a poet can understand, something a philosopher can understand, something a farmer can understand, something a, you know, a programmer can understand, something me, I can understand, it's easy. Something any human being can understand. Why do we have to complicate this terminology? Why do we have to complicate this conversation? When Allah's messengers, all of them, one of their great sunan, one of their great legacies is Al-Balaghul Mubin. They, they communicate in a way that gets to your heart and they just separate truth from falsehood. That's all they do. It's simple. It's not complicated. You know what we've done, right? We've turned the conversation about Islam into conversations about books written by people about Islam. Those books have become Islam. And the only book that doesn't get its attention anymore is what? It's Quran. That's kind of a tragedy. I'm not saying those books aren't important. But there's a difference between primary and secondary, you understand? And not, then we've, done, we've done a real, the shaitan's done this one. He's so good at this. I'm impressed, shaitan. You know what he's done? Those books you should read. Allah's book is for the scholars. Read the books of the scholars, but don't read the book of Allah because that is for the scholars. Because when it says hudal lil nas, what it really means is hudal lil ulama. Because it's complicated. Quran is very complicated. You can't understand. Yar, ayyuhal insan, Allah de bande. Quran is complicated. Quran is complicated. Jinns hear Qur'an and become Muslim. But passing by, they hear Qur'an and they become Muslim. And then they speak because they were so inspired. And Allah puts that in the Qur'an. And to you, Qur'an is complicated. Where did they get their degree before they speak about Qur'an? Where did they graduate from, these jinn? They can comment on the Qur'an, astaghfirullah What kind of shaitan? <laughs> He's a jinn, not a shaitan. You know? And then we're reading their speeches. We love distancing people from the word of Allah. Yes, I acknowledge. There's the possibility of you misinterpreting or coming to the wrong conclusion. But the journey of learning, so long as it's sincere, and you go to people who know better than you, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask people who do more remembrance than you do, who try to memorize, who try to study, if you yourself don't know, that is the journey of every human being. 
Why block access for people? There's no reason to do that. This messenger, this man should have said, there are prophets speaking, I should keep my mouth shut. The, the biggest ulama of this ummah are prophets. There, there's three of them. What is my role to speak? But he understands I have to speak because messengers are being rejected. Maybe they'll listen to me because I'm not a messenger. Maybe I, if I don't come from the official position, maybe I'll come from a different angle. Maybe Allah will accept that. He's not coming as competition to messengers. So the other thing that I love about this ayah, Allah says, He said, follow the messengers. Or follow those that have been sent. Follow. Has the word follow occurred before in the surah? Think, think, think. You can only warn someone who followed the reminder. إِنَّمَا تُنذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ فَالْآنْ يَقُولْ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ Same word. It's not an accident. Allah said somewhere out there, there might be a believer, he might become Muslim, he has Iman in his heart, some changes happening inside him, you don't even know what changes are happening slowly inside him. You keep on warning, don't give up, maybe one day he'll come out and become a believer, yes? Just like this guy, you think he became a believer overnight or he thought about it over time? He must have thought about it, processed it, came to this conclusion and then came out, right? But look at what's happening. In the first case, you had a believer who's becoming a believer all in secret. But in the second time following is mentioned, he's not secret anymore. He's so brave. He ran across towns to come and talk to the people and openly say, you need to follow the messengers. He actually became a significant contributor, didn't he? So in the previous passage, you had the one who follows changing internally. And now you have someone who's changed internally and now wants to contribute. So there's the internal and there's the external. And they both have to go together. One leads to the other. So now, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ittabi'u man la yas'alukum ajran wa hum muhtadun. Hold on a second. Okay. Follow the ones who don't ask you for any compensation. That's the easy translation. Follow someone who doesn't ask you for any compensation. And they're committed to guidance. This is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the Qur'an by Muslims. The Qur'an says they don't ask for any compensation, brother. Why do you have a fee for your program? No, no, it's a non, it's a non question. And the Qur'an says, They sell the ayat of Allah for a small price. You should be ashamed of yourself. Selling the ayat of Allah. One of the most misunderstood concepts in the entire Qur'an. Let me explain. The Prophet ﷺ sent Mus'ab ibn Umair to Medina. You guys know this? Mus'ab ibn Umair, one of the most brilliant young men, sent to Medina to teach Qur'an. He used to come from a very rich family, but his family disowned him. He didn't even have clothes to wear. Actually, when he was killed at Badr, they didn't, they, when they tried to cover his legs, his top would show. When they tried to cover his top, his legs would show. That's how much he didn't have. The Prophet ﷺ sends him to Medina to teach what? Quran. Where is he? What's he gonna have for breakfast? Surah Al-Baqarah? What's he gonna have for lunch? What's he gonna have for dinner? The Prophet ﷺ gave him a salary so he could do his job. He was paid to teach Quran. What does it mean they sell the ayat of Allah? You know what that means? That means the ayat means something, but people don't want to hear it. So you change the meaning, and you tell people what they want to hear, so that they don't get angry at you. You give people answers they can feel good about, and you avoid talking about things they don't feel good about, that way they can continue to like you, and you'll stay popular. This is selling the ayat for a small price. That small price being the, the pleasure of people, the contentment of people, you understand? Here, follow the one who does not ask you for any compensation. Follow someone who doesn't ask you for any compensation. Let's understand this. This is a principle about all prophets. Every prophet came to a nation where there was a serious problem. And you know when a nation has a serious problem, it's like a, you know, nations are supposed to be balanced. But when they do a crime, then they start getting imbalanced. And the imbalance gets worse and worse and worse. And it comes to a point where the entire nation might crumble. 
And the job of the messengers is to pull them away from that imbalance and bring them back to straightness again. You understand? But when an imbalance becomes popular, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing the evil. Everybody's doing the wrong thing. And it's not being celebrated. It's become the fashion to do. Is it easy to talk about? No. Like for example, nowadays it's very difficult to talk about homosexuality. For instance. Yes? Did Lut alayhi salam, did he live in a time where it was popular? He did. Did he have to talk about it? Yep. Did he get a lot of heat for it? Oh yeah. There's a reason it's in the Quran. If you talk about the subject, people are going to come after you. Is that really? Yeah, Lut alayhi salam. It's there for a reason. When you take on a subject, the entire society is obsessed with something, they're glorifying something, and you speak against it, they will come after you. Now, if you want to continue to make money, or you want to continue to live in that society, and you want to continue to be safe, then you will avoid which subjects? The ones they're obsessed with. You'll just decide to talk about something else. Maybe Lut alayhi salam just, should just talk about kindness to parents. Maybe you should just talk about take care of your neighbor. Maybe you should just talk about prayer. He should leave this subject alone because it's too controversial. Isn't it? If he does that, does he get in trouble? No. There's no trouble. And by the way, he's still going to be talking about good things. Kindness to parents is a good thing. Prayer is a good thing. Charity is a good thing. So why does he have to take the subject that will get him in trouble? That is the job of messengers. They came to take on the subjects that nobody else would dare take and they would give the verdict from Allah wal Quranil Hakim. They would give the verdict from Allah and give it over and over and over and over again, offending that society and offending it again and offending it again. But they did not care to care because that's the evil that has to be spoken out against. And clearly, when someone does that, they are not interested in making any compensation because that's the easiest way to lose your compensation. Malayas alukum ajran. Follow the ones who don't have an agenda. Clearly. Because this is not the way to get popular. This is the way to get destroyed. وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ And they themselves, are per, they themselves in their personal lives are guided. Now l l understand this. Committed to guidance actually. Public speakers, pro prophets are public speakers. But who else is a public speaker? Can you think of other public speakers in society? Not, not in the Muslim scene. Politicians? Politicians are public speakers, yes? Okay, so prophets want to tell you about policies, change in society, yes? Do politicians also sometimes tell you about change in society? Yes. Yeah. Sure. But when politicians tell you about change in society, we want to make the country better, we want to make the nation better, we want to make it stronger, etc, etc, etc. And then you look in their personal life, what do you find? You find corruption. So their talk is very high, but their character is very low. And by the way, you do find that what they're, the reason they're talking about high things is because they want the presidency. They want the governorship. They want some compensation. They're after something. When the prophets speak, what do they want? They just want justice. They just want the truth. They want no compensation from you. And on top of that, if you look in their personal life, you will find they've always been committed to guidance. وَهُمْ <laughs> So the message is perfect. And the messenger is clean. Was this idea taught before? Yes. Yeah. Another review. That's what the Quran does. It's so tightly woven. Now, in the next ayah, Wamali. What would have to be wrong with me? The, this man is still speaking. That Rajul, that hero of ours, whose name we will learn in Jannah one day by Allah's permission. He says, What would have to be wrong with me? لا أعبد الذي فطرني. I'm not going to worship the one who molded me out of nothing. وإليه ترجعون. And you're all going to be taken back to him anyway. Now the words مالي. What is wrong with me? مالي. In Arabic we say ومالي لا أفعل التي شأنها أن يريدها المتكلم في رد على من أنكر عليه فعلا. Ibn Ashur mentions that when somebody says what would be wrong with me that I should do this or that or the other. That means that somebody told him, hey, what's wrong with you? Why are you leaving your religion? And he turns around and responds to them. So their, their statement hasn't even been recorded, but we know it's already there because of the way he spoke. 
Somebody said to him, Hey, what's wrong with you, man? Why are you talking about this false religion? And he turns around and says, What would have to be wrong with me that I shouldn't worship the one who made me? And you're all going to be taken back to him also. Now understand this, you're all going to be taken back to him also. This sentence began with, What would have to be wrong with who? It started with himself. And by the time the sentence ended, he said, You will all be taken back to him. So who did he begin with? Himself. You know, if you want to be able to relate to people and give them this message, you have to admit things about yourself. You have to be able to tell people that you would have a problem. If I try to give somebody advice about travel, yeah, you shouldn't go from this airline, you should go from that airline. If I start by saying, man, I took that airline, there were so many delays, they lost my bags, do this, and then I say take the other airline. Does that make the advice more appealing? Because you made it about yourself first, and when you've experienced something, then you've sincerely now coming to them for their, good, for their betterment. But if you come to them and say, hey, you're, you're flying that airlines? You're stupid. <laughs> Does that come across as something you want to internalize? It comes across as offensive. He speaks about himself because he doesn't want them to hate him. He doesn't want to give a hate speech. He doesn't want to give a judging speech. He just wants to talk about himself. Look, it would be serious crime, a serious crime on my part if I abandoned the one who made me. And guys, you're all going there too. You're all going back to him too. This isn't just about me. This is a very loving form of speech. Which already began with Ya Qawmi. That's why he came out of love for his people. So he says, وَمَا لِي لَا أَعْبُدُ الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ أَأَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِهِ آلِهَا Should I be taking other gods besides him? إِنْ يُرِدْنِ الرَّحْمَانُ بِضُرٍ If Ar-Rahman, the incredibly merciful, if he intended that any harm should come, لا تغني عني شفاعتهم شيئا. All of those other gods together would not be able to make me free. With all of their pleading and all of their intercession and all of their please go God, let, let this one go, he used to worship me. None of that will help. ولا ينقذون. They're not going to be able to rescue me. If I get in trouble with Allah, all these idols, they're not going to be able to save me. All these mythical gods are not going to be able to save me. Why would I go to anyone else? You know what he's doing here? He's criticizing their religion, isn't he? Because they believe in other gods. But instead of talking about it as, what, would, what is wrong with you? Why don't you believe in these gods? They will not be able to help you. He says, how can I believe in these gods? They're not going to be able to help who? Me. I'm just worried about myself, guys. If Ar-Rahman wants me to be harmed. The question is, first of all, he goes back to I, because now he's going to talk about their idols. You can talk about other people's religion, but as it relates to you. Why it doesn't make sense to you. Not about them, about you. This is what I don't find convincing. This is what doesn't sit well with me. This is what I cannot reconcile for myself. Why do you do that? Because you don't want this to become a contest of egos. The second thing here. Ar-Rahman. If Ar-Rahman wanted to harm, they wouldn't be able to you know, rescue me. Wait, Ar-Rahman, does that mean the one who harms? What does it mean? <laughs> Ar-Rahman means the one who's merciful, the one who cares, the one who shows love. So why is he saying if Ar-Rahman wanted to do harm? The word Ar-Rahman and the word harm don't go together, do they? They don't seem like they go together. You know what he's telling them? You guys made fun of Ar-Rahman before. You said, Ma anzal Ar-Rahman min shay. Ar-Rahman didn't send anything. They already used that name. Let me tell you, just because his name is extremely, incredibly merciful, does not mean that he does not have the power to do harm when time comes to do harm. Does not, you cannot take advantage of his name and think that nothing's gonna happen. Oh gee, Allah is great. <coughs> nothing's gonna happen. Some people wanna negotiate with Allah. I do so much for Allah, so if I don't do a few little things, ever, it's okay, I mean, he should understand. Really, he should understand. He should understand, like he doesn't already understand. You're in this position to talk about Allah like that? Yeah, because he's a Rahman. Okay. Alrighty then. That's why you'll find some of the toughest ayat in the Quran have the word Rahman in them. Just so you become clear, 
That just because he's incredibly merciful does not take away from his justice and does not take away from his authority. And by the way, his, he is a Rahman in this ayah. You know why? Because when a slave of Allah, every human being is a slave of Allah, whether they recognize it or not. When a slave of Allah becomes a source of evil, then he is like a cancer on this earth that spreads evil. And then Allah does a Rahmah to the rest of creation by removing him. That is also a Rahman. Sometimes his mercy is to all the other creation that he can rescue them from you. إِنْ يُرِدْنِ الرَّحْمَانُ بِضُرِّهِ لَا تُغْنِي عَنِّي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا SubhanAllah Now, we're almost done with his speech. إِنِّي ذَلَّ فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ If that were the case, if I did worship anyone other than Allah, if I took other gods, I would be in such obvious confusion. I would be totally confused. He's not confused. He's saying, you people are confused, but he doesn't want to offend them. So he says, I would be so confused if I did that. Inni amantu bi rabbikum. I have come to believe in your Rabb, your master. He doesn't say, I believe in my master. He says, I believe in your master. What does he do? He switches from I to you. By the way, when you go from I to you, I'll give you an equation. I plus you equals we. Does that make sense? I plus you equals what? <coughs> we. So he starts with I, and he goes to you, because he wants this to be about what? Us. We're not separate guys. I want all of us to be happy. I want all of us to be saved in front of Allah. This is not me versus you. This is me and you. Da'wah is not about verses. It's not about debates. It's not about arguments. We've turned it into that. I'm going to do a da'wah program where I'm going to debate the Christian. Something is wrong with you. That is not how it works. There's a place for that, but it's not called da'wah. That's called jidal. There's a other Qur'an word for that. And that's a last resort. We don't do that in the beginning. Ever. Ever. So now here he says, Inni amantu bi rabbikum. You know, I have come to believe in all of your master. The master of all of you. Fasma'oon. Listen to me. Listen to me. Three messengers are talking and he says, listen to me. Just hear what I'm saying, guys. Sometimes, you know, I, I experience this from the position of a teacher. I teach Arabic, or try sometimes. Students are sitting there learning. And then a TA comes in. A teacher's assistant comes in. And pats the, sh the student on the shoulder. Hey, pay attention. I didn't say pay attention. A teacher's assistant came and said, pay attention. Does it have an effect? Yeah. Does it have a different effect? Yes. When a fellow student comes to you and says, hey man, let's study. Teacher says, study for the exam. Yes, of course, we'll study for the exam. Then you're watching a basketball game, 8 o'clock at night, and your friend comes and says, man, come on, let's study. Does it have a different effect? It does. does, does this, this Sahabi understands that. This companion of messengers understands that. He has his place, the prophets have their place. The sun has its place, and the moon has its place. This is not competition. Listen to me. It's such a loving, beautiful speech. And I want to say here that his speech did more than even three prophets. His speech has more weight in these ayat than three messengers. Why is that? That is to teach us Allah gives victory to whoever He wants. Allah will give qubul to whoever He wants. That is not what the worldly results and the worldly consequences is not what is meaningful to Allah. It is effort that is meaningful to Allah. Worldly results are just when Allah decides, He'll open a door. That's it. The next ayah says, Qilad khulil jannah. We're almost there. Qilad khulil jannah. It was said, enter jannah. Wait, He was just talking to His people. Now it says, go into jannah. What just happened? He got killed. He gave such a loving, concerned speech coming from across town to talk to his people and try to make a case with them. And they could not touch the messengers because messengers are protected by Allah Azza wa Jal. But that lone believer got killed. This story also has lessons for the believers, right? Now the, believers, the few believers who follow the Prophet ﷺ are being mentally prepared. You might even get killed for this. Yasir. Sumayya. Bilal almost, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You might get killed just doing this, just talking about Allah. 
And so he gets into Jannah not because he just got transported there, he got killed. And by the way, how did they decide to kill the prophets? Or they planned to kill the prophets? Stone them and torture them to death. You remember this? So he must not have died an easy death. And so he goes, and that's a shaheed, because a shaheed goes straight to Jannah. So he goes straight into Jannah, and here are his words. Ya Allah, get them, because they killed me. Those kuffar. Somebody should take revenge for the believer. Ya Rabb. Qala ya qawm. Qala ya layt. First words. Oh, if only. Qawmi ya'lamun. If my people just know. If only there was some way for my people to know. He still loves them. Can you imagine walking into Jannah? What would you see? Zawata afnan, fabi ayi ala irabikuma tu kathiban. You would see the trees of Jannah and they would mesmerize you. You'd see the waterfalls and you'd be hypnotized. You'd see the fruits and you'd go crazy after one bite. You'd see your beautiful spouse and you would go nuts. And he sees all of this and he doesn't say, Whoa! He just says, Oh my people, if only they know. Subhanallah. He makes it into Jannah and he doesn't forget his people. Do you know on Judgment Day people forget everything? A mother forgets her baby? يَوْمَ تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَتْ The day on which every feeding mother forgot what she was feeding. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ The day on which a man will run away from his brother. You know in Surah Al-Ma'arij, وَفَصِيلَتِهِ الَّتِي تُؤِيهِ His mother, his wife, his children, his parents, his entire extended clan, he'll run away from all of them, he doesn't want anything to do with anybody. You'll forget, وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ Quran says all relationships will be cut off, but for the believer they won't be. For the believer they won't be. He'll even go into Jannah, and he will continue to love who? His people who were disbelievers and enemies of prophets because they're still alive and they still have hope. You don't give up on people who are still alive. And it's as though Allah is telling us almost as though He can still see them. Allah gave him camera view like a GoPro back into dunya. So he can see what's going on. And he's watching from Jannah saying, if only they know. He doesn't say if only they knew. Alimu. He says, ya ya'lamun. If only they know. So he's still watching what's happening. Allah gave him view. Subhanallah. And then you realize what sincerity means. Muslims, we've developed such a bogus concept of sincerity. I, I, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. What we've done to the word sincerity. You have to have ikhlas in everything you do. Check your intentions all the time. Check them right now. Because if you don't have sincerity, then none of your deeds matter for anything. You heard this, yes? And you have to have sincerity only and only for the sake of? Allah. I'm going to disagree with that. I know. I know. You should, don't kill me yet. <laughs> the Prophet would tell us وسلم, about a man who did lots of sins. Lots of sins. And one day, he doesn't pray nothing. One day he's walking and he sees a dog, thirsty, sticking its tongue out. And the man decides that before he's going to drink, he's going to let the dog drink. Soon after the man dies and Allah takes him into Jannah. Yeah? Let's go back into that story. That man, believer? We don't know. Does, Allah, does he pray? No. When he fed the dog, did he say, wait, let me, let me ikhlas my intention. I'm only doing this for you, Ya Allah. The sticking tongue of the dog means nothing to me. It is your pleasure that I seek, and then I feed this dog. Did he do that? He just felt bad for the dog, and he gave the dog some water. Yes? So he was sincere in his concern for the dog. He had ikhlas. Yes? This man loves his people. But does he say, ha, if it wasn't for Allah, I would hate my people. Does he love them because he's their people? And that is sincerity to his people. You have to have sincerity to Allah in your worship. You have to have sincerity to your parents, not just for Allah, but also because they're your parents. You have to have sincerity to your fellow Muslim, because he's your fellow Muslim. You have to have sincerity to your neighbor, you have to have sincerity to your job. You have to have sincerity to your school, to your business partner. All of those are sincerity. 
You don't try to artificially, no, no, you know what, I can't be friends with you because it's not for the sake of Allah. We just enjoy basketball together and that is, uh, that's not gonna do anything for me in the akhirah. I don't know, who did this number on you? Now you're checking your intention before you take a three-point shot because there's no class in it, like, what? <laughs> you know? It's not how it works. We have to have clarity of intention, sure. We should revisit our intentions, sure. But sincerity is much more than sincerity to Allah. It's sincerity to all of His creation too. You have to have pure intentions towards people. Not fake ones, you know. So that's love, you know, His love for people, even in Jannah. And so Allah is describing actually that that love for people is something that is the quality of the people of Jannah. Listen to me again. Love for your people is a quality of the people of Jannah. So when you find Muslims who are always angry at people, they're always angry at other Muslims, they're angry at their own family, they're really angry at non-Muslims, they're angry, angry, and angry. That is not a quality of the people of Jannah. Ya laita qawmi ya'lamun. Now, he says, you know, what he says, he gave this speech to his people, we don't even know his name, and his words are being recited until the Day of Judgment. Now think about the conversations you and I have. We talk about which iPhone, we talk about which car, we talk about which sports, which playoffs. Where are these conversations gonna go? Are these conversations gonna be immortal? Nope. Is this gonna bring any good in the world? Nope. You know what, we're real, what I'm realizing as I talk about this? Words are priceless treasures to Allah. He's not a prophet, yet his words got recorded in the Qur'an. Does Allah record other things too? وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ كَمْسِ مُبِينٍ I record everything Allah tells us. He records everything. So what would you rather have recorded? Something good? Some sincere advice? Did you have to have exhaustive knowledge before you said something good? Did this man have to have lots of degrees before he said something good? It's not complicated. Just be good. And look, the beauty of how tightly the Qur'an is knit when he's in Jannah and he says, if only my people knew, he said in the next ayah, بِمَا غَفَرَ لِي رَبِّي وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ Because of the forgiveness my master gave to me and made me from those who have been honored. He talked about two things in Jannah, forgiveness and honor. Yes? Forgiveness and honor. In the beginning of the surah, فَبَشِّرْهُ بِي مَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Beginning of the surah Allah said, congratulate that lone believer somewhere that he will have forgiveness and noble compensation. You remember that? Forgiveness and noble compensation. Now in the middle of this story, this man ends up in Jannah and says, Ya Allah, you gave me forgiveness and you made me among the ones made noble. Min al Review. Total review. This is called ihkam of the Qur'an. Wal Qur'an al-Hakim. But then the last thing about this ayah that I really love, is that when he was talking to his people, he said, Inni amantu bi rabbikum. I believe in your master. I have believed in your master. But when he went into Jannah, he said, Bima ghafara li rabbi, my master. Same man talking, now he says, my master. When he saw Jannah, when he was inside Jannah, when he tasted the forgiveness, when he tasted the honor Allah had given him, how Allah, by the way, what does it mean to be honored by someone? How do you get honored by someone? Can you tell me? Recognize. Yeah, they recognize you. They greet you. Greeting someone is an honor. Somebody comes to shake your hand, they've honored you, yes? I'll give it away, it's coming. Allah will say, Salamun qawlam min Rabbil Rahim. In the same surah Allah is gonna say, He is going to say salam to you. So in the beginning He said, I will give you noble reward, noble reward, noble reward. And you're like, what is this noble reward? How noble can it get? Am I going to get a medal? Is it going to give me a certificate like they do at the cheesy HIVS graduations? <laughs> What's the certificate you're going to get? You're going to get a salam from Allah. That's what you're going to get. So when he got that, he just forgot that the Rabb is the Rabb of anyone else. He's only his Rabb. My Rabb forgave me. My Rabb made me from the noble. He's my master and my master alone, subhanAllah. What a beautiful picture of a believer. Now this is what happened in Jannah. But their story should continue where? In this world, what happened here? Now what Allah is gonna do is epic. Please listen to this, because another Muslim confusion. The reason I picked this surah, every time I pick a surah, 
I realize Allah answers so many of our contemporary problems. This is such a living book. It's incredible. I've heard people argue that if, um, if the Muslims do an attack or they, you know, ex you know, they blow something up or whatever, and, not, and Muslims die in it, then they go to Jannah anyway, so it's okay. I've heard this argument. So if people, Muslims die or innocent people die as collateral damage, well Allah knows He'll take them to Jannah, no harm done. Because Jannah is better than dunya. I don't know if you've heard this kind of insanity, but I've, I've heard it plenty. Now let me tell you something about that. Allah, did, did He put him in Jannah? Yes. But just because Allah put him in Jannah does not mean Allah is not enraged with the people who killed him. So he comes back to the earth. While he is chilling in Jannah, having a good old time, Allah is going to take his revenge. وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِنْ جُنْدٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا كُنَّا مُنزِلِينَ We were not going to send any armies from the sky for these people. This pathetic Quraysh that think they're all that, that are insignificant on this earth. There's no nation lower than them in economics, in politics, in, in knowledge and science, these people don't need special preparations for them to be destroyed. I don't need to send any armies from the sky. The reason armies are mentioned is, is because when you warn the Quraysh, I'm giving you a warning, they say, which army? Which army? And when the messengers warn them, they say, you and what army? Where, where's this threat coming from? You alone? And some invisible believer? And Allah says, I don't need to show them an army of angels. And they would say, okay, if you believe in, if you have these armies of angels that come and give you revelation, if he took over the entire sky, you know, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ He saw Jibreel alayhi salam take over the whole sky. Why don't you get Jibreel to flex some of his muscle and take us out then? Huh? Why can't you do that? And Allah says, I'm not gonna dignify you with that request. I don't need to bother angels with the insignificant likes of you. You're not even worth that. People, nations before, did Allah send angels to destroy them? He did. Allah says, Quraysh ain't even worth it. Quraysh ain't even worth the angels' time. That he would clock someone, hey, go take them out. No, no, no. Don't bother. I'll do that myself. In كانت إلا صيحة واحدة It was nothing but one large explosive sound. One shriek. You know an explosion makes a really large sound? It's just one blowing up sound, فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ And their lights out, they're completely lit out. You know, sayha is a violent sound. And this is a beautiful literary contrast in this ayah, because when you refuse to hear the beautiful sounds of the Qur'an, and when these prophets, these nations, refuse to listen to the beautiful voices of their messengers, then the only kind of sound they should hear is an explosion. And then Allah says, فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ Oh, I love this word. Such an epic word. Al-Khubud in Tifa'un Nar. Bi khilaf al humud There's Khumud and Humud in Arabic. When you have a campfire and you put it out, that's called Khumud. But if you put it out and there's a little bit of ambers of yellow, orange, red left, that's called Humud. But when you put it out one shot, it's totally done. Totally done. There's not even little red dots left. It's completely put out. That's called a fire that is khamida. Khamida. فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ They are going to be completely wiped out. There's not even going to be one lying on the floor crawling a little bit to his death. They're going to be done in one shot. Like a fire that's put out. And by the way, by describing their, their death as a fire being put out, they are being compared to a fire. And if you're comparing them to a fire, then you're saying that they are dangerous. And if you let the fire go, the fire will what? Spread. And Allah as a rahmah, as a mercy to all other nations, decides that this cancer and this fire should be put out. فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ And this was in result of one believer being killed. So now, at the conclusion of this second passage, وَمَا وَيَا حَسْرَةً عَلَى الْعِبَادِ مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولِ إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ What a tragedy it is for people. Allah Himself considers that a tragedy. He does not wipe out that nation and say, see what I can do? He said, no, that was a tragedy. Allah Himself is sad for them. You know the word hasra in Arabic? It means, يَا شِدَّةُ النَّدَمْ وَالتَّأَلُّمْ وَالتَّحَصُّرْ وَالْحُزْنْ عَلَى مَا مَضَى It's really sad, deep sadness for over what happened. Allah is calling this a tragedy Himself. Why couldn't they just listen? 
ala al-ibad. What a terrible tragedy for slaves. Oh, he calls them slaves. You know why would why would he call them? Why would he just say ya hasrat al al kuffar? What a tragedy for kuffar, for disbelievers. He called them slaves. You know why? Because deep down inside, every human being had the potential of being Allah's slave. It's a, such a tragedy. You already had it in you. It's not some extra thing you had to get from outside. I already put it in your fitrah. Why didn't you just activate it? You could have pressed the on button yourself. Not a single messenger comes to them. All they do is make fun of them. Except the only t- every time a messenger comes, they just make fun of them. Now in this ayah, Allah does not say they kill messengers or threaten messengers. He said they make fun of messengers. But before you learn that they said that they're going to threaten them, they're going to consider them a curse, you remember that? But here when it comes to the tragedy, he says it all begins with them making fun of them. Once the nation starts making fun of messengers, the road, the, the, the clock has started ticking to when they're going to be destroyed. The first step in their destruction were basically, you know in the cartoons they have that dynamite and you have like a little pssss. You know what I'm talking about? Once they make fun of messengers, it started. That's what's being told. Don't make fun of messengers. Because that means you're on the road to being ended. Now, when Allah says, they, how many messengers come, and they don't believe, they just make fun of it. You learn in the beginning of the surah, وَسَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Reinforcement again. What a tragedy. So many messengers have come and people just don't listen. Alam Yarokam Ahlakna Kablahum Minal Hurun. Didn't they see how many towns we destroyed before them? How many nations have already been destroyed? Didn't they look at that? Who is he talking to? He's talking to these people that are with the Prophet and saying, Why don't they look at history? Why don't they look at what is behind them? Didn't they see? Yes, they didn't see because there's a wall behind them. He says, "Anhum ilayhim la yarjiun." They're not going to come back to them. I, I, you know, some of the mufassirun tra- trace the "Anhum ilayhim la yarjiun" beautifully. It's a beautiful analysis. They say that they're not going to come back to them. Actually, means that those nations that were destroyed because they were completely wiped out and nobody survived, none of their children or ancestry survived. So none of you can say that you are children of the Pharaoh or children of you know, the nation of Lut, or the children of the nation of Salih or Shu'aib, because those people were completely wiped out, you don't go back to any of them. You know how people say, I go back to the family of the Prophet Sallallahu So in the meaning, not just they're not going to come back to them, but you don't go back to them, because their entire future lineages and generations were wiped out. So when you people think you're going to have a future, why are you so confident you'll have a future? And by the way, perhaps because they are completely unnamed, maybe that's why Allah didn't name the town. Because if He named it, nobody would have known, because it doesn't exist. At a, some, at a certain point, Allah erased them from history, and every single follower of them, every one of that ethnicity, one, one ethnic group became extinct. So there's no, not even a point mentioning them. Now Allah says they will become extinct, which means they're forgotten in history. And then He says about Quraysh, you people are an insignificant nation. But in the next ayah, He ties it all together. At the end of this entire passage, He says, وَإِن كُلُّ لَمَّا جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضَرُونَ They're not going to come back to them. And once you die, you're not going to come back to your children. But let me tell you, there is not a single one of you. There is in كُلُّ every single one. And I say the entire gathering of you and the disbelievers like you from every other generation, from every other nation, all of them will in fact be gathered, but they will be gathered right before me, having to present their case. وَإِن كُلُّ لَمَّا جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضَرُونَ This is actually a direct contrast with the previous ayah, how? Just understand that and you're done. In the previous ayah Allah says, they're not gonna come back. Once they're, do- they're gone, they're gone. In this ayah He says actually, they're not gonna come back to you. But they will come back to me. And when they do, they and all of your cousins from all other different nations, because you're cousins with the the disbelievers of Fir'aun. You're also cousins with the nation of Lut. All you kuffar from all these different ethnicities and generations, I'll put you all together. And then you will all be brought in front of me. وَإِن كُلُّ لَمَّا جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضَرُونَ This is what the the threat was. That's being issued now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everybody. 
I didn't hear a walaikum salam. What a Batamese thing to do. Okay, okay. So, now we're in section three. Part three is the world all around you. Allah says, Wa ayatul lahumul ardul mayta. And a miraculous sign for them is the dead earth. What does that have to do with the previous ayah? The previous ayah was everybody will be gathered before Allah, be having to present themselves. And by the way, the easiest way to remember that Allah will take your dead bodies and bring them back to life will be the, the dead earth. He says, Ahyaynaha, we give it life again. Wa akhrajna minha habban. And we bring seeds out from it. Faminhu yakulun from which they eat. What an incredible thing to say. You are all going to be brought before me on judgment day. And by the way, an incredible sign for you to think about that is the earth that brings out seeds that you eat from. In other words, when you eat roti in the morning, when you eat a bagel, when you eat bread, when you eat like salad, when you eat a fruit, you are eating a reminder of judgment day. You are eating exactly what is going to be re resurrected. This is resurrection. It's a product of resurrection, isn't it? And by the way, there are seeds. Because Allah highlighted seeds. And for many fruits, when you eat them, what gets stuck in your mouth? Seeds. The seed sticks out, like it's sticking out, like it's telling you, Judgment Day, by the way. Don't just enjoy the fruit. Here's the seed, like you. Every time you eat a fruit, it's like a khutbah. <laughs> and it's amazing that in artificial fruits, genetically modified fruits, there aren't any seeds. Isn't that crazy? Like naturally you're supposed to experience the uncomfort of seeds, the discomfort of seeds, because it's supposed to remind you of something. SubhanAllah. The ultimate reminder goes down our throats every day. Then Allah says here, you know, some, a concept He began with way back. He said, you know, inna nahnu nuhil mawta. We're the ones who give life to the dead. And now again, the earth is dead and we're going to bring it back to life. Now here, the other thing I want you to understand is that when Allah talks about nature in the Qur'an, it's never talked about in isolation. This is a really hard concept to understand, but for people who reflect and think deeply, it becomes easy. So stay with me, okay? When Allah talks about nature, it is not only talking about nature. When Allah talks about the sky, He's not only talking about the sky. When He's talking about rain, He's not only talking about the rain. When He's talking about the earth, He's not only talking about the earth. Here He's talking about the earth, bringing life again, but it's actually talking about human beings coming back to life too. There needs to be a connection made between nature and you know, natural <coughs> reality and spiritual reality. That's what the Qur'an does constantly, constantly, constantly. They're inseparable from each other. Now along those lines, Allah says previously in the surah that there are people that are dead and He will bring them back to life like their hearts, their spiritual hearts were dead and He brought them back to life. Like that lone guy who became a believer. And that same lone guy who came from the far end of the city and not just became a believer in his private life, but actually became a contributor and helped others. Yes? Here he says, Allah brings the earth back to life. Just like He brought the believer back to life. But then He said, not only do I bring the earth back to life, I bring seeds from it that you consume, that you benefit from. Just like that believer who came back to life benefited others. There's a parallel being made between this earth here and the believer. And this parallel is also found elsewhere in the Qur'an. Like in Surah Al-Fatih, the companions are compared to a fully grown crop. They're compared to a crop. Now, let's move on. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا جَنَّاتٍ Oh, I love this part. We put gardens in the earth. Made up of, made up of date palms. And we put gardens on the earth made up of grapes. وَفَجَّرْنَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْعُيُونَ And we made all manner of springs, water springs gush out of the earth. Rivers came out of the earth, waterfalls came out of the earth. Now this imagery, I want you to think, just play the video in your head. Palm trees, vineyards, waterfalls. Is this something that Qur'an talks about in other contexts? When does the Qur'an talk about palm trees and vineyards and waterfalls? When it's describing paradise, isn't it? Now the exact same language is being used to describe this world. Why? Because this world is supposed to be a preview for Jannah. As a matter of fact, Jannah is not... By the way, Jannah is a spiritual truth, yes? 
Jannah is a spiritual truth, but palm trees and waterfalls and grapes, these are material, physical truths. I told you, every time Allah talks about a physical truth, He is tying it to a spiritual truth. Now, I want you to understand this connection. Jannah would not be motivating if Allah did not describe it in words that describe dunya. I'll say that again. Jannah would not be motivation if Allah did not describe it in worldly terms. If Allah did not say, وَفَاكِهَةٍ مِمَّا يَتَخَيَّرُونَ They will have fruits that they get to pick from. Hmm, oh, hello. وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ And flesh of bird that they are going to love. They're going to bite some of that chicken and go, mm hmm, hmm. <laughs> Pass that over. وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ They're going to like to recline on beautiful couches. Oh. Now I can't, if you have no idea what a delicious fruit is, if you have no clue what a delicious drink is, if you have no idea what a palm tree looks like, what a waterfall looks like, then all of these ayat about Jannah are irrelevant. They don't mean anything to you. As a matter of fact, those things only have some significance because of what Allah put on this earth. Even though the spiritual truth of Jannah is far more enhanced than anything you've seen in this world. مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَمَا خَطَرَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ بَشَرْ No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no imagination, no heart has ever seen, imagined. It's never come. Yet still, there's a preview. There's a preview. So in the previous ayah, Allah used the earth to give us a picture of a believer. And in this ayah, Allah is giving, where does the believer go? Into Jannah. And He uses the palm tree and all of these things to describe really the scene of Jannah. Basically saying, look, why don't you want to go to Jannah? Haven't I given you a preview? Doesn't that make you want to go more? You should want to go there. Just because of what you've seen in dunya. You should go to beautiful places in the world like a waterfall and say, if Allah did this in dunya, wow, what's He going to do in Jannah? You go to in front of a beautiful mountain, you sit by palm trees. Palm trees are so cool. Just sitting by them. It's just, you feel relaxed. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, it's not the drugs that make California relaxing. <laughs> it's the palm trees. Something about palm trees. I don't, I, 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 I don't like the weather in Houston, I'll tell you now. I don't like the weather in Houston. Just like I don't like the weather in Karachi. <laughs> but I do like something here on the highway. Next to the big tire shop, there's always a palm tree there. Palm tree just makes me happy. Especially when you come from Dallas, or you, just, you have shrubs. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you see palm tree, you just get happy. It's a sign of just something exotic, I don't know. You know? وَفَجَّرْنَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْعُيُونَ لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ ثَمَرِهِ So we did all of this so they can just eat from its fruit? That's it? You think I made all of this so you can just cow pee or mazikaro? That's all you want to do? So that they may eat from its fruit. وَمَا عَمِلَتْهُ أَيْدِيهِمْ And their hands didn't make these fruits. And by the way, عَمِلَتْ هُ فَهُنَاكَ النِّقَاشْ عِنْدَ الْمُفَسِّرِينَ مَا هُوَ الْضَمِيرِ إِلَى مَا يَعُودِ Where does the pronoun go back to in who? I'll make it easy English for you. They say that the word who goes back to the springs of water coming out. So that they can eat from the fruits of the water that he produce, brings out. And they didn't make the water with their own hands. Of all the things human beings can do, they can plant the seed with their own hand, they can dig with their own hand, but the water that comes out of the earth is not their doing. And this is significant because a, spirit, a physical truth is always tied to a spiritual truth. And water in the Qur'an is compared to the Qur'an itself. Water is compared to the Qur'an itself. The Qur'an comes from the sky, and what else comes from the sky? Water comes from the sky. Qur'an brings the dead hearts back to life, Water brings the dead earth back to life. So water is constantly compared with the Qur'an. And water is completely pure, it purifies. It, is not, it doesn't need to be pure itself, it is the thing that purifies everything else. That's how purity is attained on this earth. And the Book of Allah is in and of itself pure and it purifies people. يزكيهم, it purifies them. So water is always compared to the Qur'an. And he says now, so they can eat from its fruits, the benefits of the water. But they didn't make the water with their own hands. Just like in the beginning of the, Qur the surah, the Qur'an is not the work of a human being. Just like the Qur'an is not the work. See how things tie together? It's mind-blowing stuff, man. 
It's just mind-blowing stuff. And I study it, and I get so happy, and then I get so mad. I get, why didn't I know this? This is so epic. And then he says, Afala yashkurun. Then, oh, then are they not grateful? Now when you get to the end of this ayah, are they not grateful? You realize that Allah is not just asking me to be grateful for fruits. He's asking me to be grateful for the physical truth. But He's also making me grateful for what? The spiritual truth to which it is tied. The book of Allah. The book of Allah. You know in, in, the, in the ayah, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن, those ayahs, right? So you can be grateful. Grateful for what? For the Qur'an. Because it's the month of the Qur'an. The whole exercise of Ramadan is so you can appreciate the Qur'an. That's all it's for. It's actually not for pakoda and samosa. <laughs> Some people think that's the Hanafi opinion. Astaghfirullah <laughs> al Uh uh The purpose of Ramadan is actually to celebrate the Qur'an. That's all it is. So you can become grateful for what you have. Allah. Now, water is not their doing, like revelation is not their doing. Water brings life. Revelation brings life. Water is the source of, the, the water, because it's compared to the word of Allah, water resurrects on the earth. And the word of Allah will one day resurrect on the earth. Kun fayakun. Subhanallah. Now, we're gonna go to the perfection of Allah now. Allah can't be compared to anyone. And Allah created this creature like water, and there's nothing you can compare to it. He says, Subhanallah, khalaq al azwaja kullaha. So commonly mistranslated, but I'll translate it in a, in a Pindu way first, and then I'll translate it fixed way. How perfect is the one who created spouses, pairs of all kinds. Pindu translation, he created everything in pairs. That is the Rawal Pindi translation in English. Sorry, Rahul Pindi. My nani is from Rahul Pindi. Okay, relax. Like, oh, I'm not Rahul Pindi. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> relax, auntie. It's okay. It's okay. So he created spouses of all kinds. Not spouses or pairs of everything, but pairs from all kinds of things. Mimma tumbitul ard. From what comes out of the earth, women and fusihim, and even from within themselves, women by la and out of things they don't even know. Allah created all kinds of pairs. Now somebody emailed me, brother, Quran says everything is created in pairs. What about amoeba? <laughs> what about a virus? What about you know unicellular organisms? Like, yeah, please. What? <sighs> There's so many words that I've heard my uncle say in Punjabi that come in my head. I don't even speak Punjabi. <laughs> but like words like Uluda Partha, or like, you know, they just, they just come in my head when I read those emails. I don't want to get angry at this person because you're not supposed to be angry. But some questions are just so epic. Now the Quran is being undone by amoeba. <laughs> and he attached a, like a JPEG file in case I didn't know what it looked like. <laughs> Allah made all kinds of things in pairs. And azwaj doesn't just mean pairs. Azwaj also means groups that complement each other. Azwaj is used in the Quran like that. Mamatta'na bihi azwajan minhum. Not not pairs, but groups. Kuntum azwajan thalatha. You are in three groups that complement each other. Each group complements its own members. It's not pairs. Allah things made complementary is what he's saying. Allah things made complement each other. Entire ecosystems complement each other. Planets complement each other. Galaxies complement each other. Human body, the human body parts complement each other. Spouses complement each other. Families complement each other. Neighborhoods complement each other. Countries complement each other, complete each other. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا All of this is part of الْأَزْوَاجَ كُلَّهَا From within what comes out of the earth too. You know sometimes, it's not just two kinds of apples and two kinds of oranges and... Not like that. That may be true, but also you know there are certain environments where certain plants have to grow and other plants can only grow in the neighborhood of those plants. They can't grow on their own. They need other plants to provide them shade, or provide them moisture, or provide them other things. And some plants can only grow on top of other plants. And some birds can only live in some kinds of trees. They are in a zawj with that tree. This is what Allah did. Things that need each other. 
He's so perfect. He made everything need everything else. He's the one who doesn't need anyone. That's the point he's making. Look around you. Look at everything and it needs everything else. Look at how the earth needs the clouds. Look at how the clouds need the winds. Look at how the earth needs the sun and it needs the moon. And they need each other. And Subhanallah. And within themselves, within you, he made things that need other things. He made the pair, obvious pair people talk about is the male and the female. But this goes way beyond that. This is way beyond that. Even though that's a huge, significant, you know, min خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Why did he make spouses out of you? So you can find peace with each other. <laughs> that's enough commentary on that. I'm going to move on. But then, there's even in, there are pairs and dualities and contradictions, complementary contradictions inside of me. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا He put inside me the urge to just do whatever I want. And then he put inside me the urge to no, hold back and just don't go crazy. He put inside me enthusiasm and he put inside me restraint. He put inside me, he gave me this body and he gave me this ruh. He complimented, there's a pair inside, I'm made of a pair. I'm not this body, I'm this ruh, but I'm also this body. He made a pair of, he gave me a qalb, a heart that has, that can have Allah's taqwa, that can have his iman, that can have the fear of Allah. But then he gave me a mind too. He gave me emotions here. He gave me thought here. He paired those two up. And that's why a message has to be emotionally appealing and intellectually, because I'm made of a pair myself. He gave this message, he, he, he gave guidance, but he paired it up. He paired the message with the messenger. You can't just have one. Then he made the night and he made the day. Then he made this life. He made this life, this world, and these palm trees, and these grapes, and these waterfalls. And he paired them in the Quran. He paired them with what? The trees in Jannah, and the waterfalls in Jannah, and the grapes in Jannah, and the, the you know, chicken salad in Jannah. He paired all of it. It's all paired. That's what he does. The only one that doesn't need a pair, doesn't need a compliment, is what? Is who? It's Allah. That's it. That's why in the beginning, Subhanallah khalaq al azwaj. How perfect is the one who made things that need each other? Because he's the only one who doesn't. And it all ties together when you realize that this life is paired with the next. That's what I mean. When Allah talks about things from this world, they are always tied to a spiritual truth from the next world. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلِ I love this one. Um, um, a, a, something to ponder for them. Something to think about for them. A significant sign for them is the night. نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ nahar. We pull the day out of it. Did you know that in the Qur'an, Allah compares misguidance to night? And He compares guidance to what? Day. Now day and night are a physical phenomenon, but again, we're gonna tie it to a spiritual truth. What is the spiritual truth? Night is similar to? Misguided, you know, zalam. Min al zulumati ila nur. From darknesses to, to light. Darknesses are night. Light is day. Right? Allah says, a sign for them is the night. And we pull the day out from it. Just like the Arabs. Fahum ghafilun. Ma unzira abauhum. For generations these people were in the night. And pulled out of from within them, yanked out of them, is this messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa who Allah gave the light so they can see the light of day. So when they think about night and day, they should think about how Allah has pulled them out of darkness into light through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even this is tied to a spiritual truth. نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ nahar. But then he ends the ayah so beautifully, he says, فَإِذَا هُمْ مُظْلِمُونَ Then all of a sudden they, go, they, they get dark themselves. They go into the dark themselves. مُظْلِمُونَ to be dark. Wait, it was just day. It was just day. They should be munarun. They should be lit up. Munawwarun. But he says, Mudlimun. Why? Day came out, Quran came out, it's brilliant, it's undeniable, and yet you want to dig yourself in a hole and hide in the dark. Ah, that must be because you're covered from above and there's a wall in front of you and there's a wall behind you and light can't get in. Where did I get that from? The beginning. We pull the day out and they're still in the dark. Faida, and all of a sudden they're in the dark. And then he says, by the way, Faida, some even commented. 
that فَإِذَاهُمْ مُظْلِمُونَ Because he doesn't say فَلَا فَإِذَاهُمْ يُظْلِمُونَ he says, فَإِذَاهُمْ مُظْلِمُونَ If it was يُظْلِمُونَ, they're gonna be in the night temporarily, then they'll be the next day. But he uses the word مُظْلِمُونَ which is permanent. Because he's going from the material example of night and day and switching over to the spiritual truth, which means they're gonna stay in the dark. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ وَسَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ That's why it's مُظْلِمُونَ They're just gonna stay. Now we're gonna get to the sun and the moon. But before I talk about the sun and the moon, I do want to remind you, I did bring up the sun and the moon before. I said you can compare the Prophet and the companions to who? The sun and the moon. The Prophet is a constant source of guidance. And they are illuminated by the presence of the Prophet And by the way, the Prophet himself is called the sun in the Qur'an. وَدَاعِيًا إِلَى اللَّهِ بِإِذْنِهِ وَسِرَاجًا مُنِيرًا He is a caller to Allah by his permission, and he is a brilliant sun. He's called the sun himself. So I'm not coming up with this myself, it's in the Qur'an. So if he's the sun, who is illuminated by him? His companions. And all of us to this day, we are still like the moon. Now the thing is, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا The sun moves until a time where Allah will tell it to stop. The Prophet is not with you forever. The sun is gonna go. Allah is not just talking about the sun has a particular time and a particular schedule. That's true, He's talking about that. But on the spiritual side, He's comparing this to what? The Prophet ﷺ is only here for a limited amount of time. Take advantage while He's still here. ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ That is the calculation and the decree of the one who has the ultimate authority. The one who sent him was Al-Aziz. تَنْزِيلَ Aziz, he, his, his authority is that he will not stay forever. He will stay here as long as he gives them the authority to stay here. And by the way, when is he gonna go? He's the only one who knows, Al-Alim. Just like for the sun, he has authority over the sun. And one day the sun itself will stop too. Now, if that's the case, what about the moon? He says, as for the moon, وَالْقَمَرْ قَدَّرْنَاهُ manazil." We, we calculated it that it should go through phases. The Prophet is constant. لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكْ So we can make your heart constant. But the believers are not constant. They go through phases like the moon goes through phases. And sometimes the believing community becomes so weak. حَتَّى عَادَ كَالْعُرْجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ Until it becomes like an old little twig left of a, date, a palm tree. The little, little fine line. Like the entire sky is filled with darkness and the only light left is this tiny little bit. Sometimes the ummah will be so deeply immersed in the dark and there will be barely any light left. That is little bit of a reflection of that sun, of that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But don't be depressed because when it gets to its lowest, that's when it rises again. That's the rise of the summa again. So beautiful. The Sahaba are being told, your situation may be very weak right now. You may be very few in number. You may barely be visible. By the way, when the sun is, when the moon is at its weakest, it is almost what? Invisible. Isn't it? That's why we have moon fighting. <laughs> right? So, so, wasn't the believer described in the beginning of the surah as pretty much invisible? وَخَشِيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ Someone who's on the far end of the city. You would never have known. Subhanallah. The rise and fall of the sun, the, 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 you know, is like the rise and fall of the summah. And that's just the nature of it. So if you are thinking that the summah, one day we will have everything, and everything's gonna be perfect, and this world's gonna turn into Jannah. Uh, not in the Quran. <laughs> that's not how it works. That's not what, what our aim is. Our aim is to make the best of whatever phase we live in. Whatever phase we live in. We make the best. And then Allah has His own decree. Allah is going to do what He's going to do. حَتَّى عَادَكَ الْعُرْجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ لَا الشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرِ So beautiful. It's not becoming of the sun to follow the moon. Or to catch up to the moon. The right translation would be تُدْرِك الْإِدْرَاك To catch up. The sun is not capable of catching up to the moon. It's not, not capable. It's not appropriate for it to catch up to the moon. You know what that means? The sun has its own job and the moon has its own job. And the sun is not supposed to do the moon's job. The Prophet ﷺ had a job and his followers have a job. And they both have to do their jobs. One does not make the other one irrelevant or insignificant. 
They need it. They both need to do their own jobs. Has this been something that we already learned about in the surah? Wasn't it the case that three messengers came and there was a follower who started talking anyway? Because the messengers have their job, but that doesn't mean that the believer doesn't have his job. And all of them are rotating around in their own spaces. They're swimming in their own spaces. They have their own spheres in which they operate. Now when he says this, he's talking physically. Now imagine the physical image. The physical image is of the sun and the moon having their own orbits, yes? And they don't crash into each other. But they definitely perfectly complement each other. And all of it to make things better for the earth. If the sun and the moon don't cooperate, the earth gets destroyed. If the believers don't take full advantage of their prophet, then there's fasad on the earth. If the, the prophets do their job, but if the believers stop reflecting, there's a problem. There's gonna be tragedy on the earth. Moving on from this, when he says falak, it actually means a round trip too. Falak in Arabic, a full circle. Or an oval really, an, an oblong kind of circle. Okay, that's falak. Speaking of the word falak, he says wa ayatul lahum, and there's another miraculous sign for them. Anna hamalna dhurriyatahum, that we boarded their children on. Fil fulkil mash'oon, in ships that are loaded up completely. The word fulk is very close to the word falak. It's like speaking of fulk, let me tell you about another round trip. When a ship goes out in sea, it's hope, you're hoping it comes back one day, yes or no? Right? It's, you're hoping to make a round trip. Now what is this ayah doing here? The, the passage started with the earth, it's about to conclude with the, with the sea. So the entire earth, the entire planet. We began with the dead earth, now we're about to go into sea. And in the sea, Allah is going to talk about us going out into... And he doesn't say you board onto the ships, He says they put their children on the ships. And he didn't even say their children, he said their future generations, they put them on the ship. Why did he say that? Because when people used to get onto a ship, it wasn't a two-day trip. They would travel for months, get on the other side of the world, and when they got there, they would settle there, and they would make a life there. Yes? Maybe they'll come back, or maybe they'll just become their new home. And if those young men, because they're, they're young men, they're young men and women, 18, 19, 20 year old, they went on the other side of the world, and they settled there, and started working there, making a living there. Their children, and their children's children, and their children's children are going to be settled where? Over there. So a young man traveling on a ship back in the day was like all of his future generations traveling. Because once he makes that move, and his kids, and his kids, and his kids are all going to be there. So you know when you got on that, sh on that plane from the PIA? <laughs> it wasn't you that was getting on the plane. It was your future generation. <laughs> Right. Right. We going back. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That's why you're here. Okay. You go back and you realize, ah, we ain't going back. Can we go back? <laughs> but yeah, isn't it the case that our future generations ended up here? There are two, three generations of Muslims here now? But this is what Allah does. And He's telling this to the Quraysh. You also have hopes in your children, so you send them on a journey. And when you say, by the way, it's so beautiful that the passage began with Allah made pairs of everything. You remember that? But when a man and a woman are a pair, what comes next? Kids. Their kids are loaded onto ships. See, there's almost a conclusion. You know, it's progressing. The sun and the moon travel, which means days and months go by, and soon, soon there's a baby, and then the baby gets older, and he wants to make a living, and he wants to go off, and he's getting on a ship. There's a life journey inside these ayat. So cool. Now speaking of every planet is swimming in its own orbit, كُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ يَسْبَحُونَ means to swim. Speaking of swimming, let's talk about the ocean. He just transitions, he segues into from one image to the next. Now what you're thinking is, if you can't imagine what it must be like for the earth to be floating in the universe, and the moon to be floating, and the sun to be floating, the closest thing to that you can imagine is what? Your ship in the middle of the endless ocean just floating in the middle of nowhere. That's a sign for you, of what goes on up there. How, how delicate you are, how insignificant you are, how easily you could be drowned. How ins the sun is really significant to you, but to Allah it's just like a ship in the middle of the ocean. He can just tip it over, drown it. He can just do whatever with it. It's nothing to Him. 
So now you're in this ship, al mashhoon that are, you know, that are full, shahan al safina mala'aha, to fill the ship with everything. Some people say this is a reference to, to uh, uh, Nuh alayhi salam. I do want to tell you something here. That is a long conversation among Mufassirun. For us, it's going to be a short conversation. For some reason, the Quran in this surah comes close to talking about Musa alayhi salam and comes close to talking about Nuh alayhi salam, but doesn't do it. You know when there were two messengers sent to a nation? The closest to that you get in the Quran is what? Musa Harun to one nation. A man came from the far end of the city. The only other story where a man comes from the far end of the city is what? Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam. At the end of that story, they were put out like a fire is put out. You remember that? When you, what's the easiest way to put out a fire? Water. How was, the, how was Fir'aun taken out? Water. Even though there are differences, there's a third messenger in this one. So there are some differences. But it comes close to what? Musa alayhi salam. Then you come here, we boarded their children onto ships. What does that make you think of? Nuh alayhi salam. And both of them have something in common. Their nations were destroyed by flood. They were drowned. And this is going to be important. You're going to be put out like water. Meaning Allah is telling the Quraysh, it doesn't matter if you're in the middle of the desert, I can do anything. I can do anything. SubhanAllah. Anyhow, I do want to highlight one thing here. You know, why do people put their young men and women onto ships, onto airplanes? Why do they do that? To send them off to college, yes? To send them to get a job, to get a PhD, to start a career. All their hopes are tied into this son who is in another land, into this daughter who's finishing her med school, living in another city. The mother's losing sleep every day because she's got hopes in her what? Future. Her future. Allah says, when you lose sight of the akhirah, when you have nothing to look forward to in the next life, then the only future you think of is your own children. We should think of our children. But you know the Quraysh, the greatest future they ever thought of was what? There's, there's nothing more. That is the furthest extent they'll ever get. You know? This is the furthest. They can't go any past that. They can't think any past that. I want good for my kids too. I want them to get a good education. I want them to get a good job. But you know what? I want their guidance more than anything else. Anything else. You guys are putting some of your kids in good high schools because they are from good school districts. So the math, science, English scores are high. But the moral depravity of those schools is lower than human civilization has ever experienced in its entire history. But the math science scores are really high. <coughs> Homosexuality is being celebrated. An overly sexualized culture with music videos that are almost pornography is being shared constantly. Facebook is becoming more and more and more explicit, openly. Mobile devices are now tools that are predominantly being used to promote shamelessness. And we're buying our kids new iPhones because they got a good score on math. So they can get into a good school. We are feeding their minds and ripping their hearts out. That is what we're doing. That is what we're doing. They're becoming really smart and they're going to be doctors. But they are going to be materialist, almost non-human. They're not going to have any spiritual life left inside of them. And you know who did that to them? Don't blame the kuffar. Don't blame the kuffar. You want good for your kids? Good, want good for all of them, not just their physical being. All you want for them is to make money, or to make, you should be able to say, I raised a doctor, or I raised a kid who's got the top scores in this or that, and you never concerned yourself with their spiritual well-being, their character well-being, their ethical well-being, their moral well-being. There's a tragedy. And on the other hand, then you have some other people. I want to protect my child. I want it to be a hafiz. He doesn't go to school. He just goes to school. And then he's going to become a alim. And after alim, I don't know, fadil. After fadil, maybe farigh. I don't know. But he's going to... 
I'm going to keep him away from the, this kafir society. I'm just, oh, what am I, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah. And let me tell you something about that young man who is completely surrounded in the masjid environment and knows nothing about the world outside. He knows nothing about the world outside because that is the world of kufar. What you've done to this child is the equal, equal injustice. You have fed his heart at the expense of feeding his mind. Does Allah ask us to pay attention to the world around us? Did you know that in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah talked about business law, business law, the guy who knows how to write the contract must be a lawyer, or a, at least an expert in business. He says, فَلْيَكْتُبْ مِمَّا عَلَّمَهُ اللَّهِ He should write based on what Allah taught him. The guy who understands how to write business contracts, his education, Allah says, I gave it to him. The Qur'an says, عَلَّمَ Quran. He taught the Qur'an. And the same Qur'an says, business law was taught by Allah. This is a, some non-Muslim guy, he's a katib, who knows how to write contracts really well, and Allah says, I educated him. The Qur'an does not make a distinction between religious education and worldly education, what you like to call secular education, because all of it is ayat of Allah. When you cut the ayat of Allah, we're gonna study the ayat of revelation, but not the ayat of the world around us, and not the world, not the world of history. There were three ways to the truth, front, back, and top. And now you say, I just want to learn the top, I don't want to see the front, I don't want to see the back. Then you know what? You're not getting the full picture of the truth. We need to find a balance in human education. This is the tragedy that we've done to our kids. We have hope in our kids, but man, even if this kid does go to a madrasa and mashallah becomes a alim, I'm happy for him. But when he comes to college one day or meets a college student, and then he has one conversation about Richard Dawkins. He has one conversation about evolution. What's he gonna do? Well, where's he gonna go? We haven't even prepared them for the intellectual challenges against Islam. And this is our responsibility, people. We have to do it. We have to do it. And inshallah, maybe if we have time at the end, I'll rant more about it and tell you what I think. But anyway, وَخَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ Not only did we create these ships for them, we created for them, مِن مِثْلِهِ Just like it, مَا يَرْكَبُونَ What they ride themselves. The Arabs also ride something. The Arabs ride the camel. And the camel is called Safina to Sahra, the, the ship. Of the, of, the, of the desert. So they say they drop their kids off on the ship and then they get on their desert ship. But also the ayah says we created for them just like it, what they are going to be riding. Allah says I've created ships so far for you. But there are other things I'm gonna create for you. Now they didn't know, we know, trains, airplanes, satellites, hot air balloons, God, you name it. All of that is actually something Allah says He created. But I thought engineers created them. What about the Wright brothers? You know, they're not the wrong brothers. So why, why are we, you know, so... How do we reconcile that? Allah is saying, by the way, the all human creativity, all human creativity is accredited to the one who gifted you with that creativity. The idea you were inspired with was actually inspired to you by Allah. You know, the, the app developer, <laughs> you know, the biochemical researcher who in their sleep got, oh, I should have put an O there. That came from Allah. Those neurons fired from Allah. That's ilham also. You know, there are literally, there are inventors that I've seen documentaries on, inventors of great things who say, I saw it in a dream. I've been working on this experiment, it's been failing for years and years, and I saw it in a dream. Who created that actually? It's Allah. Did you know that the first ship that was made, according to us in our faith, the first ship that was designed was the ship of Nuh alayhi salam? And Allah says, وَاسْنَعِ الْفُلْكْ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Manufacture the ship under our direct watch. Allah is the project manager on this, this construction project. وَحَمَلْنَهُ عَلَى ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ We carried him on to things made of boards and nails. Allah even talks about the construction materials in the Qur'an. He gives them significance. Don't underestimate the value of a good, sound, worldly education, but it should never be at the expense of a spiritual education. An education in the seerah of your Prophet an education in the Qur'an, an education in this deen, in its shara'i', in its ahkam. Now, وَإِنَّ نَشَأْ نُغْرِقْهُمْ If we wanted, we would drown them. In the middle of the sea, we drown them. فَلَا صَرِيخَ لَهُمْ Then they wouldn't have any cries to them. You know what this image is of? There's a ship in the middle of the sea, and it tips over, and what happens? They're drowned. 
And they're screaming, Help! There's no cry to be heard. وَلَاهُمْ يُنْقَذُونَ They're not going to be the ones that get rescued. They would completely be ruined. They're completely drowned in the depths of a dark ocean. This is the second time we've seen someone drowned in the depths of darkness. The first time was when there was a wall in front and a wall behind and a lid on top. And now they're all the way in the bottom of the ocean. إِلَّا رَحْمَةً minna. And the only reason we don't do that, actually the only exception is out of an act of loving mercy from us. وَمَتَاعًا ilahin. And so they may enjoy life and use things until a very limited time. I'm not going to crash your airplane just yet. You know what Allah is saying? Allah doesn't cause the airplane to crash. Allah causes it not to crash. It is, it's, its default position is to crash. The one keeping it in the air is Allah. The default position of the ship is to what? Sink. The one keeping it afloat is Allah. People have the wrong picture. They think it's the, you know, just like the messengers, they think the messengers came as a punishment. Or Allah drowned the ship. No, it's actually Allah as the was the one keeping it afloat. He's the one keeping it where it should be. This is the image of Allah Azza wa Jal. Illa rahmatan minna wa mata'an ilaheen. I can do anything. Subhanallah. Anyhow, I do want to highlight one thing here. Yes, you know, Abu Ayatul Lahum, Anna Hamalna Zurriyatahum fil Fulk al Mashun. Why do people put their young men and women onto ships, onto airplanes? Why do they do that? To send them off to college, yes? To send them to get a job, to do get a PhD, to start a career. All their hopes are tied into this son who is in another land, into this daughter who's finishing her med school, living in another city. The mother's losing sleep every day because she's got hopes in her what? Future. Her future. Allah says, when you lose sight of the akhirah, when you have nothing to look forward to in the next life, then the only future you think of is your own children. We should think of our children. But you know the Quraysh, the greatest future they ever thought of was what? There's, there's nothing more. That is the furthest extent they'll ever get. You know? This is the furthest. They can't go any, any past that. They can't think any past that. I want good for my kids too. I want them to get a good education. I want them to get a good job. But you know what? I want their guidance more than anything else. Anything else. You guys are putting some of your kids in good high schools because they are from good school districts. So the math, science, English scores are high. But the moral depravity of those schools is lower than human civilization has ever experienced in its entire history. But the math, science scores are really high. <coughs> Homosexuality is being celebrated. An overly sexualized culture with music videos that are almost pornography is being shared constantly. Facebook is becoming more and more and more explicit, openly. Mobile devices are now tools that are predominantly being used to promote shamelessness. And we're buying our kids new iPhones because they got a good score on math. So they can get into a good school. We are feeding their minds and ripping their hearts out. That is what we're doing. That is what we're doing. They're becoming really smart and they're going to be doctors. But they are going to be materialist, almost non-human. They're not going to have any spiritual life left inside of them. And you know who did that to them? Don't blame the kuffar. Don't blame the kuffar. You want good for your kids? Good, want good for all of them, not just their physical being. All you want for them is to make money or to make, you should be able to say, I raised a doctor or I raised a kid who's got the top scores in this or that and you never concerned yourself with their spiritual well-being, their character well-being, their ethical well-being, their moral well-being. There's a tragedy. And on the other hand, then you have some other people. I want to protect my child. I want it to be a hafiz. He doesn't go to school. He just goes to school. And then he's going to become a alim. And after Alim, I don't know, Fadil. After Fadil, maybe Farig. I don't know. <laughs> but he's gonna, I'm gonna keep him away from the, this kafir society. I'm just, oh, I don't know, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah. And let me tell you something about that young man who is completely surrounded in the masjid environment and knows nothing about the world outside. 
He knows nothing about the world outside. Because that is the world of kuffar. What you've done to this child is the equal, equal injustice. You have fed his heart at the expense of feeding his mind. Does Allah ask us to pay attention to the world around us? Did you know that in Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah talked about business law, business law, the guy who knows how to write the contract must be a lawyer or a, at least an expert in business. He says, فَلْيَكْتُبْ مِمَّا عَلَّمَهُ اللَّهِ He should write based on what Allah taught him. The guy who understands how to write business contracts, his education, Allah says, I gave it to him. The Qur'an says, عَلَّمَ Quran." He taught the Qur'an. And the same Qur'an says, business law was taught by Allah. This is a, some non-Muslim guy, he's a katib, who knows how to write contracts really well, and Allah says, I educated him. The Qur'an does not make a distinction between religious education and worldly education, what you like to call secular education, because all of it is ayat of Allah. When you cut the ayat of Allah, we're gonna study the ayat of revelation, but not the ayat of the world around us, and not the world, not the world of history. There were three ways to the truth, front, back, and top. And now you say, I just wanna learn the top, I don't wanna see the front, I don't wanna see the back, then you know what? You're not getting the full picture of the truth. We need to find a balance in human education. This is the tragedy that we've done to our kids. We have hope in our kids, but man, even if this kid does go to a madrasa and mashallah becomes a alim, I'm happy for him. But when he comes to college one day or meets a college student, and then he has one conversation about Richard Dawkins. He has one conversation about evolution. What's he gonna do? Where's he gonna go? We haven't even prepared them for the intellectual challenges against Islam. And this is our responsibility, people. We have to do it. We have to do it. And inshallah, maybe if we have time at the end, I'll rant more about it and tell you what I think. But anyway, وَخَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ Not only did we create these ships for them, we created for them, مِمِّثْلِهِ Just like it, مَيَرْ kabun, What they ride themselves. The Arabs also ride something. The Arabs ride the camel. And the camel is called Safina to Sahra, the, the ship of the, of the, of the desert. So they say they drop their kids off on the ship and then they get on their desert ship. But also the ayah says we created for them just like it, what they are going to be riding. Allah says I've created ships so far for you. But there are other things I'm gonna create for you. Now they didn't know, what we know, trains, airplanes, satellites, hot air balloons, God, you name it. All of that is actually something Allah says He created. But I thought engineers created them. What about the Wright brothers? You know, they're not the wrong brothers. So why, why are we, you know, so... How do we reconcile that? Allah is saying, by the way, the all human creativity, all human creativity is accredited to the one who gifted you with that creativity. The idea you were inspired with was actually inspired to you by Allah. You know, the, the app developer, <laughs> you know, the biochemical researcher who in their sleep got, oh, I should have put an O there. That came from Allah. Those neurons fired from Allah. That's ilham also. You know, there are literally, there are inventors that I've seen documentaries on, inventors of great things who say, I saw it in a dream. I've been working on this experiment, it's been failing for years and years, and I saw it in a dream. Who created that actually? It's Allah. Did you know that the first ship that was made, according to us in our faith, the first ship that was designed was the ship of Nuh alayhi salam? And Allah says, وَاسْنَعِ الْفُلْكْ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Manufacture the ship under our direct watch. Allah is the project manager on this, this construction project. وَحَمَلْنَهُ عَلَى ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ We carried him on to things made of boards and nails. Allah even talks about the construction materials in the Qur'an. He gives them significance. Don't underestimate the value of a good, sound, worldly education, but it should never be at the expense of a spiritual education. An education in the seerah of your Prophet wasallam, an education in the Qur'an, an education in this deen, in its shara'i', in its ahkam. Now, وَإِنَّ نَشَأْ نُغْرِقْهُمْ If we wanted, we would drown them. In the middle of the sea, we drown them. فَلَا صَرِيخَ لَهُمْ Then they wouldn't have any cries to them. You know what this image is of? There's a ship in the middle of the sea, and it tips over, and what happens? They're drowned, and they're screaming, Help! There's no cry to be heard. Walahum yunqadun. They're not gonna be the ones that get rescued. They would completely be ruined. 
They're completely drowned in the depths of a dark ocean. This is the second time we've seen someone drowned in the depths of darkness. The first time was when there was a wall in front and a wall behind and a lid on top. And now they're all the way in the bottom of the ocean. إِلَّا رَحْمَةً minna. And the only reason we don't do that, actually the only exception is out of an act of loving mercy from us. وَمَتَاعًا ilahin. And so they may enjoy life and use things until a very limited time. I'm not going to crash your airplane just yet. You know what Allah is saying? Allah doesn't cause the airplane to crash. Allah causes it not to crash. It is, it's, its default position is to crash. The one keeping it in the air is Allah. The default position of the ship is to what? Sink. The one keeping it afloat is Allah. People have the wrong picture. They think it's the, you know, just like the messengers, they think the messengers came as a punishment. Or Allah drowned the ship. No, it's actually Allah as the was the one keeping it afloat. He's the one keeping it where it should be. This is the image of Allah Azza wa Jal. إِلَّا رَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَمَتَاعًا إِلَحِينَ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thumma ma ba'd. Actually, a sister had a really brilliant question and I thought that I would start this session by answering that question and helping everybody understand some things about the nature of engaging the Qur'an. Uh, the question was, you know, we're, we're learning all these, you know, you know, wisdom or philosophical insights and things like that. What is the practical benefit of all of this? I mean, you spend so, time, so much time studying it and you're describing all of this, but practically, what do I take home with me? Right? What are some, maybe even, she didn't say the words, but maybe what are some action items I can take home to say I actually got something out of this? Uh, I actually believe that that's uh, a very common concern. And I also believe it's tied to a certain uh, slogan that is, uh, is problematic, that has become very common in the Muslim community. And the, co the slogan is that we have to learn every ayah of the Qur'an and put it into practice. The slogan is, everything you learn in the Qur'an, you should put it into practice. Now the thing is, not every ayah of the Qur'an calls you to an action. Alif la mim does not call you to an action. فَتَوَلَّى بِرُكْنِهِ وَقَالَ سَاحِرٌ مَجْنُونَ Fir'aun turned to his side and said that Musa alayhi salam is a magician or insane. It's not calling you to an action. You understand? You know, the, 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 the Allah created trees that have beautifully packaged fruits. Maybe the action is go eat a fruit. I, I, you know. But then what is the Qur'an calling you to? See, the Qur'an has certain goals. The, the goals of the Qur'an are identified by the Qur'an itself. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَذَكَّرُونَ Qur'an itself tells you, so that you think, so that you reflect, so that you ponder, so that you protect yourself, so that you act in the right way. Sometimes the ayat are calling you to action. Other times, what Allah wants you to do is just think. He just says, I want you to think. Other times He says, I really want you to think deeply. He says, he complains in the Qur'an, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Why don't they reflect deeply into the Qur'an? أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Or do they, their hearts have locks placed on them? You know, when we think of putting something into action, we're talking about something that you do. But our actions are a result of our attitudes, our emotions, our understanding. And much of the Qur'an is actually shifting our attitudes. It's shifting our understanding. It's making us appreciate Allah's power is making us appreciate Allah's wisdom. And that wisdom changes the way you th see things and how you react to things. So not everything is a call to action. I don't believe that at all, actually. I don't believe that at all. There are, there are so many ayat of the Qur'an where there's nothing for you to do. But there's a lot for you to what? Think about. There's a lot for you to consider. There's a lot for you to remember. All of this is a, a legitimate application of the Qur'an. That's also putting the Qur'an, if you want to call it, into action. The purpose of this exercise, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to highlight, because Allah said in the beginning, Quran al hakim the Qur'an full of wisdom. I wanted to highlight some of the beautiful wisdom in the surah. That was my first goal. I also wanted to highlight how it's knit together. Because the word hakim also means that it's knit together. I also wanted to highlight how the Qur'an does not apologize for its verdicts. It says it like it is, like all these prophets did. And calls people out like it should because at the end of the day, Hakim is also that. And that 
that ayah in the beginning is actually driving this entire study. So I'm hoping that's what you get out of it. That's worth it to me. If that's not practical enough, I don't know what else I could tell you. Okay, now. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا Actually, no. The ayah now is, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ When it is said to them, this by the way, this, this is section 4. And in section, it's the smallest section, it's just three ayahs. That's all it is. So we're gonna get four and five done now, inshallah, hopefully. Okay. And in this section, just three ayahs, you know what we're gonna learn about? People who just refuse to think. They just refuse to think. You know why this section is important? Because right now we are in section four. So how many sections have come before? Three. The first section called attention to revelation. The second section called attention to history. And the third section called attention to the world around us. Yes? And so all three of those are ways by which you can think. You can think. And now we're going to get to a passage, this section, where people just refuse to think. That's their criticism now. This is, the, this is Allah's statement about them. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ When it is said to them, اِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ Why don't you have caution? Why don't you have caution and protect yourselves from what is in front of you and what is behind you? لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So you can be shown mercy. Is this the first time you're learning about being taking into consideration what is in front of you and what is behind you? No. Allah already said there's a wall in front and wall in the back. What did I say the wall in the front meant? What does it signify? So Allah is saying, why don't you take heed based on the world you see around you? And if not that, why don't you take heed based on the lessons you may have learned from? History, it's almost like saying, when it is said to them, pay attention to section 2 and section 3, so that you can be shown mercy. Now, you know, when you say this to someone, think about this. When it is said to them this, what do you expect the next part to be? When, it is, when this is said to them, they respond, right? That's what you expect. But you know what's incredible? There is no response. It's left. It is as though when it is said to them, take heed, take precaution based on what is in front of you, right in front of you, and what is way behind you, so that you may be shown mercy. Dot, 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 dot. There's no answer. You know what that means, right? They have nothing to say. They just have nothing to say. And that's the most epic way of capturing how little they think. They have no answer. It's just left unanswered. And so when that is left unanswered, Allah moves on and says, وَمَا يَأْتِيهِم مِّنْ آيَةٍ مِّنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ And there's not a single ayah from among all of the ayat of their master. By the way, what is an ayah? A sign, a, sign, a miracle. There's not a single ayah of any of the ayat of their Rabb, إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ Except all they do for that, those ayat is that they ignore them deliberately. They ignore them. By the way, ayat of Allah. The creation are ayat of Allah. History is ayat of Allah. But what else is the ayat of Allah? Revelation. So in the first, two, the first ayah here, they've already been told you should consider the, the, the world around you and history. And now they're being told you should also think about the ayat. But no matter what ayat come to them, what revelation might even come to them, they still continue to ignore it. So all three doors to the truth have done them no good. They've just done nothing for them. Now, if you think about these words, moving forward, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا When it is said to them, spend. Hmm, this is different. This is the first time people are actually being told to do something. Not believe something, not accept something conceptually, but actually do something. This is the only doing command in the, Quran, in the surah. Follow, other than ittabi'u al follow the prophets. Right? But even following them meant believing in them. But here, listen carefully, when it is said to them, spend from what Allah has provided to all of you. Anfiqu mimma razaqakumullah. Spend from what Allah has provided to all of you. Did the ayah say spend on who and spend on what? Nope. It just said spend. It said spend because it's supposed to be clear for someone who's using their intellect to understand. Spend on the people that need it. <coughs> spend where it deserves to be spent. There are good causes to spend. And when prophets talk about spending, by the way, in Mecca, there's no masjid being built. There's no masjid Nabawi fundraiser yet. There isn't. So when the ayat are coming to spend, 
from what Allah provided you, who are you supposed to spend it on? This is an important question. You're supposed to be spending it on the orphan, the poor, the needy, the injured. But are these orphans and poor and needy and injured, are they Muslim or non-Muslim? In Mecca, who are they? They're non-Muslims. Quran is coming and telling these people to spend on their own people. Take care of your own society. Do we do that? Do we consider that the Quran might be telling people to take care of their own community? No, no questions yet. So now, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا the, believe, the disbelievers said to those who believe, those who disbelieved, responded to those who believe. Wait, last time did they respond or no? When it was said to them, why don't you take caution? No response. When it said to them, why don't you spend? They immediately responded. No. أَنُطْعِمُوا مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَا Should we feed someone? Had Allah wanted, He would have fed him Himself. إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضُلَالِ مُبِينَ You people are nothing but confused, obviously confused. Go don't waste our time. When you talk about faith, when you talk about belief in a God, when you talk about the afterlife, they don't even care to respond. When you question their spending, they get upset. Because that hits too close to home. Some ideas about belief and afterlife, and that's all philosophical stuff to them. That's hocus pocus, fine, whatever, who cares. You criticize their money, their bottom line, they flare up and say, excuse me? You want me to spend? So we're learning here that there are practical reasons to reject Islam. They're not necessarily rejecting the ideas of Islam because they find it hard to believe that there's a revelation or hard to believe that you know, there's a God or etc. Cetera, et cetera. What's really hard to accept is that I might have to make some practical changes. Like I might have to spend where I don't normally spend. Money is a big problem. Thank you for turning light on. That really helped. I would say this all the time, it just got way too romantic in here. It's just, uh, just, you know. Works every time. Okay. Every time. Ha <laughs> ha, romantic. Ha <laughs> ha. Love that word. Okay. You know what does it mean when they say, if, we, if Allah wanted, He would have fed them, why should we feed them? Some people say this means they question it from predestination, right? If Allah willed it, it would have happened. But actually there's more going on here. What's going on here is, excuse me, you keep telling me about this God who provides everyone, who provides all the fruits, and provides all the trees, and provides all the, you know, the ships that sail in the ocean. He does all this stuff, he can't feed these poor people himself? Go ask him yourself. You guys are obviously confused. This is the height of arrogance. This is the height of arrogance. And in these three ayat, Allah has basically told us, there are two ranges left. First of all, they have no answer. Second of all, they ignore everything you tell them. And if they do respond, they respond in the most obnoxious, arrogant, insubordinate kind of way. You know, with no discretion at all. This is now what you're dealing with. And now instead of you asking them, it is their turn to speak, which, is, which leads us to our fifth section. وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ They say, when is this promise coming? This promise you keep telling us there's coming. When is it? If in fact you're telling the truth. What promise are they talking about? The warnings. Now I want to remind you of something. Warnings are in three stages. Please remember this. This is one of those really, really important things. Warnings are of three kinds. The first warning in the Qur'an is the destruction of a nation. Nation shall be destroyed. The people of Nuh shall be flooded. The people of Nuh shall have fire rained on them from the sky, etc, etc. The first warning is what? The destruction of a nation. The second warning is judgment day. That's the second warning, judgment day. What was the first one? See if you are still awake. Destruction of nation. Second one? Judgment day. Third one, hellfire. One, two, three. Walk me through it again. What was the first one? Destruction, Destruction of nations. Second one? Judgment. Judgment day? Hellfire. And all three of them are related. In other words, if you are one of those nations that get destroyed here, then you're going to really take a beating when? Judgment day. And that's going to feel like a vacation compared to? Hellfire. So all of that is really part of one promise. Why did you turn the lights off? Oh, anyway. 
Not going there again. Oh, God. Stop it. She already said no. <laughs> okay. You're not going to look any better in lesser light. It's not, it's not, it's not going to. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I got to go back to Quran now. Okay. Gotta, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> this promise, when is it going to happen? Are you serious? Go ahead then. You know what? Why don't you bring it? Why don't you let it happen? By the way, in the previous ayah, just now they said, if Allah is so wealthy, He can take care of poor people Himself. Didn't they basically say that? Now there's another surah in the Quran that says that. They say, Inna Allah faqirun wa nahnu aghniya. Allah is bankrupt, we are rich. Allah says, Sanaktubu ma qalu. We will write down what they say. One of the very unique statements in the Quran, Allah will write down what they say. Write down what they say, when they say what? That Allah is poor and they are rich. And they basically said something like that here. And this is why in this surah, uniquely you find, وَنَكْتُبُوا مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ We write down what they sent forward and the wake they leave behind. This was worthy enough of a crime. What, what, is, what is so bad that Allah is going to write down? He already talked about the writing down ahead of time because something worthy of being documented and then thrown in their face like no other has been said. But you know what? Even though they said such a horrendous thing, such a terrible thing, saying when is this promise coming, or actually saying if Allah wanted He would have fed. In this time, Allah already prepared the Prophet ﷺ that they will be saying outrageous things that are worthy of writing down, so they can really be punished for them. So Allah said it in the beginning, نَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ فَمَا قَدَّمُوهُ هُنَا What they actually wanted to send forward is actually here. Now, they asked this obnoxious question, and this is the height of Allah's anger with them, so now it's gonna begin. The first phase is going to be the destruction of nation. مَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً And this means two things. It means they're not waiting for anything except a single explosion. It also means they're not going to get to see anything except one single explosion. تَأْخُذُهُمْ That is going to grab them. وَهُمْ يَخِصِّمُونَ While they're going to be casually making arguments with each other. They're going to be talking about Allah and what He's going to do and what He's going to do. Where's your God? Yeah, punishment. Yeah, scared. I'm really scared right now. They're going to be making sarcastic jokes. إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ They're going to be making jokes and fun out of it. And in the middle of their casual conversations, a single explosion will grab them. But this is not the first time Allah talked about a single explosion, is it? When Allah talked about the lesson from history with the nation that got three prophets, and then it also got a, a believer in that nation, didn't He say, in كَانَتِ illa صَيْحَةً wahidatan, فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ It was nothing but one single explosion. Allah says, that is no longer a lesson from history, that might just become your future. I'll make that history repeat itself. I don't just tell history to tell stories, Allah is telling us. وَهُمْ يَخِصِّمُونَ They're going to be in the middle of a, uh, just whatever conversation, you know, uh, questioning each other. And by the way, why did that nation get killed? You remember? What brought it on? What was the last thing that kind of just did it? They killed a believer. But now for Quraysh, the fact that they're questioning Judgment Day in such an obnoxious way is enough. Even if they haven't killed anyone yet. That alone is enough. That Allah says, I might just take them out right now. فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ تَوْسِيَةً And if I do so, they're not going to be able to leave any will. Tawsiya is used to leave a will. Tawsiya in the Qur'an is also used to give good advice. To leave a will and to give good advice. Both of them. Now who do you leave a will for? Tell me. Call it out. Your kids. Your kids who you have a lot of hopes for, for their future, which is why you put them onto ships. Not too long ago. Now Allah says, I will give you an explosion, and in the middle of your discussions, you're gonna be wiped out, you're not even gonna have a chance to run over and give your kids some good advice. They're not gonna be capable of leaving a will. And they're not even gonna be capable of going and telling them, kids, protect yourselves. I, may, I messed up and Allah got me, but He better not get you. No more. And they're not going to be going back to their families. 
So this idea of hamalna dhurriyatahum, you know, the, to, to put hopes in your children, is now being reinforced. وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ so that was the destruction of the nation. One explosion, they're all going to be wiped out. They won't even have a chance to warn their family or say their final goodbyes. They won't get that chance. Then the next, immediately next thing, Next thing you know, the trumpet is being blown into. The horn is being blown into. It is blown into the horn, literally is the translation. It, something indescribable, is blown into the horn. فَإِذَا هُمْ مِنَ الْأَجْدَاثِ Then all of a sudden, from unmarked graves, إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَنْسِلُونَ They come running, all generation after generation. يَنْسِلُونَ means to rush. أَسْرَعَ إِلَىٰ مَكَانٍ نَسَلَ To rush, but it also has to do with نَسِل. In other words, their multiple generations are going to be running together towards their Rabb. Allah already described this before when He finished the lesson from history, when He said all of them are going to be gathered together. And now he says all of their generations are going to be gathered together. And he already mentions that they're going to be in ajdath, not qubur. Qubur means graves. Ajdath, actually jadath means an unmarked grave. You're walking over it, you don't even know there's a guy buried there. That's how forgotten you people will be if I take you out. And then you'll be running towards, they'll be running towards their master. Qalu ya waylana. So they wake up on judgment day. They come out of these unmarked graves and they're running towards their Rabb. Right now they were running away from their Rabb. And now they're running towards their Rabb because they don't have a choice anymore. And they wake up. When they wake up from these graves, say, this is such an epic thing. They say, Ya Wailana, oh, this couldn't possibly get any worse. Wail, aswa ama yumkin min al adab. The worst possible thing from, of all punishments. So when they wake up and they see the beginning of Judgment Day, they say, this could not be any worse, I cannot imagine. Could it be worse though? Oh, it hasn't even started yet, homie. Party just getting started. مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا Who woke us up from our sleep? From the place we slept and the time we slept. They literally say, who woke us up from our sleep? You know why that's significant? Because messengers came to wake people up from their sleep. But people were completely unaware. Because when you're unaware, you're ghafil. And a ghafil person is like a person who's sleeping. And a person who's sleeping is like a person who's dead. That's already been established before. So this is not the first time you're being woken up, this is the second time. The first time you were being woken up by the messengers of Allah, this time you're being woken up by Allah Himself. That's the difference. So they say, who woke us up? And they say who woke us up because everybody who tried to wake them up before didn't succeed. So who is this power that is able to wake us up now? مِن مَرْقَدِنَا هَذَا مَا وَحَدَ الرَّحْمَانِ This is what Ar-Rahman promised. They use the word Ar-Rahman because the messengers used to call them to Ar-Rahman because they used to make fun of Ar-Rahman. But you know what? Now we're learning that they learned, they listened to the message really, really well. So well, that when they wake up on Judgment Day, they remember all the promises that the messengers made, and they can see, connect the dots themselves, and say, this is exactly what Ar-Rahman promised. وَصَدَقَ mursalun, And those that were sent were all actually telling the truth? Which means you knew. Which means you heard it well enough to be able to review it right now. Hey, this is exactly what they said. Oh no. Now Allah Azza wa Jal takes us further. إِنْ كَانَتِ اللَّهِ صَيْحَةً وَاحِدًا They just come out, they're running, and all of a sudden there's another explosion. فَإِذَا هُمْ جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضَرُونَ Then all of a sudden they are all standing, made to present themselves before us. Criminals have now all been gathered together. This was mentioned at the end of the destruction of that historical nation. Now it's being mentioned as you guys are going to line up too. You're going to line up too. You're also going to be standing before this, before your Rabb. All lined up together. Muhdar in Arabic means someone who is made to present their case. Ahdara to bring. Uhdira, the one who is brought. He has to have hudur. He has to be, in Urdu say, hazir hona. Jiski hazri lagai jaye. Okay, I now understand it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so now. You are presented before Allah, and Allah will now address all of these people. These terrified criminals who used to make fun of Ar-Rahman are now in front of Ar-Rahman. They're just—they're talking direct. Allah is talking directly to them, and He says to them, 
فاليوم, today, today then, لا تظلم نفس شيئا. Nobody will be done any kind of wrong. Nobody will be charged of a crime they did not commit. Nobody will be done more harm than they actually did because we have a perfect record of everything you did. So there's no possibility of any wrongdoing. Wait, where is that record? وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ We write down everything they send for their future and all the, the impact they leave behind them. And we've recorded everything in an open, clear book. So there's no possibility of you doing any wrong. It's a review of that ayah. وَلَا تُجْزَوْنَا إِلَّا مَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ You are not going to be paid anything except the very things you used to do yourselves. You're going to be paid in full what you used to do. Having said this, Allah switches over. Okay, this is you. You don't need to know what's, what's going to happen with them now. Those guys. There may be other things happening with them, but Allah puts that, hits a pause button on them. Meantime, let me take you to the believer. Inna ashab al al yawma fi shughulin fakihun. I'm going to spend some time on this ayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching these videos. If you'd like to continue to support Quran Weekly, please click the link in this video. Let me take you to the believer. إِنَّ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ الْيَوْمَ فِي شُغُلٍ فَاكِهُونَ I'm going to spend some time on this ayah. There's no doubt about it, people. The companions of Jannah, may Allah make each and every one of us and all the Muslims and people from them. The people of Jannah, the companions of Jannah. Today, إِنَّ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ الْيَوْمَ Today, فِي شُغُلٍ فَاكِهُونَ They are in very busy activities. They're doing all kinds of stuff. So if you imagine Jannah is going to be boring, I guess it's a really pretty place when you just sit there. You know, especially because I come from a Pakistani background, I have problems imagining Jannah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why. Because in Pakistani culture, if you live in a really, really nice house, that means you have all this exotic crystal, handmade, crafted stuff in random places in your house that's supposed to be an obstacle course for normal human beings. So if you sit, you have to sit like, a, like, a, like you're almost like at gunpoint, like. <laughs> because if you enjoy yourself on a couch too much, you'll tip over something or break a crystal or the, the, you know, the goose thing that your mom bought or whatever. <laughs> you know, so you have to like really like, you know. And then when, when kids have too much fun, oh, the look you should see the mom give them. <laughs> like little Kareem is running around because his friend came over, but she can't yell at him in front of the guests. Because that's like haram. <laughs> so she does this like the angry look masked by the artificial smile, <laughs> captured with grinding teeth. And she says, Kareem bete, can I talk to you in the kitchen? <laughs> it's so awesome. So when you, so when I think of like a nice place, I feel like I should be really uncomfortable here. <laughs> <laughs> but Quran says you're going to be in Jannah, you're going to be doing all kinds of crazy activities. I don't know, I should comment one more thing about my wonderful culture, Pakistan. I love Pakistan. I should say one more thing. You know what we do with kids? Make sure they're not happy. <laughs> if a kid is having a great time, he's like, yes, and he's playing with a toy, the mom will come, Zarab, insan banengi thodi der ke liye? Can you be a human for a little while? Like, He's just being a kid. He's just happy. What? What do you want him to like become a librarian right now? Like, what? Why are you so? <laughs> Let him be a kid. God, this is totally the exa exact opposite of Arab kids. Arab kids can do whatever they want. Whatever they want. I mean, seriously, you guys, you Arabs. I mean, man, your kids are afraid of nothing. <laughs> nothing. You can't tell an Arab kid, I'm going to tell your dad. He goes, okay, I'll give you the number. <laughs> like, he's like, he's like, <laughs> he's like, uh, nothing. Anyway, anyway, I got to get back to this. So, 
The people of Jannah are going to be in all kinds of activities. Shogulin, busy activities. They're just hanging out, they're doing their having a party over here, they're playing a game over there. And then he says, Fakihun, and they're going to be overjoyed, laughing, having the best time of their life. Fakiha is actually a fruit, but a tasty fruit. When you eat it, it puts a smile on your face. And so Allah says these activities are constantly going to be making you smile. There's not going to be a single activity where you go, <sighs> you know when you play games at home or whatever, eventually you just go, oh, okay, I, I, guys, that's enough. That's enough. There's a moment where you're really enjoying it and then it just kind of dies down. You know, and you don't know when to stop. And you realize it's really gone too far and you're really bored out of your mind now, really should stop. You're just waiting for the first person to leave the party. So you really don't want to be the first one. So you wait for them to leave. Okay, I think I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> you know, that's what you do. But in Jannah, it's just going to be a party. And people are just happy, on top of happy, on top of happy. Fi shughulin faqihun. You know why? Because their book is overlooked. You know, naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharahum. What does Allah say about the people of Jannah? Hisaban yasira. His, his audit is easy. Allah doesn't even check it item by item. And in this dunya, activities are supposed to exhaust, but in Jannah it's going to be beautiful. Hum wa azwajuhum, uh oh, this part is a little PG 13, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> they and their spouses. But azwaj could also mean groups they belong with, people they want to hang out with. But this is actually referring to spouses. They and their spouses are going to be fi ghilalin, they are going to be in shades. Alal araiki on top of couches. This is actually, if some of you are familiar, like Victorian kind of furniture, old school furniture, where you have beds and you have bed posts and you have these curtains that drape over the bed, making it a little, you know, exotic or you know whatever. That's where they're going to be chilling with their with their girl. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. And Allah says muttaqiun. They're going to be chill, leaning back, relaxing, but not sleeping. A bed is for sleeping, but they're not sleeping. They're not sleeping because in Jannah there is no what? There's no sleep. Allah doesn't want you to miss a moment of joy, a moment of happiness. By the way, this scene would make no sense if you don't know what I'm talking about in dunya. I don't have to spell the rest of this out. Goodbye, I'm going to move forward. Okay, lahum fiha faqihatun wa lahum ma yadda'un. In it, meaning even sitting in bed. You get hungry when you're sitting in bed. What happens? Where do you go? The kitchen. What Allah says, they will have in it, those beds, around, right around the beds, they'll have all kinds of fruit. It's right there. You don't even have to get up. And you can eat in bed. <laughs> Sisters don't appreciate that, it's okay. You can eat in bed and the strawberry can leak over on the chadar that you just got washed. And it doesn't stain. <laughs> That's Jannah. That's Jannah. I tell you, that is, that's what I want in Jannah. I want to eat on a bed. <laughs> and I want to eat the greasiest food with the most solid stains. I'm going to like... <laughs> Nothing! <laughs> they're going to have all kinds of fruit. And they're going to have whatever orders they place. Whatever they ask for. You're in Jannah. Allah gave you everything. You're like, I don't know, I feel bad, I should ask. We guys just have some taqalluf, you know? You don't go to somebody's house, they take care of you, they give you food, they give you like kebabs and chicken and whatever. You're like, do you have any ketchup? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's such a batamese thing to do. You know, I do it personally, actually I do it. But uh, it's such a bad thing to do. But in Jannah, there is no hesitation. You can actually ask Allah, Ya Allah, I was thinking, uh, there was this ayah where you mentioned uh, birds. <laughs> can I just kind of, yeah, sure, here. <laughs> and it just, it arrives to you. You're being served. Every, everything you can order, everything you can ask for, it's just immediate room service. You don't even have to call zero and wait or nothing. <laughs> this is the scene in Jannah. And then, it just gets epic on top of epic. All these rewards combined, are pale in comparison. لا شيء فوق هذا سلام قولا من رب الرحيم. Salam, salutation, peace, some kind of peace. It's, by the way, it doesn't say as-salam. It says salam, which means it is unknown. This kind of salam is not known. It's not the kind of salam you can ever know. Not until you get there. This is the word قولا من رب الرحيم, a word from a master who's always been loving, merciful.
By the way, those who made it to Jannah, we have, been, we have seen some people right now who are worthy of Jannah in the surah. Messengers are worthy of Jannah. Their few followers are worthy of Jannah. The one who was killed, remember him? Worthy of Jannah. Did they go through an easy life or a hard life? They went through an extremely hard life. And Allah says He's always been Rabb bin Rahim. A Rabb who's always been merciful and loving. He made all those difficulties easy for them. Even in dunya. Even in dunya. He's the one who facilitated the path for them. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Those who struggle for us, we open up doorways for them. We guide them to our different multiple pathways. Allah is the one who made the hardest struggles easy for people. He made the fire cool for Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, the fire doesn't get cool on its own. Allah does that. So he was always, and so now he says, Salam, I was the one supporting you all along. I was rooting for you all along. There's nothing more that can be said. It's so perfect that the conversation about Jannah just came to an end because where do you go from there? Where do you, you can't go anywhere from here. So now we're back in the scene that was hit pause on. Where, where did we pause? No, in resurrection. And they said, this is what Ar-Rahman promised. And the messengers were speaking the truth. And they're all going to be brought before. And they were told, today nobody will be wronged. You will only be given what you, were, what you worked for. Remember that? And then immediately, you know, you guys watch movies. No, of course you don't. You're in Houston. You're so religious. But some of you who are from like Oklahoma who watch movies, <laughs> the, you know, there's, this, there's two scenes happening. And you go into one scene, you cut out, you go to the other scene, then you cut out, you go back to the first scene. Now we're going to go back to that first scene where meanwhile, you were being told you're only going to be given what you were, what you worked for. Now he says, وَمْتَازُ الْيَوْمَ أَيُّهَا الْمُجْرِمُونَ Can separate yourselves today, criminals. Be, be distinct today, criminals. You cannot mix with people anymore. Why did he say that? Because among them may have been people, خَشِيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بالغيب. He feared Ar-Rahman in the unseen. In this dunya, you couldn't tell the believer from the disbeliever sometimes. Maybe some people had iman inside of them but never told anybody. They only obeyed Allah and worshipped Allah in private. Without ever letting anybody know. Nobody will ever know them except Allah. And today on Judgment Day, when the entire nation is raised, Allah says, separate yourselves. And some people are surprised, what? Why is he going on a nice side? And they won't even know why. Only Allah knows those people. وَمْتَازُوا الْيَوْمَ أَيُّهَا الْمُجْرِمُونَ Criminals, separate yourselves. Now, as Allah will speak to them, Allah is also speaking to them, He gives them His final speech. أَلَمْ أَعْهَدْ إِلَيْكُمْ يَا بَنِي آدَمْ Didn't we take a promise from you, children of Adam? أَلَّا تَعْبُدُ الشَّيْطَانِ That you should not be worshipping shaitan. Actually, the promise was to not obey shaitan or to not listen to shaitan. But here it takes another form. And Allah says that you won't be worshipping shaitan. What are we learning? That to Allah, when somebody listens to shaitan and gives up all hopes of guidance and ignores all pathways to truth, then that is no different than the worship of shaitan. That is the worship of shaitan. إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ No doubt about it. He is to you an obvious enemy. You know what we're learning here that's also really, really important. Really, really important is that when you refuse to use your mind to understand the world around you and history and revelation, and you, you block yourself from all three of those, then you are at the mercy of shaitan. Then you don't even know it, but you're worshiping him. That's what he wants. He wants the human being not to be able to use his mind properly. So he never finds his way. Because you can't find your way if you don't use your mind. Didn't I tell you to worship me? هَذَا صِرَاتٌ مُسْتَقِيمٌ that, that is a straight path. Wait, this is the first time straight path came up? When did straight path come up? Do you remember? Right in the beginning. Messengers and the Prophet ﷺ are all committed to a... Okay, this is so beautiful. Because when, they were, when we were told that they, are, they were committed to a straight path, some people might have thought, yeah, wonderful. They're committed to a straight path. How am I supposed to do that? And their straight path is so hard. Didn't I describe it as really hard? It gets harder and harder and harder. How is a normal person supposed to do that? And Allah at the end of it all says, actually what I asked for the messengers, I asked you for so much less. All I asked you was worship me. This is the straight path. This is a straight path. There was nothing more. I didn't ask you for much. Messengers came. Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ 
Allah, Allah wants to lighten your burden. He wants you to have an easier life. That's what He says. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Allah wants ease for you. He doesn't want difficulty for you. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجِ He didn't put any burden or constriction or discomfort in the religion for you. You know who makes religion uncomfortable? People do. People do. Allah makes ease in the religion. We make difficulty in the religion. I've learned that the hard way. Man, I'm so grateful for my, I consider my most valuable risk in this world is my students and my teachers. I consider them my most valuable risk. And my, my, my teachers, including especially Dr. Akram Adwi, may Allah protect him. He's, Wallahi al-Azim, every time I study with him, every time I sit with him, I go through a hadith with him, I go through ayat with him. I feel like I just took shahada. There are things I've learned, I thought I knew about Islam my entire life, and I sit there and I learn them from him, and I'm like, whoa, I did not know that. And it just makes sense, and it's so much easier. And people made it so ugly and difficult. You know? And I, I'll tell you about Dr. Akram later. Any, anybody know about Dr. Akram? Hmm? Like three people? Okay, good. You should, you should know about Dr. Akram. Write that name down. Akram Nadwi. A-K-R-A-M. Akram Nadwi. That's how you say it in Siri. Nadwi. N-A-D-A-W-Y. Or N-A-D-W-I also. Okay. Anyway, just worship me. It's simple. This is a straight path. That's all there is to it. وَلَقَدْ أَضَلَّ مِنْكُمْ جِبِلًّا كَثِيرًا He was certainly able to misguide a huge population. الْعَدَدَ الْكَثِيرَ الْجِبِلْ A huge mountainous quantity of you he was able to mislead. أَفَلَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْقِلُونَ Why were you never people that used to think? Why didn't you ever exercise your minds? This is taking us back to the three things we should be thinking about. I won't repeat them anymore. You guys know them now. Why didn't you ever exercise your mind? How did shaitan get to you? That's why I said shaitan's job is to stop you from thinking. Yeah? And by the way, this idea that he was able to get so many is not the first time we're learning in the surah. Allah already said, Ya hasratan ila al-ibad ma yatihim al-rasul. What a tragedy for people. Every time messengers come, they make fun of them. Who inspires them to make fun of messengers? Shaitan. وَمَا يَأْتِيهِم مِّنْ آيَةٍ مِّنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ Not a single miracle comes to them. They continue to ignore it. Who tells them to ignore it? Shaitan. He's always been there. You could fight him. It's easy. Just use your brain and you can fight him. Just use your mind properly and you can fight him. But submit to your desires and submit to your animal self and you're going to worship him. That's what you're going to do. So this, this now, أَفَلَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْقِلُونَ Why weren't you people that used to think? It's so powerful to me that Allah is saying the road to Jannah is for people who think. And today in, Muslim, in the Muslim world, we don't emphasize thinking. We ask people to just do and not think. And the Qur'an complains from the beginning to the end, why don't you think? People are being dragged into Jahannam, and they're saying, لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا if we only heard and we thought, we understood, we wouldn't be here. You know? We, we, our job is to become people of thought. This is actually, that's all I want to do. That's all I want to do is just to, if I could encourage myself, my family, Muslims, to just think about the word of Allah. Think about their life. Think about what they're doing. Just think, just think. With a clear mind. Everything can change. Everything can change. Allah says these ayat, لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ For people that are trying to think. These are ayat that are beneficial for people who try to think. In other words, if you don't try to think, this is of no benefit to you. This is what we must become. Unfortunately, now we've reduced ourselves to a culture. It's so deteriorated that when some child asks a question, why did Allah say that? How come this is this way? Why do we have to pray five times? Why do we have to do this? Why do we have... Because he's thinking. He's thinking, so he asked a question. And what do we do? Astaghfirullah, tawbah, 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 tawbah. You know, like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on, dude. This is an opportunity for you to engage these kids. We're supposed to be asking questions. We're supposed to be answering questions. This is the way of learning. We're not supposed to discourage questions. Questions are the, way, are the road to opening up minds. 
So this is, I mean, it's a, it's a subject on its own, but I want you to understand, هَذِهِ جَهَنَّمُ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ This is the hell that you have all been promised. Was the hellfire promised to them? Yeah. يَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ They say, when is this promise going to happen? Well, here it is. You asked for the promise, right? Here you have it. Have it your way. إِسْلَوْهَ الْيَوْمْ Throw yourselves into it today. بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ Because of the denial you used to do all along. By the way, throwing yourselves, being cast into Jahannam is like being cast into prison, yes? Which means this is the second prison. The first prison was? Chain, refuse to think. Remember that one? When you refuse to think there, you get this Jahannam over here. That's again the idea of thought. Dunya, the dunya prison and then the akhirah prison. الْيَوْمَ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ Today, we will put a seal on their mouths. Their mouths will not be able to say anything. Do you remember the section, section 4, in which they didn't use their minds properly? They refused to think. When they were first told, why don't you have taqwa, they had no answer. When you give them all kinds of miraculous evidence, they ignored it. When you told them to spend, they gave the worst answer. So they're, the best of it, they have no answer. And the worst of it, they gave terrible answers. Which means their mouths no longer deserve to be used. Their mouth is sealed. أَيْدِيهِمْ Their hands start talking to us. وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ And their feet start testifying. بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Of the things they used to earn. You know what the, hand, the hands testify. Other place in the Qur'an. لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا Why are you testifying against us? This guy, I own this body right now. Allah has given me, I rent this body right now. Free charge. Judgment day comes, and Allah Azza wa Jal resurrects this body, but it's no longer under my control. So I try to move my mouth, doesn't move. Then this is enabled to speak, and the legs are enabled to speak. And they start complaining to Allah, Ya Allah, you created me and me, and everything you create submits to you. But you temporarily gave this guy control. And because he had control, he made me disobey you. The feet will say, he made me disobey you. And this day I disobeyed you this way, I'm so sorry. And then I disobeyed you again. But I didn't have a choice because you gave him control. And you're standing there going... Because there's no worse testimony than yourself. There was nobody, no, no one's a better witness to what you and I did than our own hands and our feet. I mean, that's... Pretty hardcore evidence. You know, previously we learned that if you're going to be thrown into a prison, the crime should be proven. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ Then they're thrown in prison. At the end of the surah, we're learning that again. If they're going to be thrown into prison, the crime should be proven. How do you prove it? Who are the witnesses? You yourself are a witness. كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ شَهِيدًا Today you're enough as a witness against your own self. May Allah Azza protect us from that testimony. Now, وَلَوْ نَشَاءُ By the way, that's judgment day. But even now, even now, we're back to this world again. وَلَوْ نَشَاءُ لَطَمَسْنَا عَلَىٰ أَعْيُنِهِمْ We would wipe out their eyes. We could wipe out their eyes. فَاسْتَبَقُوا السِّرَاتِ Then they would be competing to find the path. فَأَنَّا يُبْصِرُونَ Then how could they see? This is a strange statement. You have to think about what it means. Let me translate it again for you. Had we wanted, we would have obliterated, wiped out their eyes. Then they would have competed towards the path. They would have raced towards the path. But then how could they see? Or how would they see? Let me tell you what this impl implies. You need to understand the cancer of the worst disbeliever. You know the one who's covered from every side that we keep talking about? You know what his cancer is? He's not going to believe. But I did tell you eventually he will believe. Does anyone remember what I said about eventually he will believe? When? When he sees punishment. This one will not believe until he sees punishment. So now, this disbeliever, Allah shows him punishment. He takes out his eyes. He wipes out his eyes. Now that he sees the punishment, he's ready to believe. So he'll compete towards the path. But what's the point now? You can't know where to go. You understand? So this is actually describing how hopeless they are until they see the punishment. The other way to look at it, some ulama have looked at it, and I find that appealing too, is that, you know, if you really want an excuse that there was no reason for you to come to guidance, there was no way you could have understood. Okay, maybe you're not ed educated, so you don't know about history. Maybe you didn't know about any prophet, so you don't know about what comes from above. 
possible. It's possible I have no access to an education in history, and I have no access to access in Revelation. But there's one thing I still have access to. What is that? The world around me. I could see the truth around me, the creation around me. I could have at least, you know, uh, you know, pondered on that. Allah says, had I just wiped their eyes out, had I wiped their eyes out, then even if they tried to compete towards the path, they wouldn't have been able to see. Maybe then they would have had an excuse. Maybe then. Because they could say, how could they see? But they don't have an excuse. They have fully functioning eyes. وَلَوْ نَشَاءُ And had we wanted, لَمَسَخْنَاهُمْ عَلَى مَكَانَتِهِمْ We could have mutilated their bodies where they stand. We could have broken their arms and messed up their faces and ripped off their ears, etc., etc. Where they stand. فَمَا اسْتَطَاعُوا مُضِيًّا وَلَا يَرْجِعُونَ And they wouldn't be able to move forward and they wouldn't be able to come back. Allah is saying, I don't have to wait till judgment day, I can take you out right now. And you know, He said before, He could take them out with one blow. But now He's saying, you know, there are other options. I could turn you blind and then start ripping your body apart piece by piece. I could do that. Then see what happens to you. Because you keep saying, oh, we're not going to come back again. Yeah, you're not going to come back from that one. You won't come back from that one. So you, you know what I find remarkable about this? This, wallahu a'lam, seems to me is Allah's way of responding to the threats. You know the messengers were threatened? If you don't stop, we're going to stone you to death or torture you in some terrible, terrible way. Oh, you think you can, you're the only one who can issue threats? I can give threats too. And they don't have to wait till the akhirah. They don't have to wait till the afterlife. I can give you a threat right now. And so he says he could take out their eyes or obliterate their faces or mutilate them and they won't be able to come back from it. And finally in this ayah, the, my favorite ayah of this entire surah I think. وَمَن نُعَمِّرْهُ نُنَكِّسْهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ أَفَلَا يَعْقِلُونَ And whoever we would give old age to, we would start breaking them down in creation. In the previous ayah Allah said he might mutilate your bodies, yes? He might mutilate their bodies. But you don't have to wait to believe that he might mutilate your bodies. Your bodies are falling apart as you age anyway. A sign of that eventual mutilation is already happening every day as your body deteriorates as you age older and older and older. Whoever we give old age, we start reversing them in their creation. Imam al-Alusi said something so beautiful about this. It's always stuck in my head for years. I think I studied it like 15 years ago. He said that when a child is little, he does this. Uh. Always looking where? Kids are like this and their necks are like this. You ever notice that? They're always looking up, trying to climb something, you know, pull something down, wanting to be picked up. Just up, 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 up. Then a man gets really old. What happens to his back? And he's always looking where? A child was looking towards his growth and a man is looking towards his final home all the time. He's looking at the dirt all the time. That's where he's headed. Allah has already made it easy for him to remember. He bends his back down. He starts deteriorating him in creation. Subhanallah. Afala yaqilun. Why don't they know? Another way of looking at this ayah that's been very powerful for me to appreciate is that as people get much older, they actually start developing habits like children. People can get easily upset as they get older. They can get more dependent, their health deteriorates, so you, they can't go and clean themselves or dress themselves, etc. They need help with that. They can't feed themselves anymore. They can't go around themselves, which is the same disability as what? Children. Children. They become like that, and that's the age they reach. So he returns to a state where he knows nothing after having known something. Dementia hits, you start forgetting stuff, you don't know the words anymore. You stutter in your speech, which used to be the case when? When you were little. Baby, don't you remember? Mm-mm. You know? That's your uncle, he's scary, etc. And then you meet an old man, and he forgets. I met a scholar, it scared me, it reminded me of this ayah, subhanAllah. I was traveling in a, in a taxi with him, um, and he said, Bita, how are you? I said, I'm very good, alhamdulillah. How's it going? MashaAllah, where are you from? I said, Dallas. A minute later, he goes, Bita, how are you? Alhamdulillah. How's it going? MashaAllah. Where are you from? Dallas. A minute later, Bita, how are you? Alhamdulillah. 
How's it going, mashallah? Where are you from, Dallas? Oh, mashallah, yeah, I like Dallas. Have we, have we met before? Yeah, I think so, we have. I didn't, like, startle him and say, you just asked me that. But he had a very severe case of, like, just immediate short-term memory loss. You know, just every five minutes we had the same conversation. And by the way, who has that? Who does that over and over again? Kids do that. Kids do that. Abba, can I have some chocolate? Can I have some chocolate? Can I have some chocolate? There's just like a... It's on the loop. There's an app for that or something. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching these videos. If you'd like to continue to support Quran Weekly, please click the link in this video. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Okay, I don't think I'll give you another break. I'm not in the mood. Okay, so we're just gonna like do this. All right. So we are in section six. Before I start, I just want to give you an overview of what we covered. The introduction was about the Quran and the people who refuse to respond to it. The second section was I forgot. I forgot. What kind of history? Do you remember what the, the... The town and the three messengers and that lone believer? Sure. That's section two. What was section three about? The world all around you and how you're supposed to think about what is right in front of you. And then section four was about the people who just... Refuse to think. What was section five about? They say that... There were, how many kinds of warnings are there in the Quran? What are they? Destruction. Destruction. Day of judgment. And in the middle of that conversation, Allah also mentioned some awesome stuff about Jannah. Right? But He put it in the middle of that warning, and then that, that passage came to an end. We are now in section 6. Section 6 is, you can just call it the concluding section. It's the conclusion. And in this conclusion, Allah will basically review all of the fundamental concepts that are covered in sections 1 through 5. In one way or another, one of those things will be repeated. Just so as you leave, you leave with a good review of these guiding lessons and principles that Allah has been giving throughout this beautiful surah. So we begin, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما علمناه الشعر وما ينبغي له We did not teach him poetry, and it doesn't fit him either. It's not becoming of him to do poetry. إن هو إلا ذكر وقرآن مبين it is nothing but a reminder. It is nothing but remembrance. <coughs> and a Qur'an that is absolutely clear. That is crystal clear. This is not the work of a human being or of a creative poet. It is rather the Qur'an. What is this a review of, guys? Where, where was that? Tanzeel al-Aziz al-Rahim wal-Qur'an al-Hakim innaka lamin al It was in the beginning, wasn't it? Now it's being repeat, repeated, but now this idea of we didn't teach him poetry. I want to say some things about this idea of poetry. You know, the Prophet ﷺ did not know poetry. He loved it though. He really liked it. Actually, he had companions who liked it, who were very good at it. Who was the Prophet, or rather, what was the Prophet compared to in this surah, and what were the companions compared to? Do you remember that the sun Allah said, it is not becoming of the sun to catch up to the moon? Remember that? La yam, you know, la shamsu yambaghi laha an tudrika al qawla. Yambaghi. And the only other time yambaghi is used is, wa ma allamnahu shi'ra wa ma yambaghi lah. We didn't teach him poetry, it doesn't fit him either. So the only two times the word yambaghi is used is for the sun and for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the siraj al munira. Subhanallah. Even that is correlated and corresponded. Because you're supposed to make that connection anyway. But it's done through the language also. Now, in this, in this beautiful depiction, we didn't teach him poetry, it doesn't fit him. Which means what fits the sun is not the same as what fits the moon. Which means what's appropriate for the Prophet is not the same as what is appropriate for the companions. The Prophet could not do any poetry. Allah did not let him learn it. He did not teach him it at all. But the, the companions were what? Very good at it. He used to love listening to poetry. 
One story sticks out in my mind because it has this ayah in it. The Prophet ﷺ used to try to memorize poetry. When he heard good poetry, he used to memorize it. Actually, in that sense, that's one of the, one of the qualities of the Prophet ﷺ that I get reminded of when I talk to my dad. My dad loves poetry, but he's terrible at remembering it. Remembering it. He cannot remember anything about poetry. He only knows like one poem. And he tells it to me every time. <laughs> every time. And he tells it, he, what I love about him is, he tells it to me in a way that he's really convinced that I'm going to be shocked by how it ends. <laughs> Can I tell you the poem? Okay, I'll tell you. It's in Urdu, sorry. For the rest of you, just make a stighar or something. <laughs> he says, Ek sher sunata hum, zara ghor se suniye. <laughs> That's all he ever does. <laughs> and then he chuckles and giggles and I think, like, That's kind of prophetic. That he just cannot, cannot remember poetry for the life of him. Anyway, so what happened was, in one of the, one of the battles in the Prophet's life, والسلام, there was a new Muslim. And this new Muslim used to be a tribe leader. Okay, so there's a battle and this Muslim used to be a tribe leader, right? And before Islam, the tribe leader is a big deal. And so if you go into battle and you win, who gets the most share? The tribe leader. But now he's just another Muslim. And when you go into battle as a Muslim, how much do you get? Equal share, as everybody else. So he used to get the big percentage, now he gets equal share. So he feels insulted. This tribe leader, even though he's Muslim, he feels insulted. So he basically makes poetry about how he's been humiliated. Okay? So he says, Uhintu al Akra wa Uyayna. Some part of his poetry, I was humiliated between the tribes of Akra and Uyayna. Akra and Uyayna are the two names of his tribes. So he says, between both of those tribes, my reputation has been destroyed because of Islam. Because of Islam. And when he makes this poetry, he's very good at poetry, so it spreads. But when Muslims hear this poetry, it starts hurting the morale of the army. So the Prophet ﷺ says, go pay him off, just give him some money. Because what he's, this poetry is hurting the Muslims. A few years later, the Prophet ﷺ saw this guy. He didn't see him face to face before, but he saw him finally. And the Prophet ﷺ said, weren't you the one who made that poem? And then the Prophet ﷺ tried to repeat the poem. And when he repeated the poem, he took Akra wa Uyayna, and he flipped it over and said, Uyayna wa Akra. Okay, so the two tribes, he flipped the names over. Does that matter in poetry? Yeah, because there's a musical rhythm to a poem, and if you don't keep up with the rhythm, it messes the whole thing up. It's not about the message, it's about the style, isn't it? So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was next to the Prophet And Abu Bakr is very good at poetry. So he kind of quietly kind of taps the Prophet and says, uh, Ya Rasulullah, it was bayna uh, al wa uyayna, not uyayna wa akra, it was the other way. And the Prophet said, what difference does it make? <laughs> now you don't say that to a poet. Yeah? What difference does it make? So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq says to the Prophet you know, Allah spoke the truth when he said, We didn't teach him poetry, it doesn't fit him either. <laughs> so anyway, Allah did not teach the Messenger والسلام, poetry at all. And it's not fitting of him, because he doesn't have time to talk about those things. He's got too much of a tight speech to talk about, the Hakim Qur'an itself. There's no time for him to do this. So now he says, in huwa illa dhikr, it is nothing but a reminder. You know, in huwa illa is a form of speech in the Qur'an that's really powerful. One of the most you know, universal definitions of the Qur'an is that it's a reminder. And the, the thing of a reminder, the, the, the reality of a reminder is something that needs to be repeated all the time. And you know in the Qur'an you learn, that reminder benefits the hearts. You know, the reminder is for the hearts. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al qulub. So dhikr is for the hearts. Okay? Aghfalna qalbahu an dhikrina. We made his heart remember our dhikr. So the first thing the Quran is, it's dhikr, which means it's supposed to affect your heart. But then he says, In huwa illa dhikrun wa Quranun mubin. It's a clear Quran. Now clarity is not something in the heart. Where's clarity? It's in the mind. So this, this recital is supposed to be spiritual and at the same time it's supposed to be 
intellectual. You know the idea of وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ Those two sides of it, again reviewed. In just, إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ وَقُرْآنٌ مُبِينَ لِيُنْذِرَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا So that he can warn, and so that the Qur'an can warn whoever has been alive. Obviously the Qur'an is there to warn someone who's alive, but we are learning something that is being reviewed from section 1. In section 1 Allah told us that inna nahnu nuhyi al-mawta, we give life to the dead. Remember that? And part of the meaning was he can give life to the dead hearts also. And at the end of it all he says, so that you can warn someone whose heart still has some life in it. Some good is still left in them. Man kana hayyan. وَيَحِقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ And the truth will become absolutely clear against the disbelievers. The word will become manifest against the disbelievers. يَحِقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ By the way, يَحِقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ This exact phrase came before when Allah said, لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى أَكْثَرِهِمْ He said it right in the beginning. Now he's reviewing it at the end. So that the word becomes absolutely true against the disbelievers. There is a second meaning of حَقَّ القول. I'll explain that to you too. When you become deserving of something, like if I say, I'm going to punish you, if I say to my, my son Walid, I'm going to punish you, I'm going to take your Legos away. And he says, okay, what am I not supposed to do? I say, if you don't go upstairs right now, I'm going to take your Legos away. And he doesn't go upstairs. Then I take the Legos away. And as I'm taking away, I say, لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَيْكَ The word became true for you. When I, the warning, became real. Okay? So haqq al-qawl doesn't just mean the truth has become clear to somebody or the words have become clear to somebody, but also means that they deserve what was warned. That they actually became worthy of that punishment. Okay? So now yahiq al-qawlu ala al-kafirin means so that the, even the disbelievers are absolutely, absolutely clear that this is the truth, even though they'll keep hiding it inside. And it also becomes clear that now they deserve the worst punishment. Wa yahiq al-qawlu ala al-kafirin. The question though is, that punishment, has Allah described it in the surah? It began with them being blocked off from all pathways to truth. And then it leads them to be a, dis a nation that gets destroyed, which leads them to be on the Day of Judgment, which leads them into hellfire. يَحِقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّا خَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ مِمَّا عَمِلَتْ أَيْدِينَا Didn't they look to what we created for them? From our own hands? What were our, our own hands did for them? What does that seem like a review of? Didn't they look at what we made for them? What section was that? That was the third section, wasn't it? The world around you. And this time he says, an aman, what we made from our own hands, that is to say cattle, cows. Fahum laha malikun, then they will go around owning it. They own these cows and cattle. See, that, that time he talked about fruits. And he talked about, you know, crop that you eat. And gardens and date palms. And now he's talking about Cattle, and how cattle has been submitted before you. It's been humbled before you. You know in the Qur'an, Allah often talks about animals that you have control over. Horses, cows, camels, and there's a reason for that. In it, there's a spiritual lesson also. This is a physical image tied to a spiritual lesson. The spiritual lesson is, you have animals under you that are humble. And you would not tolerate if they acted up. If your horse was going too crazy, what would you do? You'd put it down. If your cow start giving you, stopped giving you milk, it'll be a burger. Yes? So what you own, when it doesn't do its job, is done. Shouldn't that be a lesson for you? Because I own you, Allah is saying. And if you don't do your job, then why do you think I don't have the right to do away with you? You see? So didn't they see what we made with our own hands for them? Cattle, fahum laha malikun. Then they're in ownership of it. And then, wadallanaha lahum. And we made this cattle humble for them. Now that was important to mention. Because when the cattle has been made humble for their owners, how come you haven't been, humble, been, been humbled before Allah? فَمِنْهَا رَكُوبُهُمْ وَمِنْهَا يَأْكُلُونَ And out of these cattle, they also get rides. رَكُوبُهُمْ Their rides exist. Did, did Allah talk about rides before? What two rides did He mention? Do you remember? He mentioned the ship. He mentioned the camel that people ride. Or other kinds of rides that they don't even know about yet. وَمِنْهَا يَأْكُلُونَ And from it, and from them, they eat. They even consume them. Another sign of judgment day and your humility that you, that you put in your mouth. 
And then, وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ وَمَشَارِبُ Out of all of these, these cattle, they have in them all kinds of benefits. They can get hide out of it. They can get skin out of it. They can use their bones for something. They can use all kinds of stuff. وَمَشَارِبُ And they get all kinds of drinks out of it. أَفَلَا يَشْكُرُونَ How come they're not grateful? Then, are they not grateful then? Notice last time Allah talked about being grateful. He talked about food. And this time He's talking about drink. Right, last time He talked about fruits you can eat. And now he's completing the diet by talking about things you can drink. And the, 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 the subject of gratitude becomes complete. مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ آلِهَةً لَعَلَّهُمْ يُنصَرُونَ They've taken other gods besides Allah. So that they can be helped. This is another criticism. Like Allah first said, why didn't, you, why didn't you look at the reality right in front of them? And we reviewed that again in now section 6. But now he's going to go into their crimes. And crimes are similar to the crimes that other people had done in previous nations, like in section 2, in the history lesson. Where people were expecting the shafa'ah, or the intercession of other gods. So he says they've taken other gods besides Allah. لَعَلَّهُمْ يُنصَرُونَ So that they can be helped. Weren't they told, اِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَا أَيْدِيكُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ Take precaution, protect yourselves by using your minds properly. Take precautions from what is in front of you and what is behind you, not from false gods. Why are you seeking help and protection from false gods? لا يستطيعون نصرهم These gods, they're not going to be of any help to them. They're not capable of any help for them. وَهُمْ لَهُمْ جُنْدٌ مُحْضَرُونَ And they for them are just an army, just like they are themselves, that are being made to present themselves. In other words, Allah paints the scene of Judgment Day, where all these mushrikun, the people who worshipped idols and false gods, are standing there. And their idols are standing there too. They're standing, hey, you're here? You're supposed to be on the VIP section calling me over. Why are you here? Well, we, I was just an idol, dude. I'm, he's gonna burn. And I will be used as fuel to en enrage your fire. Because Allah says, وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ hijara." Its fuel is people and stones, the stones that the idols were made of. So the idol itself is standing there like, uh, wait. This can't be good. You know? وَهُمْ لَهُمْ جُنْدٌ مُحْضَرُونَ فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ قَوْلُهُمْ What they say shouldn't make you sad. Who is he talking to? Mm, their statements should not make you sad. This is consolation from Allah to the Prophet ﷺ. Which section did we have consolation from Allah to the Prophet ﷺ? In the first section. إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ عَلَى صِرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِينَ Once again. And in the second section, رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ In that second section, the history, our master knows that we, are, we have consolation from him. We don't need validation from you. And now Allah gives him validation. You don't have to worry so much about what they say. إِنَّا نَعْلَمُ مَا يُسِرُّونَ وَمَا يُعْلِنُونَ We know what they make open. We know what they make public. And we know the thing, or rather, we know the secrets they keep. And we know the things they make public. This is also a review because the truth was made clear deep inside their hearts. Yes or no? لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ So Allah says, I know the secrets they have. And I know the opposite truth or falsehood they announce. وَمَا يُعْلِنُونَ Now, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانُ But before I go to that, why did they reject the message? Why did they keep things hidden and not say what they knew to be true? Pride, wasn't it? So Allah is now going to attack pride. Because He's going to come at really the real problem. Didn't the human being see that we created him from a dirty fluid, a drop? Then all of a sudden, he's constantly making arguments openly. Who does he think he is? You know the surah began by telling the nation of Quraysh, who do you think you are? And now Allah says, who does the nation, who does this human being think he is? You're just a dirty fluid. And you get up all big and now you start making arguments? You know, uh, Desis know this really well. We make this line, we use this line against our kids when they get loud. Ah, you are very big. Now you are really big. MashaAllah. You heard that one? Allah is actually using that one on the Quraysh. Oh, are you all grown up now? You want to make arguments against Allah, do you? I see. Wonderful. And this idea, فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيبٌ he's, he, All of a sudden he starts making arguments. This is not the first time we're learning about arguments. مَا كَ, you know, uh, Allah says, إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدًا Oh, مَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدًا وَهُمْ يَخِصِّمُونَ There's not going to be, it's nothing but a single explosion they're going to look at. 
while in the middle of their arguments. And Allah says, you think you have the room to make arguments? You think you get to be this obnoxious? Now, what kind of arguments does he make? Allah says, وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا He gives all kinds of examples for us. He starts making theoretical scenarios for us, which by the way, he already made in this surah. أَن نُطْعِمُوا مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَهُ Should we feed someone Allah could have fed himself? If Allah wanted, he would have fed him himself. He's theorizing about Allah, isn't he? Allah says, he starts making theories about me, giving examples about me. وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَهُ And he forgot his own creation. قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِينَ He has the audacity to say, who is going to give life to bones when they have been reduced to dirt? رَمِيم رِمَّة in Arabic is dirt. الثَّرَى الرِمَّةُ هِيَ الثَّرَى So he said, the, the guy says, <laughs> These decayed bones are going to be brought back to life. Who's going to do that? Questioning the power of Allah. The height of arrogance. You forgot what you yourself was, were made from? Much more pathetic than dirt. قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً Tell them, the one who gave it life the first time will give it life, will give it life again. The one who brought it up the first time. Is this a new concept? Allah will give life to the dead? Or did this come up before? Again, we're, to, we're inching towards that review. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ And he knows about all kinds of creation. He's always knowledgeable about all kinds of creation. In that one statement, Allah knows about all kinds of creation is a review of the entire third section where all the ayat that Allah created were. He just captures all of it again. What people have made with their own hands. What they, have, what they couldn't have made with their own hands. What they eat with their mouths. The animals that, they, that, that serve them. الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّجَرِ الْأَخْضَرِ نَارًا This is epic, right here. The one who made out of the tree, the green tree, he made fire for you. فَإِذَا أَنْتُمْ مِنْهُ تُوْقِدُونَ You light up those fires yourselves from it. Is this the first time we're learning about a tree in this surah? Can anyone remember where the tree was in this surah? Palm trees. Palm trees were a reminder of what? Jannah. And this tree is used to make fire, which should be a reminder of hell. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> the two times he mentions tree, one should think, make you think about Jannah, the other should make you think about Nar. But what he said about Nar is remarkable. He said he made, he provided the ability for a green tree, perfectly green tree, to be turned into fire. But it doesn't turn into fire on its own. The fruits come out on their own. The beauty of it is on its own. But the fire doesn't come on its own. فَإِذَا أَنْتُمْ مِنْهُ تُوْقِدُونَ You have to light it up yourselves. You have to take this perfectly good tree and turn it into fire. What is Allah saying? He's saying the path to Jannah is natural. But you go out of your way to destroy the nature that Allah created you on and you want to build yourself the fire of hell. Allah did not put you in the fire of hell, you lit it up yourself. فَإِذَا أَنْتُمْ مِنْهُ تُوْقِدُونَ How incredible is that? What a complete picture. Like you don't look at a tree the same way anymore. Between those two ayat. So what was left open in the beginning is now closed full circle. And so he says, أَوَلَيْسَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ then isn't the one who created the skies and the earth biqadir, completely capable ala an yakhluqa mithlahum that he can create the likes of them? Bala, of course. Wa huwa al-khallaqul alim. He is the one who creates over and over again and knows everything. Now here's the thing about this ayah. The one who created the skies and the earth. How many skies are there? How many you been to? You been to one? <laughs> Well, you're taking a flight, you went to a little bit of one, right? Can we see the seven skies? Do we know where one begins and one ends? No. That's from the unseen. The one who created the unseen and the seen, isn't it? The skies are, much of it is the unseen, and the earth is seen. The one who created the world of the unseen and the seen is the same one. Every time he creates something in the seen, he makes you think of something from the unseen. خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Isn't he capable to make you again? Because, just because you are so obsessed with the scene, 
that you start doubting his power in the unseen? Bala, of course he can. He is the one who creates over and over again, has all knowledge. The only thing, his decision, his decision, all it is, when he intends to do something, and يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ That he says to it, be. Come into existence, be. فَيَكُونْ And it just happens. You know what this ayah is about? This ayah is telling, you know, previously Allah said, it's not that hard to destroy your people. It could just be one explosion, you'll be done. Now he's saying it's even easier for him to recreate you. All he has to do is say one word, kun, and you'll be brought back to life again. Fayakun. You think I can't recreate you? That's just as easy as saying the word. That's all it is for me. Subhanallah. By the way, the word of Allah brings life. Kun brings life in this ayah, yes? Which is actually amazing because the Qur'an brings life to the dead heart too, which is also the word of Allah. So it's two different dimensions of the words of Allah that are highlighted in these ayahs. And now that you understand that, now that you understand that that power of giving life and the power of pairing the unseen with the seen. By the way, every time you find pairing, Allah created things in pairs. Then He steps back and says, the only one that doesn't have pairs is He. And He's too perfect for that. So the surah is concluding, فَسُبْحَانَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ then how perfect is the one in whose hands alone is the kingdom and ownership of everything. He has the ownership of everything. By the way, even the ownership is a review because you own cattle. فَهُمْ لَهَا malikun. They are cattle's owners. And Allah says, actually you own nothing. He has the, the ownership of all things. And then He adds, وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And to Him alone, you will all be returned. Now when you will all be returned, this is actually also a review. Because remember the man who was killed? You know what he said? He said, فَطَرَنِي وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ He made me and you're all gonna be returned to him also. But when he said it, they killed him? When he said that they killed him? Now Allah is saying it. I'll tell you myself. You will be returned to me. See what you can do about that. You can try to kill my believers, but I'll tell you myself. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thanks for watching these videos. If you'd like to continue to support Quran Weekly, please click the link in this video.